Okay. Welcome here, the last day of May uh, 2014, to our Food is Medicine Summit and Conference. Uh, today is going to be filled with incredible information from a lot of the leading experts in the world on their field of research and medicine. And our objective here uh, between Dr. Yu, who I'm going to present in a second, and Hippocrates Health Institute is to unify the field of legitimate health care. Uh, it's time we move in the right direction and we start to uh, take our forces, knowledge, and passion, put it together so that the patients around the world, the people around the world, will have options and opportunities that are functional, uh, maybe for the first time in generations. Today we're going to be starting now at approximately a little after 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, the 31st of May, and we'll probably end tonight at about 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. So we welcome our listeners from around the globe uh, to stay tuned all day long on your computers, on your television sets now, your smart sets, etc. Uh, we've just added two or three more presentations. Uh, so many physicians and researchers are out at other conferences in the world uh, today that they wanted to be here, they have passion to be here, but they couldn't. And I'm sure this is going to be the first of many gatherings we have in the future. So I want to bring my colleague and friend up, Dr. Yu, to say a few words. Dr. Yu. Welcome, everybody. I have been waiting for this since 2002. This is the first time that we have gathered a nutritional group and a science group. Our job is to bring this and move it forward. And this is the first of many, I hope, in which we can have a consortium of people to support this concept and to empower the public to understand what they can do in their fight against chronic disease. I will not waste any more words and we will start the program. Brian, do you, are you ready to go ahead? Yes, we are. So since we're on the campus of Hippocrates here in West Palm Beach, Florida, we thought we should give a little history and a little credit uh, to how this all began. But what is quite interesting is that before there was a holistic health field or a complementary health field or an alternative health field, uh, there were two very influential women who basically had absolutely no medical education, that both healed themselves of catastrophic disease, and in fact, because of that, had the courage and wisdom to say, we have to teach other people. Now, I remember those early days slightly. I was just a very young man, uh, but it was difficult to even have anybody in the field of medicine listen to one word without uh, bursting out and abruptly arguing with you about it. The world has quite changed since, since then. Uh, there's tens of thousands of doctors worldwide that are aligning with lifestyle medicine now, uh, nutritional medicine, and me metabolic medicine. And the one that she was actually working with very, very closely in Sweden, and along with the government and research they did there, Elmanissen. Good morning and good afternoon. And it's amazing to be here and share this. I mean, this is a meeting of the minds. This is a meeting of people that can share their knowledge, that can educate us, that can educate all our audience. So we're really in here for the long run and for many generations to share this with us. You know, it's. Um, it's amazing when you work daily with natural um, health and sharing with the guests that comes through the Hippocrates Institute and learning from them what their journey has been in health and then seeing what three weeks, for example, can do to their health, to their psyche. It's just amazing. We all really need to partake in body, mind, spirit. And um, so some amazing minds that we have worked with, I want to introduce. So first, um, I'm going to uh, introduce Anne Wigmore. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
So she was um, diagnosed with uh, stage four colon cancer, 1952, by Harvard physicians, and told she didn't have much time left. And she healed herself naturally. And you see pictures from her uh, lecturing, and this is the institute in Boston that she founded in 1956, and where it stayed for 30 years, and then relocated to Florida here in West Palm, 1987. And uh, she was so playful and so wonderful and so youthful. And, uh, you know, taught people all over the world how to live and how they could heal themselves. Then we have Alma Nissen, who I was taught by. And uh, she came from Denmark. She had rheumatoid arthritis and similar to and Vic Morsh, by the time she was in her 50s, the arthritis had crippled her so much that she woke up one morning and her jaw had even closed. So all the medications that she normally lived on, she couldn't put in her mouth anymore. And that changed her life. <laughs> so she became vegan and opened a clinic in, uh, outside Stockholm. And I came there, I was 18. I ran that clinic by the time I was 19, I was on cloud nine every day. I just could not believe that people could heal with such simple methods. And uh, it, it was amazing. So, um, you know, I wanted to put an extra word for this. Um, in Lithuania, where Anne Wigmore came from, we have now in order to make the first medical school teaching what we're gonna teach here today. And with the help of uh, Dr. Colin Campbell and um, Essel Steen, and of course, Institute, and I hope that a lot of you will also partake in this school and its compendium. And uh, so you can give your support. There definitely is something that we also need support. It's called livingand.com. And um, the more support we have, the better this school will be. And, uh, you know, we definitely want to honor Anne Wigmore for starting this and for us to be able to continue, which is a privilege. And, you know, a calling is not something you choose. It chooses you. Thank you. So let's move through this. Sugar is notorious for promoting weight gain, tooth decay, etc. Yet there is much more sinister role that it plays in sparking and enhancing every disease known to man. University of California, San Francisco states, sugar in the amount consumed today poses a health risk contributing to a minimum of 35 million deaths globally each year. Now think about that. What other disorders mount to 35 million a year? And do you realize that your government was asked by the University of California and other academics to now make this on the same list that nicotine's on? And they should, because when you get to one million deaths a year from, from a known substance, and you can prove it, conservatively prove it, shouldn't we be having a warning on every bit of sugar? Right here in my neighborhood are these guys. I call them the Fungul brothers. <laughs> if you don't know Italian, I won't tell you what that means. <laughs> to show you how powerful these boys are, these boys are really powerful. They own 12% of this, this county we're in now. 12% of the land in this county. They fund the Republicans, the Democrats, the Libertarians, everyone. They fund these people, and they make sure they cover all bases. And their donations are wildly big. So hybridized fruit we just spoke about. Now here's the problem. In the 19th century, only the aristocracy can consume processed sugar. Another thing we don't know, because we weren't around 100 years ago. Nobody ate processed sugar, because they didn't have the money except the elite. So you had a handful of people, about 5% of the population, that would eat sugar that would be taken up preciously, almost like gold from Africa or from you know, the Caribbean. And they would lock it up. This is a true story. They'd lock it up in a piece of furniture they had built. And if it was you know, Hanukkah or Christmas or their birthday, they'd bring it out and eat morsels of it. 
So even then, as you see, they ate about a kilo, a little more than two pounds of sugar a year. Isn't that wild? Do you know what the average North American and Western European child eats in sugar a year now? Double their weight. So you have a 100-pound child, they eat 200 pounds of sugar a year. Ironically, today's sugar subsidies have the poorest members of society consuming the largest amounts of sugar. So it's completely flipped in a century. So the poorer you are, the more sugar you eat. So those of us who are educated, and a lot of you purport that you're interested in nutrition, but you're sugar addicts. You know, you come in here and make believe you're really interested in nutrition, you really don't want to get cancer, you really want to make health, but you walk out of here and eat shit. Isn't that true? Let's be honest with you. <laughs> and we've got to stop that. Meanwhile, society's most affluent relish the privilege to make intelligent choices. Oh, we know better. We're going to reduce our sugar. Or then they get you. The marketers get you. And we'll talk to you about that in a minute. This is a sad picture to me. But this is a picture you and I see every day in our own eyes. You walk around anywhere. We have a very affluent mall close to here. And you go in there and you see, you're going to see 10, 20, 30 children with sugar being poured down their throat by quite intelligent people who may have gone to the best schools and live on Palm Beach at this point. Our children, on average, consume double their weight. Now, we don't have to go through this. This teaches the metabolism of sugar. Simple sugar, sucrose, glucose, and fructose are important carbohydrates, commonly referred to as simple sugars. Sugar is found naturally in whole foods and is often added to processed foods to sweeten them and increase flavor. Your tongue can't quit, quite distinguish between these sugars, but your body can tell the difference. They all provide the same amount of energy per gram but are processed and used differently throughout the body. Now, let's not get into the structure. Most of you know this. But let's get to fructose. Now, this is the scary thing. When I talk to 99% of you, you're going to say to me, I don't eat sugar. I take fructose. We now have overwhelming tsunami levels of information that fructose is the most dangerous, by far, of all sugars. So if you're eating mangoes, it's actually less healthy than eating cane. And why? Because we now know some things we didn't know just five and ten years ago. Because the tides have turned on this whole thing. So it's a sugar found in natu in naturally in many fruits and vegetables and added to various beverages such as sodas, fruit-flavored drinks. British Journal of Medicine did a study on their childhood obesity because they knew that their health care system would collapse soon because of the obese level. They have about the same amount of obese children there as we have in the United States and Canada. And what's scary is you may or may not know this, even though you're doctors and researchers, that 72% of North American children are overweight, obese, or morbidly obese. And by the way, morbidly obese now is 8%. Think about that. So our health care bills now we can't endure, what's going to happen? when our children's generation get in there, and they've been obese from the time they were 10 years old or 15 years old. It's, it's going to collapse so quick your head's going to spin. Now, however, it is very different from other sugars because it has a different metabolic path and is not the preferred energy source for muscles or the brain. So if your muscles and brain isn't going to use fructose, what's it going to do? Pretty scary stuff. So people say to me, well, carrot juice is good for you. Beta carotene in carrot juice is good for you. But do you know that all of the carrots have been hybrid too? In California, they created the California juice carrot. And do you know that? One quart of that has one and a half cups of sugar in it. By the way, if I distill the one and a half cup of fructose out of that and give it to you, it's worse than me giving you a cup and a half of white sugar. Now think of this. And these aren't theories anymore, by the way. What I'm giving you here are well-established understandings. These are, this is what's written in the books now, the textbooks at this point. Now, here we go next. Fructose is only metabolized in the liver and relies on fructanase to initiate metabolism. So think of this. You only have one enzyme that deals with this. And how about if you, don't, if you overwork that? How about if you don't have enough of that in your body? Unlike glucose, too, it does not cause insulin to be released or stimulate production of leptin, a key hormone 
for regulating energy intake and expenditure. So another question we have here, if it's not going to feed anything but one area of your body or be utilized, if there's a need for more enzymes than you probably have, and by the way, if now we know that it's not going to be used for energy or expenditure, this becomes a really, really dangerous substance in the human body. This becomes something that's so frightening you don't even want to think about how bad this is. These factors raise concern about chronically high intakes of dietary fructose because it appears to behave more like fat in the body than like other carbohydrates. Now let's go, that's where I want to labor on this sentence. Now, I know that a lot of you use fat to help to reverse disease. And we're not talking about a healthy fat. Yesterday, you heard my buddy actually say to you that you don't want to use stem cells from fat. Why? You don't remember what he said? Inflammatory and toxic. These are inflammatory, toxic fats. These are not normal fats or fats that you harvest out mid-range triglycerides out of coconut oil. These aren't essential fats that you may get out of a walnut. We're talking about a new form of a fat that we're just starting to get our hands around at this point. Volumes of scientific data show that fructose precipitates disease and premature aging more than any other source of sugar. I write for the academic community. You know why? Not that I want to. I'm not that interested in the academic community, to be honest with you. Most people have their heads stuck in the sand. But the fact of the matter is, when I go out and speak, they used to yell at me and say, give me empirical evidence. So a few years ago, I said, OK, let me see if I can pull together a 200-page book. And it ended up being a 1,200-page, three-volume series called Food is Medicine. And what's ironic, I was speaking about eight months ago, and I was at a medical conference, and some big mouth doctor started to challenge everything that we're talking about here. And I basically said, <clears throat> go to page, uh, on volume two, go to page 123, look it up, because probably down the hall from your office, there was research done that challenges what you've just proposed here. And I said, you didn't know that, did you? Probably your colleague is doing the research. And as you know, this is the problem. Nobody's talking to one another. And when they are talking to one another, it's about ego. It's about pissing matches and how do we appropriate more money to do more research rather than let's get this to who? Why are we doing this research? You know, as, imagine here at Hippocrates, I have 200 team members here. I have a wonderful medical team here. We all get dressed up, we're ready to go, and no guests show up. How effective would Hippocrates be? Now, I want you to get that to sink into your head. Well, how effective is having knowledge that doesn't get to the patient? It doesn't work. So this is why George is absolutely correct. And thank you and congratulations for coming here. Because if we don't do these things and let our egos be at the door and start to communicate with one another, your whole life's work is going to be flushed down the toilet. And they're going to say, who was that? They won't even know who you were in 20 to 30 years from now. And we may be finding, by mistake, by the way, none of us are geniuses, we may be finding, by mistake, by the way, the most profound thing that humans ever found about preserving life and health. And this is what we're doing. This is not a job, at least to me it's not a job. This is a mission. This is an obligation. This is a necessity. And who's going to do it if we don't? And it's nice to have tongue-in-cheek how bad the pharmaceuticals are, how bad some of our colleagues are. Big deal. It, who, don't, don't waste your energy on being angry with them. Take our energy and let's do productive things. And learning these things. Now, how many of you, let's be honest, how many of you knew what I just wrote on that board until then? Okay, so two, two people, three people in here. But that's pretty frightening. We're the people who should know. <laughs> and I don't know a lot, too. You're going to stand up here today and you're going to tell me things I've never heard before. And why don't I know what you've been, been doing? So, Please, don't let this be a weekend event in Florida where you use the pool twice. I want this to be ongoing dialogue. <laughs> I want this to be ongoing dialogue. And I want us to, to, to lovingly discuss with one another. And even if you don't agree with everything, be open to this. And I'll be open to you. And we'll learn together. Because that's how we're going to change everything. That's how you're going to have integrity in your life at a high level. So we'll go through all of this. 
Now let's look at this, notorious sugars. Nobody bothered to take time, this took us about 10 minutes, by the way, to tell you what sugar is composed of. <laughs> and so we have all these mythologies about sugar. You know, how good sugar is, how bad sugar is, the Dr. Steer approach, you know, who was on the sugar payroll, by the way. And when they wanted to have really sparked uh, debate on the local shows in Boston, they used to get me on with Dr. Spear. And I was like 30 years old and had a lot of testosterone and not much brains at that point. So I'd, I'd get on and yell and scream with them and fight, and it was a great show for the, for the TV, you know. So white sugar is 150% uh, fructose and 50% glucose. Do you realize that 95% of the people I talked to who know sugar is bad didn't know that? And I'm not going to say I knew that 15 years ago, 10 years ago. I didn't know that either. Brown sugar, it has a little molasses, but it's the same. And if you know how they spray sugar, there is no crop on the planet Earth they spray more with pesticides than sugar cane. And every drop of molasses could give you cancer. You could be me and eat enough molasses and end up with cancer, I'm telling you. This stuff is like deadly bad stuff. And how a lot of these health foods happen, by the way, is waste products and byproducts from industry that they got some dishonorable researcher to say it was good for you. What is brewer's yeast? Same crap. What is wheat germ? What is rice germ? Waste products. It was costing these industries millions of dollars a year to put them out to, uh, to sleep there. And now they make millions and millions of dollars telling you they're health foods to you. You've got to be cautious with these things. Dextrose, sucrose made from starch. So they take potatoes. We know how you, you say, you want to get fat? Yeah, eat potatoes. So they actually take the fattening part of potatoes and make dextrose out of it. High fructose corn syrup, 55% fructose, 42% glucose. And it's mostly for soft drinks. Again, New uh, British Journal of Medicine, that's where their obesity level came from, from soda pop. They said clearly, I love the way the British Journal of Medicine reports studies. You know, they make them uh, poignant and clear. Not like they never come to an answer, you know. And they basically said if we reduced, you know, or eliminated sugar, we'd absolutely eliminate obesity problems in this country. Then we get to agave syrup. This is the raw food, the living food mythology beyond all mythologies. Because there's been two independent studies that actually showed agave syrup was just as bad in the body as high fructose corn syrup. They also, the raw fooders are lying. You know, the non-scientists are saying this is raw. In the extraction process from this cacti, they have to heat it to at least 180 degrees. So it's not raw. It's cooked, and it's worse than high fructose corn syrup. Then you have maple syrup. People say, well, I'm from New England. I have to have. How many of you are from New England here, Thomas? <laughs> so, I know. He, has, he, has, he says, well, we, we don't eat sugar. We eat maple syrup. <laughs> look at that one over there. <laughs> I know it. Honey, look at honey. Brown rice syrup. Now, here we come to my, my buddy, uh, Michio Kushi. He's going to say, oh, well, it's not sugar. It's brown rice syrup. You know? <laughs> Date sugar, you know. So, and here's the, the latest one, this coconut sugar. You know, I can always tell. How many of you listen? You're out practicing with patients, and you know when the trends are coming? Yeah. You know, now we're in the uh, paleo diet trend. We were in the blood type diet trend before, you know. And you, now it's the coconut sugar. And... Doing it for 42 years like I have, you know, it's like, you know, waves. It goes to your five-year peaks and it comes down. So let's keep going on with all of this. These are even worse. Now, the politics of this are shocking bad. Shocking bad what they did with this. The four most dangerous artificial sweeteners, aspartame. I have a book, a medical book, on my shelf this thick and this high that starts with brain cancer and shows you the pathways and the definitive studies on it. I mean, not like maybe this causes brain cancer. Major universities saying here's exactly how it happens in there. And then we go down, look at all of these. And we only have a couple of minutes, so we're going to rush through this stuff. So it's not bad enough we're giving people deadly sugar that create cancer and feed cancer and other diseases, but now we also have a situation where we're giving people artificial that create diseases as well, if not better. Than these things. So we're not going to go through this in any significant way. We're going to run through this. But here is an alternative. I always like to leave on a, on a high note with this one. And stevia is a godsend for us here. 
we choose not to be addicts anymore. So we're recovering addicts. Doesn't mean we're not addicts, we're, a we're addicts. <laughs> so how we can make people do this is we give them the methadone called stevia now. <laughs> you know? so, we know you're, not, you're going to eat sugar, so if you're going to eat sugar, at least get stevia. And, and this is where I'm going to tell you to eat processed. Now, processed doesn't mean chemical in this case. Because if you just take the leaf of stevia that's ground up, it tastes horribly bad. It has an aftertaste. But verbatim, stevia is 100 times sweeter than white sugar, so gram for gram. So it really makes you think you're eating sugar, but you're not. So that's our big problem. Two out of three people getting tight. Uh, two diabetes, or what we used to call in my day, adult onset diabetes, or children below 18. Scary stuff. So the next up, I believe, is my buddy Thomas, the maple syrup consumer. <laughs> it's a, a pleasure to be here. And the last uh, presentation, uh, I think, was very enlightening. And uh, there's a lot of information there, M much of which I, I known but a lot of which I, uh, I didn't know. So in, in that regard, I think, I think this is very important and absolutely uh, essential and crucial uh, to our eventual uh, management of, of cancer, uh, all kinds of cancers, not, not just uh, one kind. Um, and yes, you know, with respect to the maple syrup, um, you know, it's not like <laughs> we, we all in New England think we're getting the, really the best, but because, that's, we're not, because we're not using Aunt Jemima's. All right, so it's just like substituting one bad for another bad, you know, my bad. So, um, but anyway, I, George asked me to speak a little bit about uh, cancer metastasis uh, because I usually uh, deal a lot with cancer as a metabolic disease and I'm, I'm going to just briefly present that because it sets the philosophy uh, about how we, we, we view this, this, this disease. Um, so I'll, I'll talk just briefly about the philosophy of cancer as a metabolic disease rather than a genetic disease, but only briefly. And then go into the concept of metastasis. And this is really uh, the problem, okay? Uh, you know, if you have a cancer that doesn't metastasize or spread, uh, it's very easy to control. You can control it. Surgeons can cure cancer if it has not spread, all right? So they say, get it early, get it early. But once it spreads, it becomes a systemic disease and you have all kinds of other issues. Um, now, this is the philosophy that we have uh, that was put together by my students and myself um, to try to encapsulate uh, what, what the issues are. Now, your, uh, cancer uh, is a disease of, of mitochondrial energy metabolism, and, and it can be caused by a plethora of, of environmental and genetic factors that damage the respiration of the cell, leading then to genomic instability, um, 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 uh, mutations that are uh, downstream of this, of this process, and I've devoted huge amounts of energy to describing the linkages between all these steps. What I'll be talking about today is this part right here, macrophage fusion hybridization and the origin uh, as we think about metastatic cancer. But this is the result of the linkages and connections between you. If you're going to advance the field, you have to move within the concepts of the field. So we have to integrate what was already known about the nature of the disease to then appreciate uh, where we can move forward. So we have to take what is known and, uh, and move forward with that. But this uh, uh, puts the philosophy or the concepts in a different perspective than what we think about, even in the textbooks, okay? Cancer is a genetic disease in every textbook in the country, biochemistry, it's the, gene, the gene defects are secondary. So this is where we come from. All of this mutation stuff, downstream epiphenomena. The origin is the mitochondria and damage to the mitochondria in a certain context. Now, let me talk about metastasis. Um, this is a nice poster put out by Oncogene, but it kind of uh, an artistic rendition of, uh, of what we have here. Local invasion, the, the green cells are, are tumor cells. And uh, you have carcinoma in situ. This can be easily dealt with, but once these cells break through this basement, blue basement membrane and start invading local tissue, then we have uh, a problem. Uh, so we have um, uh, local invasion, intravisation. These, the tumor cells then enter into the bloodstream. They, are, uh, they avoid, uh, these are the immune cells uh, from uh, bone marrow, and, and the tumor cells avoid this because they're, they're not recognized as foreign, they're recognized as self. But not only that, the tumor cells themselves will suppress the function of the immune system. So you have an immunosuppressive effect. 
Then extravasation. These cells move out of the bloodstream at some distant site and set up distant tumors. All right? So this is secondary tumor formation. We have here a systemic disease. All right? This is a systemic disease. Your body now is reacting in ways to uh, uh, adjust to this new, uh, 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 this new state. And of course, here you know that the primary cause of mortality uh, in cancer patients is metastatic cancer. Now, I'm just going to rip through this very quickly because if you go to the American Society of Cancer Research, the EMT-MET hypothesis is the dominant form, the dominant view of cancer metastasis. Epithelial mesenchymal transition to the uh, mesenchymal epithelium. What it means is just the way the cells look. Columnar epithelial cells are thought to be the origin of cancer. Most cancers start from epithelium, not the blood cancers, of course. But then you have this dysplastic, and this is all thought to be due to mutations. Random mutations, random mutations, carcinoma in situ. In situ. And then you have, uh, you transition these cells from columnar to mesenchymal. This is the, this distorted morphology. They then break through the basement membrane, as I showed you. They intravasate into the, all dri driven by dozens of mutations. And then they exit, this is the extravasation. And then they go back into a, 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 a more epithelial, not completely, but an epithelial. So a lot of the so-called random mutations are reversed in the process of going to the opposite. So when you think about all these mutations, then they're reversing, and you say, well, how is this possible? Well, this is what you do when the concept of what you the think the disease is, you come up with absurdities like this. So, uh, and this will become more clear. Now, there's, there's a, a less... Um, Recognize. And the other thing, too, EMT, MET is seen primarily in cultured cells, and many cancer researchers work in cultured cells. They don't work in people. So a lot of the concepts that we build are built on artificial systems in the first place. So uh, now here's another interesting uh, concept, and we've, we've uh, worked in this area as well. Here's the tumor as it breaks through the basement membrane. But now members of our immune system, the macrophages, are facilitatory. So this is what we call them, I call it the macrophage chaperone hypothesis. <laughs> The, the, our, our own immune cells guide these tumor cells, uh, have them, they secrete growth factors and, and uh, uh, cytokines that pro prolifer in, induce proliferation, and then they send the tumor cells off into the bloodstream. They create a nice little cavity in the blood vessels, and the macrophages are chaperoning the tumor cells. And then as soon as the tumor cells come out of the bloodstream somewhere else, they build their own blood vessels, and the macrophages are there to facilitate all this while suppressing the immune system. So the macrophages are playing a, a facilitatory role in the origin of the metastatic cancer. Now, we have taken a, a, a radically different view based on a number of papers that have been seen go back to the early 1900s. Is the metastatic cancer cell a macrophage and, 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 um, or a type of macrophage of the immune system? Now, let's look at the process, what macrophages do in the process of wound healing. So, we have a wound, a contusion, a cut, a stab, a burn, whatever it is. Uh, uh, cells in our, blood in our bloodstream, monocytes, come out of the bloodstream. They enter into the wounded area. Now, they, they mature from monocytes to macrophages and eventually facilitate the healing of the wound. Remove the debris, get the dead cells out of the way, re reconstruct. We also have tissue macrophage. Every one of our tissues has resident macrophage. These guys live. They're like the local police department. And these guys in the bloodstream are like the militia. So if the, local, if the locals can't handle it, the militia comes in. Now, the, the, the issue here is eventually the wound is healed. Now, what happens after the wound is healed, pus are dead macrophages. When they try to, they, 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 they create a lot of reactive oxygen species, but a lot of them survive, and they intravasate back into the bloodstream, and they go to the lymph nodes, and they sit in the lymph nodes in the event that the wound is not healed, and they come back. So many of these activities of macrophages are the same thing you see in, in metastatic cancer. So is there evidence to suggest that metastatic cancers arise from macrophage-like cells? And the answer is yes. And this is one of the, you've you got to read this, the studies by Ruff and Pert. And they were pretty, uh, pretty solid in what they showed, that a small cell lung cancer cells have macrophage-specific characteristics. When you look at a small, and this is a very deadly and very metastatic kind of cancer. They look like macrophages. So they're not the tumor influx. This is the hard part. You have normal max coming in from the immune system, and then you have these neoplastic cells that have all the macro. It's very hard to tell who, who is who if you're expressing the same cell surface characteristics. Human breast cancer. Cells share antigens with myeloid monocyte lineage. The breast cancer neoplastic cells themselves are expressing these macrophage characteristics. 
Is cancer a macrophage-mediated autoaggressive disease? Munzer Rosa and Korvik said a long time ago that they think, in the, this was in melanoma now, they think that in the inflammatory microenvironment, uh, the melanocytes fuse with each other and with some other kinds of, and they become these hybrid cells. And they have the macrophage character. This is a more recent paper. This is CD163 is a marker for macrophages. And it's expressed in, uh, in the breast cancer cells. And they think this is related to the fusion hybridization of macrophages with neoplastic uh, cancer cells. The melanoma, now John Pollack at Yale and his group have done a lot of work uh, documenting in, mel in mel melanoma that uh, melanoma is actually a hybrid uh, uh, macrophage disease. The melanocyte is the resident macrophage of the cell. When you get a tattoo, the, the, the color goes into the macrophages. And there's been reports of metastatic cancer on a tattoo that you can find all of a sudden pieces of tattoo coming out, eyeballs and other parts of the body. So this is, you know, it's, it's the spreading around. So John has done some beautiful work uh, on showing on organ transplant people and where, where the, where, what the origin of the plant. And, it's, and it's, he's shown work that this is a, a macrophage-mediated disease. Now, metastasis remains largely unmanageable. And we heard that from Brian. Um, most of the drugs don't work, all right? This is the thing. We're spending millions and millions and billions of dollars on drugs that don't work. And the reason is because they think cancer is a genetic disease. I mean, that's one of the reasons. The other thing is there's, there's, that's one reason. The other reason is that the models that we use to study metastasis often do not recapitulate the, the full spectrum or cascade features that we see in the human disease. Many of the models that we use, you inject the cells into the bloodstream or you do, they don't represent real metastatic cancer. So we have two things here. The, the failure to recognize the cancer as a metabolic disease mo and models that uh, uh, don't replicate uh, or recapitulate the real nature of the disease. Now at Boston College over the last 20 years, we've developed new models of, of cancer that arose spontaneously in tumors of this strain of mouse. So this, this mouse develops spontaneous tumors. And these are M2, M3, and NM1. They're highly invasive and highly metastatic. If you're going to study metastasis, you need to study it in its syngenetic host, the host where the tumor arose, not taking human cells and growing in the body of a mouse. This is an absurdity, all right? You can get some information from this, but the information is often very, you take a human cell and grow it in the body of a mouse, and this human cell becomes more like a mouse than a human. We did this, we showed these things. They become centaurs, they're half human, half mouse, and then you're gonna make all these predictions on metastasis, she goes to the clinic, doesn't work. Now, in this model system, if we take these cells and put them in the skin anywhere, uh, you get metastatic cells to the brain, lung, liver, kidney, spleen, and bone. And this is one of the few model systems where you can get uh, rapid brain and bone metastasis, and it's an immune competent host. And this, we engineered these cells to be bioluminescent. So you put them in, a, in an imaging machine and you can see the blue is the cancer cells. So you just put them on a little bit, a few cells on the flank, and then you can see it growing and growing. And this image made the cover of the International Journal of Cancer showing that this mouse was filled with tumor cells from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail. This is called systemic metastatic cancer. You, you hear the term, we opened them up, he's all full of cancer. Well, this mouse is full of cancer. And the more this, you can see the whole body images and all the different organs. The first organs that the metastatic cells go to are, are, are lung and liver. Lung and liver, and this is the, when you take macrophages and put them in the body, the first place normal macrophages go, lung and liver. Because lung and liver detoxify the body. The, the lung is getting all this stuff from the environment, so you have to have a high turnover of max. And liver is always trying to detoxify, so you have to have a high turnover of max. So naturally, uh, if metastatic cancer is a macrophage disease, the first place they're gonna go is lung and liver. They're designed, they're programmed to do that. Now here's, what the, here's a, a liver uh, from this mouse. You can see all these little white spots and a very distorted spleen full of cancer. All these white spots in the liver of the mouse, the spleen is enlarged. This is the liver of the non-metastatic mouse and it looks just like normal. So this is what a normal liver would look like. These are the metastatic livers. And here's a human liver from a breast cancer metastasis and you can see the same kinds of spots. What we see in the mouse, we have exact, uh, everything we've looked at in the mouse we can now see. Uh, we've seen it in humans, you see the same thing in the mouse. So we wrote this hypothesis paper related to glioblastoma multiforme. Uh, are neoplastic macrophages microglia present? And we showed evidence that they were, okay? So GBMs, this is the very aggressive brain cancer. You have all kinds of other cells. You have stem cells, you have this kind of cell, that kind of cell, but we also think we have these fused macrophage, microglial cells, and they're the ones that spread throughout your whole brain, and they're very hard. This is why surgeons cannot cure, as Joe could tell you, cannot cure GBM because these cells have already spread through the brain. It makes it very difficult. We also shed, show, uh, wrote an article, Perspectives on the Mesenchymal Origin of Metastatic Cancer. 
in line with the idea that this is a macrophage disease. And this is our uh, 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 a rendition again. We have to take what was already put into the literature. But we find that the MACs come in in an attempt to heal the cancer. The cancer creates inflama inflammation in the microenvironment. Cancer is a disease not just of cells, but also of the microenvironment. And then you fuse, they fuse in their attempt to help heal the disease, and they become these hybrid cells which have all the characteristics of macrophages. They spread, and they do what macrophages do, except they're, dis they're rogue. They're disorganized. They're rogue cells. But now they're very hard to come. This is the most powerful cell in our body. Okay? This cell is either your best friend or your worst enemy. You, it's, you're, you're, if you're infected with bacteria, these cells will kill them. Now, if this cell turns on you, you know, you have a, you have a big problem. Now, how, how do we ma now, the big thing is, how do we manage this disease? Okay, we know, what we, we, we know the beast we're up against. So how do, we, how do we go after it? Okay, so if cancer is a metabolic disease, you always have to say, you know, here at the Hippocrates Institute, you're trying to, you know, treat diseases with food. So uh, we ha what, does this, what does this cell eat? So this is the question. You always ask, them, what are you eating? Do we just like you guys, what are you eating? Sure. You know, so, so what we have here is glucose and glutamine are the primary fuels uh, for cells of the immune system, and especially glutamine. Glutamine and glucose work together. Now, uh, Otto Warburg years ago said cancer arises from damage to respiration. And if, you, if respiration uh, is damaged, the cells have to compensate with fermentation. What do you ferment? They ferment glucose. And we are now showing, and others are showing, that they're fermenting glutamine as well. So in the, they can use glutamine and glucose in hypoxic regions to survive in the absence of oxidative phosphorylation. This leads to genomic instability and all the mutations that you see downstream. Cancers continue to ferment. So these cells are fermenters. Okay, how do you kill a fermenter? You take away the fermenting fuels. Okay, this is the way you go after it. You replace, the, you give them fuels that they can't ferment. And one of the fuels they can't ferment is ketone. Or you have to have a good mitochondria to, to, uh, to fuel ketones, but our normal cells of our body burn ketones naturally when we stop eating. So here again is the idea that most of our energy comes from oxidative phosphorylation when we're healthy. And unhealth, the, 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 the transition from healthy to unhealthy is when we start to uh, respire less and ferment more. Okay, so this is the key. And fermentation involves these kinds of fuels. So calorie restriction is what we have used and, and what you guys use here in the Hippocrates Center, um, involves a total dietary restriction. And make no mistake about it, what you're having here is a total dietary restriction, believe me. Okay. okay. I've experienced it. Wait till dinner. Yeah, wait till dinner. You know, I, I do therapeutic fasting. It's a little bit, uh, I can hit, anyway, we can go down there later. Um, okay, Tiffery, you're not going to starve here. Okay. Uh, and, and this is where I think, uh, uh, Right, your minerals and nutrients are absolutely essential. I mean, this is this is key. So you're, you're you're cutting calories, but you're maintaining, or in this case, even enhancing this aspect of it. And and one of the key things why it works, it works because you enhance mitochondrial biogenesis. If your cells are respiring healthy, you're going to be healthy. Okay. So these foods, this process is enhancing your respiratory capacity. You don't get cancer if your mitochondria are healthy. It's just that simple. It's a mitochondrial metabolic disease. You keep your mitochondrial healthy, you're not going to get cancer. CR mimics. Now, this is controversial. Like, when we do this in the mouse, what does it mean in the human? Well, not always, and I've learned this since we did this, not always, but it's usually water-only water therapeutic fasting. You want to get the same blood work you see in the mouse? Stop eating. Just drink water. But we can do that with other, other ways as well, and I don't want to. So what happens? Here it is. Glucose goes down. Ketones go up. This is an evolutionarily conserved adaptation. Okay, we've evolved as a species to, to starve. Humans are, we were almost extinct several times we didn't have to eat. Our bodies retain energy. We start calling upon our fats and we start metabolizing the fats to ketones and we stay alive. And a lot of the vitamins are held in the fats as well as toxins, of course. But, you know, if you don't have toxins, you have the vitamins in there. And ketones now come out of the liver and they can subserve the energy of glucose that, that we need. The brain needs glucose. Don't forget, glucose is bad when you're taking it in sugar and everything. You must keep in mind, our brains function on glucose. If we don't have glucose, we go unconscious. All right? So, but we can generate glucose from within gluconeogenesis. But we can also use uh, ketones. Can the restricted ketogenic diet uh, be effective? Because we don't, you guys use this, uh, you know, what you're having here. Uh, and we, we're trying to raise ketones as high as we can get. Don't forget, you, can, you can't get them to pathological levels because you excrete them. 
So we're trying to raise them as high as we can. And we also don't like, I think uh, Brian said the other day, we changed it, was it uh, nutritional uh, shifting or something? What was the term you used? It was a different, nobody likes the term restriction. I mean, you, you have cancer, now you're gonna be restricted? Give me a break. I mean, you, pain on top of pain, you know? So, um, it, but it's the word, it's how you define the situ situation, right? So, um, you know, we get cancer, people say, oh, go eat ice cream, go eat, eat big pizzas and stuff, make you feel better. Well, that's not going to make, it's, it might make you mentally feel better for a short time, but your body's going to react. Okay, let's look at the differences. Here's a ketogenic diet, and here's the standard American high-carbohydrate diet. So ketogenic diets have very low carbohydrates, very high fat, protein is moderate, which is less than the Atkins diet. And here's the, sta the key statement here. The ketogenic diet should always be consumed in restricted amounts. If you do not, this is probably the most unhealthy diet any human being on the planet could eat, or rat, or mouse, or whatever. And, we'll, and we've, done the, we've done the experiments to show that. Eating, eaten in restricted amounts, it can be very powerful. But eaten in excessive amounts, it can be deleterious. It's like a lot of things. Okay, mouse brain tumor, human brain tumor. Here's the standard diet, ketogenic diet, and the ketogenic diet restricted. Now, this is unrestricted. And you can see there is no change in growth of tumor when this ketogenic diet is eaten in unrestricted amounts. It's only when you calorie restrict the diet that you get tumor uh, uh, reduction. Look at blood glucose. Glucose does not go down in a diet that has no carbohydrates. People can't understand this. I don't eat carbs. Your blood sugar is so high. How does that happen? Dyslipidemia, insulin insensitivity, you ate too much fat. Restrict it. Glucose goes down, now ketones go way up. You wanna get glucose as low as you possibly can and ketones as high as you possibly can in a well-balanced nut nut nutrient background. And those are the keys because the cancer cells cannot use this. They need this and you're force feeding them this and they choke and they die in, in so many words. Now this paper just came out, this paper just came out of the, a, a month ago, a pilot study on keto for recurrent GBM. By, by some of my friends, Johannes and, and Joachim and uh, Johannes and Ulrika. In conclusion, the diet, they said, that the, the, big, the main conclusion here, the diet won't hurt you, but it doesn't help you. Now, the, the reason why it doesn't help you and the, uh, is that they didn't restrict it. So you need good at, that before and during the diet. The glucose didn't change significantly. Also, the blood work was terrible. So you, and, and what it did was support what I've said. You can't eat ketogenic diets in an unrestricted way. It's not gonna help you. And this is, and, the, and to the credit of the authors, in their conclusion, they said, we you think we might need to restrict the diet to get therapeutic benefit. The answer is yes. Now, going back to our mouse model of metastatic cancer, here's standard control, uh, and these are the tumor cells spreading. Standard diet, hyperbaric oxygen. Ketogenic diet, you can see it just by looking at the, at the this is qualitative, we've done quantitative work. But what we found is when you combine hyperbaric oxygen with the ketogenic diet, under very mild conditions, you can get powerful synergy between these therapeutic, non-toxic therapies. I'm doing this with Don D'Agostino and, and Angela Pofe at University of South Florida. Now this is another uh, example of, of uh, influence raw ketogenic diet on mast cell tumor in a dog. This is a very interesting case. The person read my book, she's from Ge University of Georgia. Um, she has this dog, a working dog, has a used mast cell tumor. As she goes to the vet, the, the vet says surgery, chemo, and radiation. Well, what else is new? And it's going to cost $10,000, and we think that we, we don't know if your dog can live six months, same stuff you get in a human, and it's, the dog's going to be very sick. So anyway, she says, no, I don't want to do that. So she, she says, oh, if I, what if I give the dog raw food, find out what kind of dog it was, how much it should eat, cut the calories by 40%. She went to the butcher, got raw organic chicken with the bone in the leg, uh, fish oil, uh, uh, raw eggs, and um, uh, medium-chain triglyceride oil, cut the calories down, and... Uh, and, and, and look at this, it's July 8th, 2013. Here's where the tumor was, September 8th. And here's the one recent, April 8th, just last month. And you can see that the, the dog is very healthy and the tumor is gone from eating raw. So a bunch of vets came to me. Uh, this was about uh, two years ago. And they said, you know, we want to treat our dogs with this ketogenic diet and this metabolic and all this kind of stuff. So uh, I said, yeah, yeah. So we, we, you know, they hem haw around, they never get back to you. It's, uh, uh, same thing in the vet <laughs> clinic, you know. No difference in the, in the human clinic than the vet clinic. So, so, uh, so anyway, I take this image and I go and I share it with the vets up at the Tufts New England Veterinary Center. I says, look at this, what you can do with the metabolic therapy. And they say, you know, this is really interesting, but we could never use this. And I said, why not? And they said, we don't believe feeding dogs raw food. <laughs> so I said, that the dog evolved to eat raw. What do you think, it was getting kibbles and bits in the forest? 
I mean, the mentality. We're dealing with a mental issue here. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is like, oh, okay. You know, what am I supposed to say? All right. If I had a dog, I'd definitely be doing this. So, uh, but here's the concept. You, gotta, you have to get the blood sugar down, get the ketones up. This is a little idealistic, of course. I know what it looks like in the real world. But it's this area here where you start to manage your growth, growth of the tumor. You're cutting down the fuels. Now, the other thing I just want to briefly mention here, glutamine targeting. We, we couldn't stop metastatic cancer with calorie restriction alone. We were targeting the primary tumor, reducing inflammation, but the darn cells were still metastasizing to liver, bone, and brain. And I said, what is going on here? This is when we realized it's the glutamine. So we started to think, and what happens if we target glutamine? And um, we use this toxic drug, and I apologize for that, because I was only trying to uh, prove concept that if we target glutamine, and don't forget, glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the body. It's used for all kinds of metabolic reactions. Much, much more difficult to target glutamine effectively than it is to target glucose effectively. As you said, we don't need glucose from the external. We can make it from within. But a glutamine, we need glutamine. It, it, even though they call it a non-essential amino acid, but it's, it's essential for a lot of things. Anyway, these are the results. Control and calorie restriction. So you can see the tumors, they're, they're still going there. And then uh, Don cleared it right out. In every organ system except spleen, spleen is a sanctuary for macrophages. And we weren't able to clean out it in spleen. However, in summary, how do you, treating the disease. So we're going to start to use calorie-restricted diets, possibly 2-DG, possibly 3-bromopyruvate together. Uh, glutamine targeting. Phenylbutyrate, I put question mark because this, there's some reports that it works. Others say it doesn't. Don, I hate to say that. We, not, we need to find non-toxic way to target glutamine. And hyperbaric oxygen. So the, the question is, we think we can provide. I don't like to use, ever use the term, we can cure cancer. Because we don't know if we're going to cure cancer. How do you know you're cured? When you die from old age from something other than cancer, oh, that guy was cured. Other than that, we don't know. All we can say is, can we provide long-term management? That's the issue. And we think we can do it with this uh, combination, and we have to work on that. OK, a lot of this is in my book. And uh, uh, here are my, many of my colleagues. Uh, Joe Maroon is here. Uh, Thomas, why don't you tell everyone how they get your book? Uh, Amazon, I guess. Amazon, I think, sells it. Uh, you can get it through Barnes and Noble. Uh, th there's all, all kinds of, uh, of, of, of websites um, that you can buy this, this book on. I, I try to tell them you shouldn't charge as much money. Everybody's screaming and yelling, it's over 100 bucks. I, I, I don't get any of that. I mean, th this is the, they're making a million on this, not me. So, uh, I just want you to know the layman buying it. Yeah, I, I appreciate Thank you. you know. So anyway. Um, I think we can manage this disease uh, metabolically, and I think what Hippocrates centers here is, are doing is uh, a step in the right direction, and I think you can, you can t tap into some of your resources. And my view, see, I publish papers. I, I'm, maybe I'm stupid. I, I still feel that the, you, if you hit these guys over the head enough, uh, there might be one smart guy, hey, you know, this might work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so anyway, uh, <laughs> thank you. And what we're going to talk about is uh, basically the name of this conference, uh, Food as Medicine. And we've actually taken that to the extreme, where we've taken a, a food and we're now going to use it to treat uh, exactly what Thomas was just talking about, glioblastoma, as a medicine. Now. The FDA has set aside different regulatory structures. One is for dietary supplements, which I'm sure you're aware of. And as part of a dietary supplement, you can't uh, diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any disease. So why the heck would you even take dietary supplements? I mean, if it doesn't do anything, why, why bother? But it does help keep healthy people healthy. Now, on the other side of the coin, there's disease. And the FDA regulates strongly um, who can treat disease. Uh, they have a whole process. The average cost now runs somewhere between $800 million to $100 million per approved drug. And a lot of that is because most drugs don't get approved. And that's for treating disease. Now, Congress because of their 
uh, constituents, they were getting a lot of flack about this because there were diseases out there called orphan diseases that weren't getting a lot of attention because they weren't, there weren't enough people to make it worth their while to uh, treat these diseases. They were, uh, for instance, uh, brain cancer uh, affects uh, the, the, the worst metastatic type of brain cancer, glioblastoma, multiforming, uh, affects about 30,000 people, somewhere between 23 and 30,000 people per year. So Congress said, we've got to do something about these orphan type diseases, and we have to allow food to be medicine. And so they created a, a new, new regulatory authority. So you've got nutritional supplements, and you've got drugs, and then in between you've got something very small called medical foods. And that is foods that have a scientific basis for treating a particular disease, has to be used under a physician's supervision. It's not prescription, but it has to be used under supervision. And uh, it has to either be a food additive or generally regarded as safe, GRAS. Now, we developed a nutritional supplement. Oh, yeah, the hero of the day. All right. OK, so I can actually talk with slides now. Now let's see if I can uh, figure out how this works. Ooh, yeah, I have a laser. Uh, so we looked at um, taking our nutritional supplement because there was quite a bit of information showing that oxaloacetate, which is a metabolite in the Krebs cycle, uh, helped with glioblastoma. Uh, so let me go into that. Um, the FDA, after looking at our preliminary data, uh, decided to grant us orphan drug status. Okay, so they did a review of what what they saw in, in our data, and they said, okay, this is not a drug. This has potential. And so to fuel that potential, we're going to give you this orphan drug status, which includes things like tax credits and uh, advanced placement in the drug processing, and uh, it also gives you a, a seven-year exclusive in the marketplace. So uh, they're trying to trying to facilitate taking these small diseases and do something for these people. So we, we've got drugs, orphan drug status. We also have patent rights from the European Patent Office and from the Australian Patent Office, and we've got uh, patents pending in the US, Canada, India, Japan, uh, for the use of oxaloacetate in treating cancer. So, as a natural compound, it's very difficult to get things into the drug world because of lack of patenting. Because you're not going to spend $800 million when you can't get your money back. One of the important things that we've tried to do is take this natural compound, oxaloacetate, through the patenting process so that there's a reason for a pharmaceutical company to eventually pick this up and get it widespread. But in the meantime, We've put it out as a medical food. And we're kind of a crazy company to do that. Um, but we did that because we thought it was the right thing. Um, it's, uh, I've already talked about medical foods, that they have to be uh, done under the supervision of a physician, uh, and that there has to be a scientific basis for it. Um, so we're looking at now using this gliaxyl, which is oxaloacetate and ascorbic acid, vitamin C, that's it, uh, and looking at glioblastoma. So the current story on glioblastoma is you start off with surgery and radiation, and a lot of times they'll put in a wafer with chemotherapy, and then the disease runs its course, or 
you, you eliminate most of the, the tumor, usually around 85 to 90 percent, because it kind of interwines into the, into the brain. And then you've got a period of quiescence, usually six months, and then it comes screaming back. And at that time, you might uh, do chemotherapy. And chemotherapy increases uh, average survival from 12.2 months to 14.6 months. Hey, it's 20%. It's not a lot, though. So there, there are some real problems. Um, this, again, it affects about 23,000 people. Um, the survival, five-year survival, 2%. So there's a very pressing need for this. And the need is now. The need isn't in 10 years, because these people aren't going to live 10 years. So taking it to the drug process uh, is essentially putting these people to death. Uh, so what we found when we started doing this in patients, and this was done uh, uh, at uh, UC San Diego uh, through one of the uh, uh, people there at the Moore's Cancer Center uh, helping to look at this, um, we saw that uh, with oxaloacetate supplementation, in some of the cases, the tumor did continue to grow. Uh, this is definitely not a cure. This is metabolic management of cancer as opposed to a cure. But we did see some of the cases reduce in size, and most of them uh, stopped growing, about 88% between these two categories, uh, which for um, glioblastoma is pretty astounding. I could give you a, a specific example. A uh, nice young man, 42 years old, uh, had surgery, radiation, chemo. It went away for a while. It came back screaming. His tumor was growing 80% per month. You don't have long when your tumor is growing 80% per month. He went back on chemotherapy, added with the glyoxal medical food. His tumor growth went to zero for eight months. Now, when you consider that chemotherapy typically adds about two months of survival, uh, as opposed to non-chemotherapy, having someone have no growth for eight months is pretty significant. Now, will that last forever? We don't know. We're still in the beginning phases of this. The longest person that we know of uh, is a young man. He's 24 years old. He has an astrocytoma, which is not as aggressive. He's managing it with a ketogenic diet and glyoxal medical food. He's been on it for about 16 months with zero growth. So we'll see if this continues. Again, this is a very early starting point. Alan, why are you releasing a medical food when you don't have several years of data? Because there's a pressing need. OK, so um, it's interesting. We've tried this glyoxal with a variety of different therapies. Uh, so the nice thing is, is you can combine it with various things, like the calorie-restricted ketogenic diet, uh, like various forms of, of chemotherapy. And I don't know if you've heard, but Avastin was recently shown to have no benefit in glioblastoma, which is, is too bad for those people. Uh, you can do it with radiation. And in slow-growing tumors, you can probably do it alone. Um, the mechanism of action here is glutamate. And what we found with oxaloacetate is it goes into the bloodstream. It reacts through the enzyme serum glutamate oxaloacetate transanamase, which is why we call it GOT, and makes alpha-ketoglutarate. So it strips down glutamate levels in the blood, which then lowers glutamate levels in the brain. They've done an awful lot of work on this in Europe, where they're using uh, oxaloacetate. They're getting ready to do clinical trials for uh, brain injury, uh, for stroke, uh, for epilepsy, things that increase the amount of, of glutamate. So they thought they'd also check it for glioblastoma, and it was very successful. Um, here you can see uh, they implanted some human glioblastoma tissues into 
uh, mice. And as Thomas said, there may be some issues with, with that model, but it does give us an indication uh, before and then seven days after. Here's the growth rate with the normal cells. And here, look at just putting oxaloacetate in their water. Their tumor has grown 50% less. And this is statistically significant. Look at this um, mouse. Uh, here's the control mouse. And you can see just adding oxaloacetate cuts it in about half. Adding chemotherapy cuts it further. Adding oxaloacetate and chemotherapy, look at the difference. It's synergistic. And that's because we're dropping glutamate levels, which is feeding the tumors. We're starving the tumors. And it's kind of interesting. The way oxaloacetate got started as a supplement in, in the market is as a calorie restriction mimetic. It produces some of the same metabolic states as calorie restriction. So we're seeing a reduced amount of, of tumor cells. We're seeing uh, astrocyte levels stay high, which is a good thing. Uh, but this is, this is the most telling thing. So we give the mice, here's 100% alive, here's 100% dead. We don't leave the room alive. Um, and after 30 days of implanting these glioblastoma tissues into these um, mice, which are immune compromised, they die very quickly. If we give them chemotherapy, they all live a bit longer. So the curve is shifted to the right, which is what you want to do. Okay? But the interesting thing is, if we just give them oxaloacetate without chemotherapy, they live almost as long. And there are no side effects with oxaloacetate. It's a food. Your body chooses to, to process it. It's in every cell of your body. So here we're doing just about as well as chemotherapy. But the really exciting thing is when we put them together, it increases survival 237%. And 30% of the mice you can't find the cancer. That's exciting. That's exciting. So some of the other things, um, a lot of people feel that, that uh, gliomas are tied to this uh, function, uh, increase in function mutation in uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase 1 and 2. And this produces D2-hydroxyglutarate aciduria. Um, this increases children who are born with uh, metabolic problems that have high amounts of this very often go into glioblastoma. Okay, So what we see is that, and this is a paper that was published just recently, uh, is that oxaloacetate is competitive uh, and reduces this. Um, so here's the graph. You can see that as oxaloacetate levels increase, the uh, reaction rate with isocitrate dehydrogenase drops, and uh, the uh, 2-HG drops also. So uh, we're currently in phase one uh, for treating some children that have uh, this terrible disease. And we have seen drops in their uh, 2-HG levels. Uh, the interesting thing about that clinical trial is the Institutional Review Board has approved oxaloacetate up to 6,000 milligrams per kilogram. That is huge. And it's huge because it's a food. It's a non-toxic food. Uh, another interesting thing is we've seen that AMPK activation uh, which does a lot of things like uh, creates new mitochondria uh, and, and increases mitochondrial density. Uh, it's one of the first steps in mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, activating that um, allows stem cells that were producing cancer cells to differentiate normally. Let me put that in, in broader terms. It's allowing st stem cells that were producing cancer to produce normal cells instead. 
That's pretty interesting. Now, they activated AMPK in this study uh, with metformin, and they showed the increase in survival uh, using different uh, formulas of metformin. Um, and again, the control group here and the metformin group here by activating M uh, AMPK uh, decreased tumor volume. Uh, and when we compare that to oxaloacetate, it's about the same. The, the mice live about 40 days. Uh, with, with treatment, they live about 60 days. But this is the interesting thing, is combining them both together. So maybe we need that one, two, three punch. Um, the reason I bring up AMPK activation is oxaloacetate's been shown to be an AMPK activator. Uh, we've upregulated the, the FOXO3A gene uh, by 70% just by feeding mice a diet that includes oxaloacetate. And this is work we did at uh, UCSD. Um, another interesting thing is there's a paper been published very recently that shows that the mitochondria and the nucleus both produce proteins that allow oxidative phosphorylation to take place in the mitochondria. So they allow the mitochondria to properly process energy. At some point in time, especially as we age, they stop talking to each other and only the nucleus starts producing these proteins and the mitochondria stops. And as a result, oxidative phosphorylation stops and the cells, most of them die, but some of them survive and they survive by doing fermentation process. This is the Warburg effect. They found a reason why the Warburg effect starts. And it's because of this dysregulation in communication between the nucleus and the mitochondria. And that is uh, the chemical that allows that communication is NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And so when they increase the amount of NAD in the cells, they were able to reverse this process. They were able to reverse the Warburg effect. Is this important? Oh, you betcha. Oh, you betcha. It's very exciting. So um, there are multiple advantages to this gliaxal medical food. Uh, case studies support its use. Uh, oxaloacetate um, with temozolomide showed an increase in survival. Uh, we can give it to older patients without side effects, which you can't give older patients chemotherapy. It, it's, just, it's just not good. Uh, and it can decrease glutamate levels, which are possibly feeding that tumor. Uh, and uh, it's been shown to activate AMPK, which may prevent those stem cells from producing the tumor cells so that it doesn't come back as fast. So we have both primary support and secondary support. I've gone through uh, most of this primary support uh, with you. I'm going to now talk a little bit about secondary support. Uh, primary support is we put it in, the tumor stops, or we put it in, the tumor goes away. Secondary support is more out there, uh, mm -hmm. so bear with me. Um, as secondary support, uh, oxaloacetate through the reaction in getting rid of glutamate increases alpha ketoglutarate and that has been shown to allow proper histone demethylation or histone methylation, excuse me. What that is is on your DNA you have this sheath and in order to have your DNA open and close properly and, and get to the genes you have this methylation sheath. And so alpha ketoglutarate is one of those compounds that help with that. And we're still trying to figure all this out. At least I'm trying to still figure all this out. Um, oxaloacetate, when we give it to lung cells in culture, and again, that's not the same as doing it in the animal, but in culture uh, has shown that 
they stop growing. Whereas normal lung, can or lung cells use oxaloacetate as a food source. So this is very similar to what we're seeing in the brain cancer, uh, but in the lungs, is that it doesn't kill the cancer, it just stops it from growing, which if you don't have cancer growing and you don't have it going into metastasis, it's metabolic management of cancer. Um, again, calorie restriction has been shown to reduce uh, uh, the uh, lethality of uh, glioblastoma, uh, as has a ketogenic diet. As it turns out, oxaloacetate is a ketone. So you're adding more ketones to the body and a calorie restriction mimetic. We've written several papers on showing how it mimics the calorie restricted metabolic state and how when we give it to animals, they live 25% longer. Imagine that. So uh, Dr. Seyfried was saying, well, we need to lower glutamine and we need to lower sugar. Well, oxaloacetate has been shown in human clinical trial to lower glucose levels, fasting glucose levels, in type 1 and type 2 diabetics. And it was never commercialized because, and, and I went over to Japan where the study was done, and I asked them, I said, where, where's the... Where's the follow-up data? This is amazing. They said, well, it's a natural compound. No patent rights. Now, that was the end of the conversation. Uh, here's a, a guy called uh, Krebs. I, you probably never heard of him. Uh, he sh yeah, who, who is he? Uh, he showed that oxaloacetate increases the NAD to NADH ratio by 900% in about two minutes. So very, very powerful change in the cell, the redox of the cell. And I bring that up because increasing the NAD to NADH ratio inhibits metastasis and prevents disease progression in breast cancer. Or so the people at the Scripps Institute have just published in 2013. This is exciting stuff. And it's a food. OK. All right. So. In a case study, um, and this is, uh, I, th I think it's one of your patients, isn't it, George? Um, metastatic breast cancer. She took a PET scan before, and then 30 days later, she took a PET scan after uh, she started taking uh, gliaxal medical food. And she saw her uh, SUV values, which is a, a, what the PET scan does is it looks at how your body uptakes sugar. Okay, and, and cancer likes to uptake a lot of cancer, so you can, or a lot, a lot of sugar. So you can find it very easily uh, by putting this radioactive compound in and, and being able to target it. So just 30 days, they saw a 30% 30 30 drop in the amount of sugar uptake because of better metabolic, 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 yeah, metabolic. there, <laughs> metabolic <laughs> regulation. OK, so oxaloacetate's been used as a supplement. Um, primarily now it's used by anti-aging doctors. Um, there, there's a big market for uh, oxaloacetate. There's a, a dietary supplement, Benagene, that, that we first came out with. Um, and it's for anti-aging. Uh, but it's been used in the marketplace for years and years now, and we don't see the side effects. So this is a fairly safe compound to go after something as lethal as gliomas. Um, some of the other trials that have been done, I talked about this a little bit, uh, been done uh, studies in the anti-diabetic effect of sodium oxaloacetate. Um, we're now in clinical trial for Parkinson's disease. We're, we're in a phase two trial now. Um, I don't have the results yet. It's a double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial being done by a third party, uh, the University of Kansas. Uh, we're also working a, with them on an Alzheimer's disease trial. 
Even though this is a phase one trial and you don't look for efficacy, they're reporting back to me they're starting to see some efficacy, which is, is really cool. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association gave us a, uh, a fairly large grant to do a two-year study in Alzheimer model mice. So again, that's modeling problem. But um, what we saw by just putting oxaloacetate in their feed, we saw a 50% increase in short-term memory uh, in Alzheimer model mice. Uh, so pretty exciting stuff. We also have a, a clinical trial going on for uh, D2 hydroxyglutarate aciduria, which is uh, a very unfortunate disease, uh, mostly in children because uh, they, they don't grow up. And uh, also there was uh, this, this older clinical trial. So again, in, in looking at any kind of medical food, you want to first look at safety. Um, it's a metabolite found in every cell of your body. So this is no Frankenstein molecule. Uh, it's central to metabolism. It's available as a medical food. Uh, it's essentially non-toxic. Efficacy, we've talked about, and we've talked about, and we've talked about. Simplicity, it's a medical, you know, it, it, it's just mixed with vitamin C. Oxaloacetate, vitamin C. It's water soluble, you just take it by, uh, by pills, and it's synergistic. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. You can also go to the website, www. Gleaxel.com. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you all very much. I, when George called and asked me to come to this conference, there are many, many other things I, at the time, thought I would have preferred to do. Uh, but I was uh, very fascinated in working with Tom for the last three years and Beth and uh, talking to George about continuing for me to learn about this subject and to learn from others like Alan, that was a, a lovely talk and, uh, and, and everyone who spoke before. And my, I'm a clinician, I'm, a, I'm at the University of Pittsburgh. I've been a neurosurgeon for too many years, a lot of years, and uh, a very big interest in sports medicine. Uh, one of my most fun things is I'm his team physician for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And what does that have to do with, with brain tumors? Well, not much, but I've kind of migrated into sports medicine because of the futility that I've experienced with problems like this. Uh, this is a malignant glioblastoma multiforme, and I've operated on probably over three or 400 patients with this problem. And I can say none of them have survived. Now, I said that to another audience and one of the gentlemen spoke up and he said, remind me not to have you operate on me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you all know what I mean. And, but, but it is futile. So that when so, I, I have a patient, I get a call, I have a patient, a relative, a family or whatever that has this tumor, what should I do? What can I do? And you know, this pall of depression comes over me because I know that, as Alan said, uh, the chances of surviving this are almost nil, virtually nil. And it's not a curative problem. Mean survival, 12 to 18 months, six months if no treatment, 12 months with radiation therapy, with radiation therapy and maybe an extra couple of months with, with chemotherapy. So it's a devastating problem. And there have been no significant advances in, this, in the treatment of this tumor, really, since I've been in surgery over 30 years. And uh, I don't really see anything imminent on the horizon. And in, if you look at all the randomized controlled studies, we've added maybe four to six months of survival with everything that we're doing. And as Tom stated, there are several treatment paradigms that we're looking at. We look at cell division, movement, responses to external stimuli, uh, and transcription factors. So these are all targets that billions of dollars are being spent on in terms of research. And we come up with various therapies. Small molecule therapies, the various agents, 
monoclonal antibodies, immune system enhancement, cancer vaccines, gene therapy, all of these have experimental protocols at various universities throughout the United States and the NIH. But at this particular point in time, none are any better than the other in any controlled, in any controlled study. So let's go back a couple of million years in terms of our evolution. You know, what are we talking about in terms of the ketogenic diet? Well, I, I, I really like this quote. The evolutionary success of our species is due to the inheritance of traits that bestowed adaptive versatility. And what do we mean by adaptive versatility? You know, might, just might, the treatment of malignant glioblastomas and other cancers. Just might it be a pretty simple type of process. What do I mean by that? My, when I went to the University of Pittsburgh initially, my, uh, my mentor and associate, Peter Janetta, uh, discovered a treatment for tic de la rue, trigeminal neuralgia, which is intractable, burning, at times suicidal facial pain. And in his laboratory experiments, he discovered that, that by moving a small blood vessel, an artery, off of the trigeminal nerve at the brain stem, he could cure trigeminal neuralgia. We used to avulse the nerve, cut the nerve, burn the nerve, boil the nerve, uh, all sorts of things to get rid of tic de la rue. Now, it's a two centimeter incision, remove the blood vessel, and the patients, for the most part, are cured. Might this, might this be possible in cancer? Well, uh, six weeks ago, I was very privileged to be the team doctor uh, for a group of athletes who climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. So I went along, and we climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, and uh, we surfaced at uh, 19,000 feet. And I did this with my daughter, and we had a spectacular view from uh, looking over the, over the clouds, over the mountains. And uh, we subsequently, my daughter and I, went on a safari. We were in Tanzania, and we went on a safari. And uh, it was quite exciting, because it really was going back millions of years in time, literally when we were on the, oh, excuse me, I, let me go back one point. Uh, this is a fairly, a very unique group of athletes. They're all disabled. Uh, the fellow here uh, on the far left has one leg. The guy next to him has one leg. The fellow next to me has no legs and no arm. This fellow has no leg, and this young man, 19 years old, has no arms. So these gentlemen all climbed this mountain, and the theme of the climb was one's altitude is determined by one's attitude. And I was privileged to join them and what they did afterwards is they went through South Africa. They, they went to uh, Pretoria, they went to the various major cities, and they gave talks to disabled kids with no limbs in Africa, emphasizing that point that one's attitude determines one's altitude. So what does this have to do? Well, we went down from there to the Serengeti Plain, my daughter and I. And it isn't quite like what we saw, but we did see the same plains that were existence a million, two million years ago, where our ancestors uh, were in battle to survive. And they lived on a feast or a famine manner. And you know, what did they do when they killed the animals? They feasted, they gormandized, and they built up their body fat in times of famine. And this gets back to calorie restriction, coming from a couple of million years ago to Clive McKay 
a, a uh, scientist at Cornell University who in 1935 published the seminal paper in which he took rats, fed them 40% less calories, and made the observation that these animals lived about 40% longer from a calorie-restricted diet with all of the appropriate nutrients. So he stated that calorie restriction increased longevity, but they didn't know why. We never knew why calorie restriction added years to our lives. And Leonard Garenti, an MIT scientist, uh, asked the question, how does calorie restriction work? And subsequently, one of his pupils, David Sinclair, asked the same question. He's the head of the anti-aging lab at Harvard University now and a good friend. Uh, and they discovered the so-called longevity gene, the sirtuin gene, the SIRT2 gene. And what they found was that perhaps there's a new concept of aging. The pace of aging is regulated by genes. And, and we could go forever on that subject and also epigenetic factors as well, which is what we're talking about here. But it's the epigenetic factors of our diet, the whole new science of nutrigenomics, how nutrition affects and activates our genes for better or for worse, depending on which foods we eat, that really predicts, predicts to 70% of the time our longevity. So this new class of enzymes underlines the molecular mechanism of calorie-restricted mediated effects. So the molecular targets of calorie restriction are all of the molecules and genes you see there, NF-kappa B, uh, Krebs, the CERT1. All of these have a major impact on what happens to our physiology. We know that cal calorie restriction suppresses the mammalian target of rapamycin, which also has a very potent effect on, uh, on cell death. And, and tumors. The NRF2, gatekeeper of longevity, another gene that uh, is very enhanced when it, it, it enhances longevity. And the activators of NRF2, calorie restriction, resveratrol, curcumin, broccoli that uh, Alan was talking about, and other dietary polyphenols. So David Sinclair wrote an excellent paper on the mechanism of aging and development and, and, uh, and longevity. And we know that calorie restriction prevents all of these diseases. This is not new to this particular audience. And we also know that in the times of famine, what we basically do is break down our fat to form ketone bodies. And when keto bodies are formed, these are actually uh, in place of of, of the carbohydrate molecules, of the glucose we need to carry on our daily activities. Not new at all, as Alan said, cancer feeds on sugar. On the savanna, two to four pounds of honey a year. Now it's 150 to 200 pounds of sugar a year. This is a slide that is just a phenomenal slide from Tom's book that I, I really, if you're serious about learning about this, it's all there. Patient comes to me with a glioblastoma multiforme. What's the first thing that I give them when I see the edema, the swelling around the tumor? The first thing that you give them is steroids. What do steroids do to your blood sugar level? It, it, it increases it. Uh, and it also, we know that there's with tumors an incredibly pro-inflammatory component to this that enhances the uh, the negativity of tumors. And steroids may have some silencing of the, a little bit of the anti-inflammatory anti -inflammatory effect as well as that. Then the next thing, after we operate on them and stir things up, literally, uh, break down more the blood-brain barrier, uh, what's the next thing we give them? We give them radiation therapy. And what does radiation therapy do to the brain and the peritumoral areas that are already vulnerable? It increases and releases glutamate, <coughs> which is converted to sugar. And then we give them chemotherapy, which destroys some cells and also releases more glutamate. So we're literally 
as Tom has illustrated many times, when we have a patient with a malignant brain tumor, we're pouring gasoline on the fire with our current treatments. This, to me, when I see this happening daily, every day in, my, in our clinics, uh, it, it just, it's kind of like I felt after our initial talk on sugar. You, know, you, you, you look at sugar now, you see somebody drinking a, a can of Coke, and you say, oh my God, you're killing yourself. Well, it, it's similar. So, and then, this is a paper from Hopkins that correlated blood sugar levels with time of survival. Persistent outpatient hyperglycemia is independently associated with decreased survival after primary resection of malignant brain tumors. Can't get any simpler than that. The higher your blood sugar, the quicker you're going to die. So Tom's point, and he's emphasized this at symposium around the world, that is this a genetic disease? Well, that is the current thinking. The current thinking, and it clearly there are genetic abnormalities that occur, but is this a treat, is, should we be focusing all of our energies on treating this genetically when there are hundreds of thousands of gene mutations in every tumor that are continually continuing to alternate? So you're, you're literally trying to hit a moving target with many of our genetic therapies. So this is the book you all should have in your library. Uh, is cancer genetic in origin? And Tom's quote says it so well. It's throwing good money after bad, where herd mentality trumps rational thinking. And I fear the cancer body count will need to go much higher before the medical establishment, etc., cetera, uh, approaches this in, a, in a, at least an alternative fashion. So I'm not going to re be redundant relative to the great contributions of Otto Warburg, Nobel Prize in 1931, and ask the same rhetorical question. It's by repetitive nature that we continue to learn. Every time I hear Tom speak, I learn something more. So I know I'm being a little repetitive here, but bear with me, and maybe another approach may give you another perspective. So there, there's damaged mitochondria, defects in mitochondrial uh, respiration and energy metabolism. And then uh, this slide, Tom went over uh, about impaired, impaired energy metabolism. So it's important, again, it's a concept that I had a hard time grasping, that we know that in the mitochondria, glucose plus oxygen goes to ATP, water, uh, and carbon dioxide. If that's blocked, then the cell manufactures ATP in the cytosol by glycolysis. Now, in the tumors, we know in the center of a glioblastoma, there's hypoxia. There's not enough oxygen. There's low oxygen content so that we still have these cells proliferating. They're proliferating because they're able to convert, as Tom said, to fermentation and get their energy in a low oxygen environment because they're able to use glucose in the absence of oxygen through fermentation to get ATP. So the side effect or the, the byproduct of that is also lactic acid. <clears throat> so, what we're emphasizing, and again, is in what Alan mentioned too, that glucose and glutamine are the prime metabolic fuels for malignant tumors. We can survive on ketones because of our evolutionary background of learning to do that millions of years ago. Neoplasms, brain cancers, other tumors are evolutionarily new entities in an old body. They are unable to use ketones. They don't have the molecular mechanisms that have been programmed over millions of years of survival to use ketones. So we're, we're using a ketogenic diet, 
in these things. For epilepsy, it's a very effective treatment. And uh, the, our, our goal then is to starve the tumor of glucose by taking away the glucose and glutamine and providing ketones so that the brain, the liver, the cardiac function can all continue. That's, that's the basis bottom line. So uh, the use of ketones by neurons and, and this basically says the same thing. Uh, the glioma cells are incapable of compensating uh, for glucose restriction. They are capable by metabolizing mm -hmm. ketone bodies. So to get personal again, this is the MRI of a woman in Italy who is the mother of the chief of neuroradiology at the University of Pittsburgh Children's Hospital and a close friend and colleague of mine, Giulio Zuccoli. Giulio has a very, very strong interest in malignant brain tumors. His father died of the same thing eight years ago. Now his mother has the same tumor. So if you were a prodigy of this couple, I think you would ask yourself the question, when am I going to develop my brain tumor? So his father had the traditional therapy, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, subsequently expired in a relatively quick period of time. And when he saw that he read this scan in his own mother, he's a neuroradiologist, he called Tom having looked into the literature, what can I do for my mother besides giving her the same treatment, which obviously failed? He got in touch with Tom, and he put her on a very initial 24 to 40, 48 to two to three day fast, and then a strict ketogenic diet. And they subsequently uh, used the restricted ketogenic diet for the reasons that we have spoken about. And uh, this is the slide above, and this is the slide two and a half months later, uh, after being put on a, a very tightly controlled ketogenic diet. I don't think it gets much more dramatic than that in terms of what can be done. Subsequently, uh, she was convinced to be put on a, uh, a uh, what, what drug was it, Tom? Do you recall? Uh, Avastin. Avastin. Subsequently was put on Avastin, and the tumor recurred, and she subsequently expired. But this, again, there's a, there's a paper I read quite a few years ago uh, by Bill Sweet, who was the head of neurosurgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital. It's a phenomenal paper. And the, the title of it is The Difference Between Zero and One. The Difference Between Zero and One. One case uh, looked at in the right way can be the, the opening door to very large studies that can confirm that particular observation. Well, this is, this is one case. But uh, subsequently, he and, and uh, Tom and others published this paper, and uh, it, it really was a, an important paper in terms of showing that it can be very, it can be very effective. Uh, subsequent papers, uh, this is Tom's friends in Germany. Uh, these this suggests that a ketogenic is suitable for even advanced cancer patients, it has no severe side effect, might improve aspects of quality of life in some patients with advanced metastatic tumors. <clears throat> but as Tom just said, I think this is the same group that published the recent paper saying that it wasn't effective without calorie restriction. So these are some of the papers that Tom has published that I've relied on, on heavily. And an extremely important feature of this is that this is a, a, an approach that has biomarkers for determining the success or non-success. By measuring glucose, by measuring ketone bodies with a finger stick, we literally can follow whether or not they are hitting the therapeutic 
uh, parameters that we would like to hit. And what are those parameters? You want to maintain the blood sugar in the 50 to 60 range, if at all possible, and you want to increase the ketone levels to two millimoles or so in this range. This is a, I, I think this chart that Tom has published uh, is one of the most important, one, one of the most important observations in neuro-oncology. For the first time, you have biomarkers that you can put an individual on a specific diet, measure these, and compare with MRIs and, and, and subsequent progress. And I won't go into the anti-angiogenesis aspect of ketogenic diet. Uh, this was shown by Tom again, uh, how the ketogenic diet in a tumor rat model uh, caused the tumor to disappear. It reduces angiogenesis, and uh, it, it has various anti-inflammatory effects. It blocks NF-kappa B, which is a major transcription factor for pro-angiogenesis and inflammation. Uh, it influence, it, it, this is another on NF-kappa B. The problems, what are the problems? Why isn't everybody on a ketogenic diet and a calorie-restricted calorie? That's why I'm here today, to learn how we can actually use such a diet for patients. And, and maybe I, I can get this uh, over lunch or whatever else, but I, how do we do it? How do we set, what protocol do we use? Uh, it's poorly tolerated. So these are other solutions. Uh, 2DG is a, a compound that uh, blocks sugar uptake, phenylbutyrate, binds to glutamine, is excreted, attacks both of those. Three, bromopyruvate. Uh, George, I'd like to talk to you much more about this uh, later on. Uh, Dr. Koh and Pedersen from 2001. It blocks both. It gets into the cells and blocks oxphos and glycolysis. And then uh, uh, to, a, to reverse the various, various other agents for can cancer prevention, uh, there are various plant metabolites and polyphenols that we were to earlier. And, and I'm, unfortunately, I, uh, I'm, I'm running out of time. But these are the various agents that can all be blocked by plant metabolites and the phytochemicals that we were introduced, introduced to earlier. Resveratrol, natural chemo prevention, uh, Hypoxia inducible factor one is in cancers and it leads to many, many problems. Uh, and hyperbaric oxygen was also mentioned uh, in the treatment for, for malignancy. So basically in summary, it's a metabolic disease. These are the various agents that uh, are available and we simply now have to learn how to put these together in the right way. And I don't know how to do that for sure, but I'm learning here and I'm uh, depending on you all to help us with this. But these are all things that are very powerful. And then um, let food be thy medicine. But I think this, everybody in this room can relate to this quote. All great truths go through three phases. Number one, you're ridiculed. Number two, you're violently attacked. And then it's finally accepted as self-evident. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what we're going to do now is mm -hmm. go to a whole new phase. Um, most of us are going to talk much. He's doing it all the time. As we just heard Joe say, uh, we've got to work together so that we make this applicable. And we're going to introduce starting uh, with some people who have done this. People who were actually diagnosed as dying people with catastrophic diseases. And this will be the first phase. This afternoon we'll have the second phase for these people. And this evening, the third phase. You're going to hear different forms of cancers, different forms of diseases. Many of these people have all their records fully with them. Oh my. And uh, they're very open to speak to you about it. And very open uh, for you to learn what they've been doing. And pretty much when you hear this, 
Uh, it's going to be refreshing for those of us who practice health and medicine because in normal practices you don't see too often these type of occurrences where it's commonplace for us here and has been for 60 years at Hippocrates. Uh, we are collecting data. Anna alluded to it. We have so much to say over this short period of time that uh, three years ago I challenged a medical school in Europe in Lithuania because they were in admiration of the work we do here and the successes we've had here to create a legitimate medical school, and they said yes. And so within the next two years, it looks very promising that the very first medical school on the planet Earth will open up and be actually taught in English for 12 years, and the prescription pad for the young doctors graduating that school will have what we're all working on here. It's going to be lifestyle, including not only food, you know, I wish it was that easy, but attitude, movement exercise, non-invasive therapies, nutrient upload, supplementation like we've heard today. And we're all realizing more and more that it's moved in this direction. So now we have to make it available for young doctors who want to be legitimate healthcare doctors. Now the first couple I'm going to introduce, almost 20 years ago, they came here to Hippocrates Health Institute. What was told to them by doctors after she thought she had hurt the back of her leg from doing exercise is, no, you didn't hurt the back of your leg, you have a catastrophic, rare form of cancer, and if we cut your leg off completely, you'll live for six months. If you don't let us cut your leg off, you're going to die immediately. And I'm going to let C.S. and Alice come up and speak to you. Let's give them a big hand. Well, it was a long, long time ago, and our story is really pretty fascinating, I believe, but it's pretty much indicative of what goes on here at Hippocrates. Now, my wife had the problem, and she was treated in the general medical profession way with the chemotherapy and so forth and so on. And, um, you know, I, I just turned 88. And <laughs> and thanks to what we learned here at Hippocrates, I'm not in such bad shape. <laughs> and, 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 neither, and neither is this cute little lady over here, who's pretty close to my age. <laughs> and. Instead of trying to remember everything, I have here a testimonial letter that she sent to Hippocrates a couple of years after we were here. And I'm going to quote from a little bit. I don't want to read the entirety because I don't want to skip anything either. There's, there's quite a bit involved. And she said, I wish to thank you for your common sense guidance in restoring my health. You helped to guide me from the dark depths of despair of the past to my bright, happy, and healthy present and future as I document in this letter. This was July of 1998, two years after we were here. I suffered greatly in health for a half a year while searching for a healing place. I finally found heaven and a fountain of youth right in my own body. And the oncologist said, of course, you have an inoperable cancer at your leg of your life. He, he said, you know, can't guarantee you're going to live. He said, but it's a start. And she couldn't believe what she was hearing, neither could I. It was an, an amputation, not acceptable option. We're dancers, and we still are. As a matter of fact, we teach dancing, ballroom dancing. And, <laughs> and on the leg that they severely damaged, it's still severely damaged. If, she, if you just touch it hard, it'll start bleeding all the way down like that, down the leg, because of the damage that was done. But fortunately, when they said there's nothing they can do, we, we just couldn't accept it. And they said, well, I said, can't you do anything? I said, well, there's a possibility. You will be number 70 in the world that has had this done. We'll just do uh, hyperthermic, means very hot, 108 degrees Fahrenheit, isolated limb perfusion, just the leg only. Tie everything else off and put it in the leg. Well, because we are walkers and exercise people, her circulation is good, and they put you on this for an hour because everybody is not like us. And so the circulation of this chemo, hot chemo went through her leg, and 
For most people, it turns the leg into a stump. For, for a couple of years, it stayed hard like a baseball bat because it damaged everything in the leg, everything. Well, we came to Hippocrates. We finally found Hippocrates. They were killing her with the drugs. They did the limb perfusion. They said they believed at first it was a baker's cyst, a little round cyst, size of a walnut in the back of her leg, left leg. And they said it's never malignant, but going from an orthopedic person from one to the next to the next, and, and, and a doctor was the head of the oncology department, head of the, uh, of the melanoma department, which they thought was a melanoma, at Moffitt, Lee Moffitt in Tampa. They said that just keep taking these 800 milligram ibuprofens a few times a day, and she did that for a while until I believe that may have been the causative for it to become malignant because a Baker system is supposed to never go bad. And they said it's a classic Baker system. But with all the things that they did to her, never told us they were going to do it, they also removed in a four hour operation all the lymph nodes in her left groin. They were negative. This is the same doctor who's famous for starting the sentinel lymph node, the nearest one to the malignancy. Check that one if that's bad. Next one, next one. And when you don't have any more, take out one more just to be sure, and that's it. Well, I think there's like 10 or 12 of them in there. They took them all out, and I asked him, why did you take those out after it happened? He said, because we always do. Same reason for chemotherapy. It doesn't work, but take it out do it anyway. Well, when we came here, learned what to do, followed the program to the best of our ability, we came here in a wheelchair. Oh, I had massive infection. Pardon? Massive infection. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. From the operation on the groin of removing the lymph nodes, which she doesn't have anymore, they had a drain in there, and the drain was attached improperly. It kept falling out, kept falling out. And the last day when we left, we were getting into an automobile to go home, and it fell out. It fell out of her. The tape, they never changed the tape, just kept, got loose. It fell, it fell down on the ground. She picked it up, and the nurse went and plugged it back in again. Reach in some bag and got a little band-aid and stuck it together. Well, we went home and she came down with a massive infection. They call it today MRSA. She had five bacterial infections plus the MRSA. And they had, she had five doctors on her pain management team. It was so severe. Sorry for the pause. This, this is why Alice is not doing the talking because She'll be just breaking out in tears and it'll be too slippery here to walk. <laughs> but anyway, after going through the program here, the three weeks, we went and got a mem another MRI and, it, and the lymph node removal and the HILP, hyperthermic isolated lymph perfusion, showed no improvement. But 11 months after we changed our lifestyle, which that's, I think that's the answer based on what I've learned, because I kept on learning and researching after this happened. I did it before to find out where to come and how to help. And I kept on learning stuff. Of course, the gentleman before us, sugar, number one, none of that stuff. That's the worst stuff you can have. And so we did the follow-up MRI. And from the 42 millimeter diameter, like a large golf ball, in that 11 months, it dropped down to 27 millimeters, got smaller. Now this entangled what they call the vascular bundle. And that was displaced when a round tumor here, like this here, so it could keep going. And that has nerves, arteries, veins, ligaments, whatever in it. And the cancer had penetrated 
and came through out the other side like, like a big octopus, went through it, and they said, there's no chance of vascular surgery fixing this because you can remove the outside stuff, but what's the inside, we can't get to it. The uh, uh, orthopedic oncologist who did the surgery to see what was going on in there, he said he had an almost an impossible time to get inside the tumor because of the way it was invaded in the vascular bundle to even get the biopsy. So they said vascular surgery, not an option. I spoke to other oncologists. I even spoke to this professor of oncology from um, MD Anderson in Texas. And they all said the very same thing. My dear, it's your leg or your life. No chance of survival. And they said to me, not in front of her, Mr. Cern, we suggest you go ahead and go to hospice and start the ball rolling. That was their telling me, in different words, how much hope they had for success after the surgery and the perfusion and the drugs and the pain and suffering. Well, I tried everything and learned what I could. And I spoke to somebody in Orlando. We lived in Tampa at the time. And he wrote a book called Third Opinion. I read the book, and it mentioned Hippocrates. I called the author of the book. I said, please tell me about it. I said, do you know of anybody who was successful? Oh, yes, he says, a very close friend of mine. We discussed it. He went to Hippocrates. And I saw how did he fare after this with his cancer. And I forget which cancer it was. It's pretty darn serious. He said, well, he's all recovered. He, he, he did well. I said, is he still around? How, when did this happen? Oh, he says about, same thing, about 18 years ago, he said. I said, well, what kind of condition is he now? Oh, he's in fine shape. He is supplying, he sells to all the stores and a lot of individuals, wheatgrass and stuff like that, and, you know, sprouts, so forth. And that's what he's doing now. I said, well, that sounded pretty good. So we came here and went through the program. After the three weeks of here, coming in the wheelchair, I don't know if Brian ever mentioned he had what he called the wheatgrass band. He and a few of his friends over in the therapy building. And we danced a little bit on that leg. And, and today, today we can do something. <laughs> The leg is still here. I thank you, everybody, and thank you, Huck. And I thank you, Brian, for doing such a wonderful job of helping us and helping so many other people. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you. Uh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. The next young lady that's going to come up, Susan Maharaj, and you may remember the name because she's married to the Maharaj family. Uh, you met Dr. Maharaj. But not him. And she was told she had serious problems. You ever notice that most of the docs say very serious? And thank God she didn't take it that serious. So we'll let Susan tell her story to you. Good morning. As Ryan said, my name is Susan Maharaj. Um, I'm blessed to live in this area. Um, uh, but not so blessed to have been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer in October, uh, October 10th, uh, 2012. Um, let's see if I can figure this out. Haha. -ha. Um, I actually found a lot myself and often remember thinking, you know, how am I going to tell? If I, I do my breast exam, what's it going to feel like? How am I going to know? Well, I knew, uh, or I, I knew enough to, to call my doctor. So she did an exam. She said, well, she was, couldn't be sure. 
but suggested I go have a mammogram, which I did. Uh, from there, they sent me to have an ultrasound in the same, you know, same office. Um, and when those results came back, um, they were highly suggestive of a malignancy, and they recommended that I go and see a surgeon. Wrong way. So when I went to the surgeon, he uh, directed me to have a biopsy, which, not knowing any better, I immediately did. Um, and when those results came back, they were 40% of the tumor uh, invasive carcinoma and 60% of the tumor ductal carcinoma in situ. And I included, to get that right, um, the documents, which I am assuming a lot of you will understand. Um, but the test results in summary were ER uh, favorable, PR favorable, KI67 borderline, P53 unfavorable, and HER2 2 plus equivocal. So with that, um, these are some of the other slides saying, showing those same things. The surgeon's recommendations were, you know, you have a young child. Let me not talk about that. <laughs> um, and he suggested that I had about three options um, to remove the tumor and possibly have radiation to just have a mastectomy to be careful, you know, to get, make sure they got everything or even to have a double mastectomy to be sure that it wouldn't come back in the future. So that was a pretty, I'm not going to get that right, that's a pretty scary meeting. Um, and it was, let's make the appointment right now. You know, he got out his pencil and let's figure it out. We're going to go with this. Um, but I asked him, I said, you know, how far along or what do you think about my timing that I could look at an alternative treatment? Um, I had heard of Hippocrates um, living in this same area, luckily enough. Um, our sons went to the same school. As well, my sister-in-law, who's a doctor, had brought one of our, uh, some of our family to a Save Your Life seminar. And so I decided to go along with her for support. And I very clearly remember being there and thinking, well, if I get cancer, I, I don't have to worry. I'm just going to come here. It was actually quite a relief. but not one I really thought I, I would have to uh, endure. So the very next day I came, I met with Anna, and she looked over my test results and my, my uh, information, and she said, you know, just come here. You just need to come here. And luckily, having a, a confidence level of, of seeing their lifestyle and knowing that they walk the talk, that they, you know, live this lifestyle and, and how they thrive with it, I said, okay, well, I would like to do that. So on October 14th, I started the three-week life transformation program. Um, I, I learned, I ate, I detoxed. Um, I mean, it's, it's just a totally in-depth experience and one that I'm very grateful for. But along the lines, um, you start to wonder. Um, my cancer was, I think, early enough that I didn't have a lot of the signs that I realized in hindsight. Yes, I was losing energy and I was tired, but I thought that was as I was aging. Um, so as Brian mentioned, Dr. Maharaj, who's a distance family, um, but still, still a Maharaj, uh, I was introduced to him by my same sister-in-law who's a doctor and I had worked with him in the past. And what he has found, uh, as he was mentioning yesterday, is that people with cancer have a very low natural kill, killer cell activity level. Um, so he suggested that first we take the test and see where mine was. So as you can see here, the normal range from 16.3 to 39.9, and that's with some, some plus or minus variation, um, that's the normal range. Mine was at 6.85. And I'll point out that at that point, that was October 25th, I'd already been in the program. So I probably was even lower than that to start with. Um, and then on February 11th, after, several months after, I did the test again, and you can see that it's not, it was then at 10.75. A third test revealed in May uh, 30th of 2013 that my activity level had gotten up to 14.25. 
significantly higher than it had started. Um, I'd been through the program, I was continuing with the lifestyle, and there's the results to show you that in seven months, 16.3 uh, being the, the norm, the start of the norm, I had climbed um, that, that far, 7.4% over, over seven months. <laughs> so living this lifestyle, you know, really, really has its benefits. The other um, alternative, tr uh, not treatment, but testing that I did was thermography. Um, and you can see here, this is November 8th, so I am already have gone the, through the three-week program. I finished on November 3rd. Um, and not really being versed in, in how to read these, you can see there's a lot of differentiation. There's a lot of red, there's also a lot of blue, and a lot of, of, of not, not consistencies. It's, it's very all over the map. Then on February 23rd, uh, 2013, it's much more uniform. Okay, uh, a lot of that I attribute to what I've learned here from Linda, Lymph, lymph Linda as we affectionately call her. Um, she taught us how to do the, a lymph rub ourselves. Um, and I think Brian was mentioning last night, they're not creating a dependence. You're not dependent on them. They want to teach you so you can go and, and take care of yourself, not have to come back to them like the other um, medical professions seem to, to be. So I have the... Ah, um, the written test results as well, but basically um, their findings already in November, they've listed on the bottom, I don't think you can see that there was a confirmed malignancy, um, but they're saying that the other breast was um, normal. And then in February, both are registering as normal, and you know they're really saying there wasn't a, a lot of change that they could see um, in the time frame, um, but I wish I would have been able to have that thermography before I started the program and really see that there was a more extreme difference. So March 6, 2013, I had a PET scan and the results of that came back that um, there was no evidence of abnormal activity uh, to suggest residual disease. So. While I did still have a lump, uh, it was smaller because I could physically feel it. Many of the tumors are inside and you can't just monitor that yourself. But I could monitor it and I could tell that it was continually shrinking and, and today I can hardly even find it if I'm even sure that I can. So um, I continue with the lifestyle and, uh, you know, and the results are amazing. So as if that wasn't enough, that I came here to conquer that challenge, there is a lot of other additional benefits. Uh, it strengthened my immune system, which we could, we could um, measure in the test from Dr. Maharaj. It increased my energy. There was an extreme excess weight loss that wasn't even something I was considering um, to the point where I even, you know, have bulked up since then. I lost even more. Uh, I used to have quite a trouble with sinus congestion and drainage. Every morning draining, every evening congested when I lay down, that's gone. Um, I also had been developing something called actinic keratosis, these little dry spots, um, which I, I deemed were precancerous because I got a letter from my insurance company that said, you know, you now have a condition, a pre-existing condition. So um, that's all but gone. Um, it, it decreases your body odor as well, so you don't have to worry about wearing those toxic deodorants. And something embarrassing but quite important to this, this lifestyle is, you know, the, the monitoring your bowel movements, they are easy and they're regular, um, and that's a good sign of what's going on inside. So, a brief synopsis of the five most important months of my life and continuing. Diagnosis, October 10th. Started at Hippocrates, October 14th. I had my first test of the natural killer cells on the 25th and then completed the, my three-week program in November 3rd. Uh, and November 8th was the first thermography, again the natural killer on the 11th of November, um, and then on into 2013, another thermography, cleared with my PET scan, and then another natural killer activity test. So it, in a very short span of time, um, you can see that there was dramatic results. Um, but it doesn't end there. 
you know, I, I continue on with the lifestyle and that is something that is necessary and important. Um, I'm not as strict, strict as I was back then, um, but you know, you do go off and suddenly realize, oh, I, I, I get a little cold, gotta get back in tow. So it's, it's a learning curve, um, but you really do see the difference. These changes were all direct results of this lifestyle. I was very lucky. I didn't go and have all these awful treatments and things done to me that wore down my body. It was just a change in my lifestyle. So it was all very positive. Um, you know, not, no other medical treatments per se, just, just this lifestyle. So it's now my mission to spread the word and I'm so thankful to be here today to be able to share. Mm. Um, thank you. everybody. My name's Raul, without the E. I spelled it wrong, but that's okay. Um, I guess we should start at the beginning. My journey started about 11 years ago, uh, and it started because I wanted to get, you know, more life insurance, and I had a blood test done, and my PSA at that time was about 4.2, so naturally they said, uh, we're not going to give you life insurance, you got to go see a doctor. I went to see a doctor and he said that there's a chance I had a problem with my prostate. Uh, at that time, I weighed 60 pounds more than I weigh now. I had high blood pressure and high cholesterol. My cholesterol at that time was about 240. Uh, during a short period of time, my PSA went from 4.2 to almost 12, to almost 11.8. I was a paramedic for Dade County, so I was in the medical field. And I had seen through my you know, experience with doctors and hospitals what happens to people you know, with prostate problems. And I really didn't want to go there. So when I went to see my urologist that my doctor recommended, uh, right away he wanted to do a biopsy and he showed me the machine he was going to use to do the probe and I'm sitting there and I'm going, there's no way. <laughs> There is no way this is happening to me. And I thought there has to be an alternative. There's got to be something else. What do they do in China? What do the Indians do? I mean, what does the rest of the world do? I mean, this can't be the only answer. My daughter did a lot of research for me. And one of the first things she came up with was ozone therapy, which I believe is illegal in the United States, the way that it's administered, which is intravenous. So I got on an airplane and I flew to Tijuana, Mexico, to the William Hitt Center and I had ozone therapy done. That brought my PSA down a little bit, but uh, it didn't, and I was there three times. One time I was there for three weeks, and I had ozone therapy done uh, six days out of seven. Most of, the doc most of the patients that were in this clinic were US doctors from California, having ozone therapy done. And I said, if this is so fantastic, so wonderful, why don't, why don't they do this all over the US? Their answer was, it's illegal to cure disease in the US. <laughs> this is what their answer. They said, to treat it, but we really aren't allowed to cure it. And they related a story about a doctor in Texas who, you know, against the law was doing ozone therapy, and the medical people took him to court. He lost his license to practice, but they couldn't convict him because of all the patients that testified in his behalf that he had helped with ozone therapy. Then I went to another clinic, this is before Hippocrates, uh, where I had high dose vitamin C therapy done intravenous, you know, Linus Paulding got a Nobel Prize for, you know, fighting cancer with, you know, with the high dose vitamin C. I was there for three months. During my stay there, my daughter did more research and found out about Hippocrates, so I decided, you know, when I'm done with this, I should go to Hippocrates. Uh, what ozone therapy did, though, was 
turn my veins all over my body into pencils, as hard as rock. You could hit them, they were like little rocks under my veins. So I didn't think that was such a great thing. Um, I ended, they, while I was doing this high dose vitamin C therapy, I became raw and vegan because the doctor that was administering this sat me in her office for three hours. I walked out of there raw and vegan. I decided this is it. I'm not going to die for a piece of meat, which I was, you know, was my main food every single night. I'd barbecue a big, thick steak, and that's what I lived on. Um, later on, after all of this happened, I came to Hippocrates, and this was back in 2006. I was here for three weeks, and I was amazed at the education and about the changes that were happening in my body. I did lose, during a period of about two years, I lost the 60 pounds. My cholesterol went from 240 to, when I checked it recently, was 119. And my blood pressure is like 18-year-old uh, kids. It's, it's just ridiculously <laughs> nice. So One of the things that I forgot to mention was that when I did have this prostate problem, my libido was zero. Uh, I got up five, six times a night to urinate. All these things were happening. And I did go and have a sonogram done. The doctor that did the sonogram said, you've got an enlarged prostate, there's a nodule there, you really need to go and see your urologist and have this biopsy done. I refused. Being a paramedic, I wasn't about to have that invasive procedure done. I went back after all of these things happened to me nine months later and had another sonogram done. And this Now, the first time I was with this doctor, I'm trying to question her about what does this mean, what is this nodule, and she won't even talk to me. I've got an office full of people, you gotta go, go see your doctor. The second time I go, they've got me lying in a bed, she's looking at a computer here, and there's another assistant in a computer here, and she's going, are you sure you got the right file? You better check again. Uh, she just didn't understand why in a nine month period the nodule was gone, this is after being raw, and my prostate had gone back to almost a normal size. It was diminishing in size. At that time, I was not getting up five or six times a night. Everything, I had lost some weight. Everything was starting to function like a normal person. Uh, she wouldn't let me out of her office. She wanted to know what drugs I was on, what medication I was taking, and what was going on. And when I explained to her that the only thing I had done was stop eating animal products and started going, you know, eating raw organic food, I told her about Hippocrates. Uh, she had a brother on the other coast who had prostate cancer, and she wanted him to come here. Whether that happened or not, I don't know. But she wouldn't let me in out. She wouldn't let me out of her office. She was questioning me this time, and she still had a a, a, a room full of people waiting to come in. I, I should have. I should have for the consultation. Anyway, being at Hippocrates for those three weeks, I wanted more information. I just hadn't had enough information. So I took the health educator course a few months later, uh, around no October, November, and I became a health educator here. During that time, uh, I wanted to do more of this. So somehow, some way in my journey, I opened up an organic, raw, vegan restaurant, which has now been operating five and a half years in Plantation, Florida. <laughs> It's called the Green Wave Cafe. It's in Plantation. And at the same time, we've now opened up a school called the Raw Oasis, where we have a detox program. And we also have classes where we teach people how to prepare raw organic food. All this with my help of my daughter. So, you know, my journey's progressed to this point. During my five and a half years in the restaurant, I hear so many amazing stories from people that have gone the same journey, the same path that, you know, that I've taken, that make mine look like, like absolutely you know, nothing compared to the things that I'm hearing that people have. I've heard people that have been told to go to hospice. And they've had two, they've had a colostomy bag, they've had a port. Uh, one guy named Joseph told me that, and his whole family's medical doctors, by the way. He says, eight years ago, this happened to me. I didn't want to die like this. They were telling me my chance of survival was like 10%, and I just didn't want to die like this. So I had them pull everything out, reconnect my, my colon, and I wanted to go home and die. He, went, he found out about eating raw food. He started growing his own vegetables and only eating from his garden. He now owns a farm, a five-acre farm, where he grows organic food. 
This is eight years ago. If you see Joseph today, he looks like Bruce Lee. He's amazing. He's just this vibrant, energetic human being that didn't die. When I, had, I was being on the fire department, I had a friend named John Parker who also got prostate cancer at the same time that I developed it. He went totally medical. He went, here I am, what do you want to do? They put the little implants in him, they gave him radiation, they told him he was cured. Five years later, they told him he now had developed colon cancer. He asked his doctor, did you guys give me this colon cancer? Because it seems to be, they took 11 inches off his colon, by the way. It seems to be where you guys were doing the radiation. The doctor's answer was, it's possible. They didn't say yes, they didn't say no, they decided it was possible. Jonathan came to see me at the restaurant and I explained to him what I had done and he went on a 30 day juice fast. He started eating nothing but raw food. Uh, his cancer markers went down because I told him, don't go back to your doctor, don't go near, I mean, I know there's a lot of doctors here. <laughs> but I, I'm telling him, do not go back to your doctor. He didn't listen to me. He says, I've got to find out where I'm at. He goes back to his doctor and his doctor's in shock because they had given him less than a year to live. He says, your cancer markers are way down. He looked incredible. He looked vibrant. And the doctor wanted to know what he was doing. And he explained to him, and for some reason, this didn't quite register for, with him. He decided to go to Israel with his wife for a one-month vacation. He took this, and I had told him, you got to stay like this for at least two years. You can't just go back to what you were doing. He didn't listen to me. Goes to Israel for a month. He starts eating meat again, desserts, everything. He was happy. He's cured. When he came back, he didn't look the same. He died three months later. His, his cancer just came back and it was it metastasized in his lungs, his colon everywhere. It just didn't, you know, he died. Anyway, uh, to make a long story short, I also benefit from a lot of the stuff that Susan was talking about. Uh, bowel movements, uh, energy, all the stuff that, that wasn't happening before is now happening. And I'm 64 years old, and I feel younger than I did, like Brian said, you know, back in 2006 when I first came here. Everything seems to be working at a, at a much normal, I would say almost perfect rate. Nothing's wrong with me. And it's just a matter of the education that I received here, and it's an ongoing education because you never quite know everything there is to know. There's always something you can learn. But what I have found out is that basically your, your body's a machine and it can heal itself if A, you stop sabotaging it and B, you give it the right nutrients. Sir? I'm impressed with your muscle mass, your stature. Okay. Your One thing I learned here. I get all my protein from the vegetables I eat, the same as gorillas and monkeys. In fact, I tell people I'm on the gorilla diet. Okay? As a health educator here at Hippocrates, I learned that 25% of the healing is diet, 25% is lifestyle, meaning the clothes you wear. Brian's written books on, you know, not wearing nylon and all these other, you know, wearing organic cotton or cotton when you can. And 50% of it is spiritual or mental. It's what, how your mind works and what you feel. My morals changed as I went from a meat diet to a, you know, plant-based diet. You start seeing life different. Your respect for humans and for life also changed. I do work out. That's part of it because exercise is one of the most important keys. I read a study not too long ago in uh, Grain Brain where Dr. Perlmutter talks about all these tests that they've done. I don't agree with everything he says, but one of these tests was people that were exercising and eating bad did better than the people that were eating good and not exercising. So exercise is a, it's important. What do animals do in the wild? They exercise all day long to survive, to eat, they forage, they climb trees. Uh, that's part of the lifestyle. It's not just the food. The food's just 25% like I learned here at Hippocrates. But it, it all works, I'll tell you. You just have to have the right mindset to realize basically we're, we're like gorillas and monkeys. I don't have any clue, but I'll tell you what I do eat. I eat a lot of sea vegetables, a lot of nori, a lot of dulls, um, a lot of spinach, and I try to eat as much sprouts, which I learned here, as I can. 
Sunflower seeds, high lipids, bro. High lipids and complete protein. This is the highest protein diet in the world, absorbable protein. Right? Mm -hmm. It's in the amino acid form, and when you eat a, an animal protein, it takes your body hours to break that down back into the amino acid form so your body can utilize it. It can't use animal protein. That's what I do. I mean, I haven't eaten an animal in almost 11 years. Okay. Angelica came to us, as you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands have, over the last 60 years, uh, dying, told that this is it, there's nothing more that can be done. And she once again had the courage, the wisdom, and the inner strength to say, well, you know, the doctor's wrong, that I have a reason and a purpose to live. So you're going to come up and tell your story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, okay, you know, my name is Angelica. My last name is actually Bueno. I don't know if you know what it means in, in English. It's good. So <laughs> I'm trying to do my best to do, you know, to follow my, my last name. But anyway, um, I was diagnosed with um, thyroid cancer on 2011, and that was by accident, actually, because I, uh, I'm actually I'm an architect. I work for government. I do... Um, I plan cities and states and everything that I do with it. But anyway, um, so in my job, they did have a um, health fair. What it is, they, 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 the insurance gives credit for the, they have like a quota that they have to use in the, in the, in the employment, in the, in the job. So if they don't use it, they give it back to the employer, to the, to the company, the government, and um, they can use it as, as whatever they wanted to use it, but they decided to use it in doing um, a test, you know. And I was right there registering me because we are like 900 employees and you know, only have 50 tests. So I was number one to register me there just to, you know, make sure that I'm okay or whatever, just to, you know to do it because it's a good thing to do. But anyway, so over there they did an NGO and they check the NGO vein and um, uh, for you know any clots or anything circulation problem. And they said, oh, your circulation is fine. You don't have anything, but um, you should see your doctor. And I was wonder, okay. So I started like, okay. So I decided to go and see my doctor. My doctor says, okay, um, I'm going to give you an appointment in two months. <laughs> All right, two months. And what can I do? Okay, I wait my two months. And she saw me and she said, oh, okay, we're going to do a sonogram. Okay. okay, three weeks for a sonogram. Okay. You know? So I was waiting and waiting, and, and that was in October. And, and, and in February, finally, they told me, oh, you need to see an endocrinologist because you have something in there. So I went to the clinic. The endocrinologist did the, the, the another sonogram, and they said, yes, you do have something in there. Finally, they did the biopsy. It came you know, positive. You, you had cancer. All these six months that I was like, okay, I don't have nothing. I'm, you know, waiting and waiting and just take it easy because nobody knows, you know, until you actually know, tell you, you have cancer. So then you're freaking out. You don't know what to do. And you start telling people, uh, I mean, family. And I come from a family, not all, but half of my family are doctors. So they're, oh, you have to take care of that, you know, but you're okay because, um, thyroid cancer is not that bad, you know, it's actually all of the cancers is the best cancer that you can have. Yeah, right. Like, you know, that's the best cancer that I can have. Who can see? It's very easy for other people tell those things because they don't really have it. But when you have it, it's just like affecting you every single way. You know, I mean, I was overweight. I was, I was starting getting miserable because of this n news. And besides all the problems that we all have, you know, I am a single mother. I'm actually, my, my husband passed away. I have to raise two teenagers, it's not easy. So, um, so I was very depressed. I was very lonely. 
I have no family here in the U.S. All my family is in Peru and Germany. So all my family in Germany are doctors. And my sister, actually, she's a, uh, um, married to a doctor, that's why. And she got breast cancer. So um, she treated, they did the chemo and all the stuff. And they were freaking out and they were telling me, you have to do what the doctor tells you to do. <coughs> okay, okay, well, the doctor went to the school for how many years? Oh, you know, I have no idea, probably eight. I, that's what I know, probably more. But anyway, so I have to do what I have to do. When you have the peer pressure for all the people around you, you know, so I decided to do the surgery. And of course, after the surgery, oh, by the way, my cancer was a stage four. And I'm sorry if I don't have any, um, I can't, it's very hard, yeah, any reports, it's very hard to talk. Susan did a very good presentation. But anyway, I'm just telling you with my heart how I feel now and how, how my story goes. So, um, my cancer was a stage four. So, oh, it's stage four. I was like, okay, so I had to do what, I had, what is next. So I did the radiation. Um, the radiation was a pill that I have to take and I have to be in quarantine for like 20 days. And um, my, my kids were knocking on the door, putting the f food on the floor and I opened the door and I had to have the floor because they, I couldn't have any contact with anybody, you know. What is gonna happen? I got so depressed. I was, I was so depressed. I was just like, you know, I had to do, I lost my taste, my, um, I lost my saliva. I, I had to, I, I still don't have it 100% back. You know, it came back, but I still don't have it. I have to drink water to help myself chew. So I was nauseous and vomit and all this stuff. and. But anyway, so I went to see the doctor after the treatment. They did another scan and they said, you are cancer free. And I was, yay, I was cancer free. What? Um, when you have this cancer disease, you try to, you investigate, you go to um, internet, you go, you talk to people. And my process in getting better and and um, survive, so, uh, because I was very depressed, honestly, you know, I was very depressed, so I started getting uh, friends, they were talking to me about meditation, and they knew about uh, Hippocrates. Um, my friend talked, um, took me to one of Brian's uh, conferences, and, um, I was just listening and listening, and I was thinking to myself, why I didn't know this before? Why, why I didn't know? So, um, it was just instantly, in minutes, I was starting getting better, right there in the conference. And when Brian, Brian always finished his conferences with a dance. So, and that's what I like, actually. I love to dance, and that was my best therapy, honestly. And um, so we finished dancing, and I couldn't help it. I had to talk to Brian, and Brian says, you know what the doctor told you is that you are cancer-free, but they didn't tell you that it will come back if you don't change your lifestyle. So I decided to do that. Just little by little, it's very hard, very, very hard. When you have a Latin, I'm Latin, you know, and you have all those, um, you know, foods that we have, with all delicious things that we have, and all the feasts and family reunions that we have, it's very hard. But anyway, um, and I have two kids telling me, well, you have to eat meat because that's your protein because they're building better, or, you know, like bodybuilding or so. Anyway. It's very hard, but um, I decided to do it, and um, I had to go and for a second, you know, every six months they have to check in again. So guess what? Six months after, six months later, or eight months, <clears throat> went to my regular um, checkup. They did another scan, and they told me your cancer is back. So. 
what can I do when my whole family was telling me, you have to remove that, you have to remove that, you have to remove that. And I knew about the lifestyle. I was not 100% in it. Uh, I just knew it. I wasn't committed. So I decided to compromise just and the surgeon. And they were bored like, you're crazy. You have to do it. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. So I had my surgery. The day after I was um, released from the hospital, the next day I was in Hippocrates. The next day I was with my bandage. I was by a scar. I have all my stitches in and I didn't care. And I can barely, like I was like walking like this and everybody was like, you know, everybody was, you know, what's cancer? You don't really see it. Right? You just, I mean, some people were like, that's the problem. And I have to tell you this. And when I told Tom, I have a purpose here because my purpose is now, it's like he said, it's to do an evangelical thing, educate other people. Because I learned here, and I, when I started here, I was really committed that my cancer will not come back because I'm going to change. Thank you. Because I'm going to change my lifestyle. And I still fight it with my old lifestyle, honestly. But I do my wheatgrass. I cannot drink it. I vomit. <laughs> I have to be honest. I do my enemas, you know, my implants. I, I do um, my, um, my, my diet. And uh, I try to follow every single thing, but I also learned something very, very important that actually Raul just mentioned, that 50% is attitude. 50% yep. is attitude. So, definitely I'm not depressed anymore. My attitude completely changed. I'm happy. And actually, Anthony is listening to me there. And um, he's the psychologist here in the uh, institute. And he told me, um, he asked me, Angelica, what's your purpose in this treatment and this program? And I was pausing and I was trying to think, what was my real goal? And he immediately, he was very fast in writing, cure from cancer. And I said, Tom, that's not my goal. My goal is to be happy to be content. So I can tell you I'm very content now and it's not that I'm problem free because I still have my two teenagers that is <laughs> 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 and, uh, and I still have problems. I'm still single. <laughs> Maybe that's your blessing. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> anyway, so I'm very, very happy now. My cancer is not back. And I actually, um, another um, purpose that I have to be in here is that uh, when I was diagnosed, um, and since Humana find out that my cancer was in the thyroid, so I went back to Humana and I said, can you please cover my treatment in Hippocrates? And they said, no. And I fight with her for like an hour. And I asked to speak with the supervisor. And I didn't stop me. I'm a Taurus. And I'm very, very stubborn. And I, there is very little things that can stop me. But OK, I have to stop. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I just want to tell you that if you can tell your insurances, please. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bonnie, love it. Okay, here's a little present for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, too, love. you gotta open this up now. All right, my name is Bonnie Lovett, and I hope I don't bore you with details, but my story is maybe you could embrace life as much as I embrace it today. And what happened was, this is 10 years ago, oh my God, do you know it's 10 years this weekend, Anna Marie and Brian, no, 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 that 
I was with a friend of mine, and he goes, you're going to die. You have two months to live. And a wonderful man named um, Dr. Phillips, who's a nuclear medicine doctor, said, I have something for you. Let me get to the NIH. And when he heard me speak, as a dad, 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 can't talk. He goes, oh boy, okay. Send the MRIs to Bethesda, where I became part of a study. So the NIH is a wonderful place. There's 18 institutes in Bethesda, Maryland. It's the size of the Pentagon, and it's the largest brick building in the world. Well, I just figured, all right, I'm going to go up there because I, I was in so much pain that my head felt like it was going to expand, like someone was going like with a crowbar and opened up my head. But let me take you back a little bit quicker than that. When I was a little girl, this is symptom number one, one of my eyes was smaller than the other. Symptom number two, I was klutzy. So my mother and father put me in ballet to help with my klutziness. Because nobody knows what the symptoms of what brain cancer is. And on my father's dying bed, he said to me, because I had headaches, and when you're younger, you don't want, sometimes children could be very mean, and they can be very nasty. So I had headaches as a little girl. But I wouldn't tell anybody. So I lived my up life and went to ballet after school, but I had headaches that were so bad, I would end up going to the emergency room because I was throwing up, symptom three, all right, and dizziness four. So nobody realized and put it all together. And because I always have a positive attitude, regardless of what happens in life, I've always had that, maintained that positive attitude I was always able to overcome it and just make it as part of my normal life. My vision would be blurred and it's like, you know, when you watch a television show, you would have, I would see the TV like this and like this. I had like double screens, okay? Sometimes it got really strange. I go like, Hmm, okay. <laughs> I didn't smoke anything, you know. I didn't take anything, you know, or drink anything. Okay, that's the next symptom. And I would always have a very distinct smell, distinct smell, so I would be able to smell. And I go, oh, I just have a virgin nose. Okay, another symptom. I also miscarried um, when I was younger because they always thought that it was from the bottom that wasn't functioning. But my tumor, my tumor, my brain cancer, was pressing on my pituitary, which messes up all the estrogen and messes up your hormones, all right? That's another symptom. So as these symptoms are continuing, and I love to dance, and so all of a sudden I'd be like this, I'd be dancing, and then my foot, would be like that. So I was like, I was dragging my foot, I was dragging my leg. Another symptom. But you think, all right, you, you figure because you're moving and you're sleeping and you're tired and you're stressed, you keep on making excuses because it's not like having diabetes or a stroke, okay? Uh -huh. It's not like that. So unless you, got the, unless you read the manual, you don't know what the symptoms are. So I live my life like this, being an overachiever, thinking, OK, I just have to deal with it, like most women do, because we take care of our families, don't we? Yeah. And we always take care of ourselves last. You know, so we don't, that's what we do. That's the manual said, you know, so that's what you do. So as I go farther, my headaches were coming 
more and more every single day I was getting headaches. I'd pop four aspirins every morning, cup of coffee. That was it. With cream, you know, I like hazelnut cream, so that's what I, that's what I had every morning. That was it. And, um, and I would start my day like that. And, oh, I didn't even know I was having seizures because I thought I was, because I was so thin, I thought I was hypo, you know, hypo, was it, hyposemia, okay? Good, so I'm getting audience participation this way. Um, I knew I'd go pull you guys in here. So what would happen is, I see black and white squares. I would see like craziness. I would just have to plop myself down like this. All right, 20 minutes, it'd be over. And it became part of my life. So I figured I'd get these really bad headaches, pull over to the side of the road. Sometimes I'd get them when I was driving on the side of the road. I'd pull them on the side of the road, or I see somebody with herringbone, it would just make my eyes go like this, all right? And I'd pull over, <laughs> honest, to, honest to goodness. And I would just, I remember pop, plopping down one time in Dollar General because it has the black and white squares. And, I, and it became part of it. Well, I never realized because nobody says, oh, Bonnie, you know, you have something growing in your brain. You should go check on it. I just figured because it was stress, overworking like we all have to work to pay our bills every day and sometimes we work more hours and we have families and we have a home to take care of so I just said oh Calgon you know just give me another day or something you know help me never realizing what was going on inside of me and you might say well Bonnie how come you never got an MRI because I'm not a doctor person. I'm not someone who goes, runs to the doctors when I get sniffles or runs when I get a cold. So I pretty much have to be like dying to go to a doctor. Sorry, guys. I apologize for that, all right? They don't go either. OK. So um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you from my heart. So anyhow, even when my dad passed, um, he finally told me when I was 11 years old, because I complained of headaches so badly, they took me to a psychiatrist and they took me to a doctor Why I'm in so much pain. And the tech said, there's something on your daughter's brain and you guys are really going to kill me. The doctor said, don't worry about it. There's nothing there. So this is back in the 60s, so what could possibly happen, all right? So I'm not trying to make an excuse, but in the 60s, they don't have what they have today to diagnose and to share with us. So, and my father said this on his dying bed because he felt so bad he, he had to get it off his heart and chest. Well, anyhow, let me bring the story up so you know what my symptoms are now, all right? We know what's going on. This is how I live my life for, all right, 50 some. Okay, now I'm in my 50s. It was like 49 when this happened. So I ended up going to the NIH, but I didn't tell you what happened the month before that. The month before I was driving and lost my vision on the Florida Turnpike, where my vision became blurred and I ended up pulling over and having then to drive to the hospital. In Palm Beach County and in South Florida, is any neurosurgeons in here? He's in the back. Okay, let me see you, all right. All right, well, anyhow, in South Florida at that time, the, the malpractice insurance was a quarter million to a half a million dollars. And all the top neurosurgeons said, I'm going fishing, I'm going boating. So there weren't a lot of neurosurgeons practicing. Well, I started dragging my foot, not being able to walk, having to be carried everywhere, um, losing my bodily functions, okay, not being able to control. But I do have control now, so I just want to let everybody know that. Okay? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I had two months to live. So when Brian saw me, you know, I was like, I was a mess. I was totally a mess. And what they did was they 
put the magnets on my, on my brain, okay? I remember one of the ladies, she sewed me a magnet, okay, magnet headband. With the magnet, I went to the Oasis Therapy Center where they helped shrink my tumor. I think it was called the dia. Okay, the diathermy, which helps do this. Brian knew that I needed to have the brain surgery because I was too far gone. And this is why I believe that alternative and complementary medicine is a wonderful marriage partner to Western medicine. Because in my case, I needed both. I needed Hippocrates. Thank you. And I, needed, and I needed the men and women doctors to be on my team. So I am the perfect person for that. And I believe some people, oh, it's Western medicine because it's the priest, it's the police officer, and it's the doctor from our parents' generation and grandparents. Other people left wing, okay, it's green, alternative. But my case, I needed both. And when I had the surgery there, because they had to take me, Brian goes, you need to have it and come back. I also have to give my love to the Pacquarese family and to Anna Marie and to Brian because I didn't have the money to come to Hippocrates. They gave me a scholarship. So. Every time that I can share that with somebody, because people go, oh, they don't do scholarships. Yes, I'm a scholarship. I got the scholarship because I was in that bad shape. And they knew my heart. So what happened next was they knew I wasn't going to go. They prepared me with the wheatgrass and soaked me up with the enemas and those wonderful wheatgrass enemas. Really cool, you know, really good. Uh, in fact, I, on my radio show, I talked about enemies, okay, how good they are, how it releases toxins in your body, all right? And I was drinking the greens and getting ready and lifting and having to be carried. So the time I did my surgery up at the National Institutes of Health, um, and Dr. Park did my, neuro, did my surgery. I was one of four he did because he was a research doctor, came from Harvard. And I had a four pound brain tumor. I have six holes that were drilled into my head and 47 staple scars. And I'm gonna show you. Plus, I lost seven pints of blood on the OR table. And my body went into shock. So they had to revive me. So I got a second chance on life. This is the day that I came home from having um, brain surgery. And you can see I have like these little frills around my top of my head and the side of my head. Open your package too. So, you know, when I first looked at this, and I have to say my records are not here because of the government, because the National Institutes of Health the department um, that I was going to, they are reorganizing because the doctor went to, um, he went to downtown medical, Dr. Fine. So I don't have my records, but I figured a picture's worth a thousand words. And I had long hair and I was thin, but. I was really embarrassed by these pictures because I go, I look so ugly. I look so ugly. I go, oh my God. And my body, and they put me on steroids, so I blew up to 60 pounds. And I was and I hated what I looked like. Oh my God. I just I got to walk in other people's shoes. And I thank God for that. But I hated these pictures. I didn't want to keep these pictures. And I don't know how I found this two nights ago, looking for a letter from a doctor to prove that I'm cancer free. I got to stop? Oh, boy. OK. Can I have four more minutes? OK. So this is, and I'll show you guys so you can see. But this is what I became, and I became grateful. So what I've learned is, you know, cancer, and I'm a three-time cancer survivor. So. 
you know, I got it back again. And I did what Brian told me because I got this, I got it back like what, six, eight months later? Okay, two more brain tumors in two different places. And I went total raw again. I mean, I was scared to death that I was going to have the same thing happen to me. I went 100%. I got rid of anything toxic in my life. And I did get rid of my ex-husband, my work, OK? OK? <laughs> anything that caused, that caused stress. I got rid of the abuse in my life, OK, that I know a lot of women could understand and relate to. So what I learned is, you know, I got passionate about living my life. I have great days. I have good days. I have no bad days because bad days are six feet under. You know? So, in fact, the day that I went with Brian, you know, I, I was clear, but this is a cute little story. So after three, year, three months, three and a half months of doing this straight cold turkey, doing raw, the doctors wanted to do radiation on me because they did the big surgery, but they wanted to do radiation. And I just looked at Brian, I go, and I called up Dr. Parks. I go, Dr. Park, I can't do this. I know that it's gone. I know that it's gone. And, and I can't, should I mention the local hot, mo, okay, it's a local JFK in South Florida. There was a radiation oncologist and he goes, Bonnie, if you don't do the radiation, I'm not going to be your doctor anymore. <laughs> All right. So I said, please, one more MRI. I know it's an hour and 10 minutes. It's not the 10 minute radiation mask. I said, please. Because I know in my heart, I said, listen, I'll be a big girl in my high heels. If you see that I have my two tumors, and still my two tumors are there, I will do the radiation. But if they're not, I don't want to do it. Well, guess what? The MRI came clear. So, um, so today, so today, I look at my life. I want to do something. So I got to do radio for three years, AM radio. I had Bonnie's Healthy Kitchen. I wrote recipe books. I ended up going on tour with Brian to the Raw Spirit Festival in Sedona, wear my hippie clothes, and go to Santa Barbara. You know. And um, I went back to school to become an esthetician, so an on I'm an oncology esthetician. I help seniors. I started my own um, organic skincare line, okay? I look at positive ways to do things. I started growing the hydroponic towers where you can grow all your greens and spinach and lettuces and your basil and your cilantro and your celery and tomatoes. Whatever you want to do, I reach for the stars. But the most important thing I learned, it's not, you know, your belief system is not your mind belief system. It's your heart belief system. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I got one more thing to say. And there's, um, there's this thing called forgiveness. And, you know, it's about forgiveness. We have to learn to forgive ourselves. We got to embrace and love ourselves. So you have to forgive the person that you were. You got to forgive the person that you were angry at. You have to forgive what you created together. And you just have to forgive. Because forgiveness, it starts the healing for any kind of dis-ease in your body. Thank you so much. And God bless everybody. Okay, so we've heard a lot about uh, metabolic therapies already. This is a little bit of a different approach. Uh, it is a drug, um, but the principles of the metabolic therapy are the same as uh, what Dr. Seafried has talked about. And um, <clears throat> so what is DCA? Uh, it's, a, it's a chemical. It's a byproduct of water chlorination. It's, so it's found in chlorinated water in minute quantities. Um, the way I explain it to patients who want to know kind of what exactly it is is it's sort of like a combination of salt and vinegar put together, um, chemically bonded together. So you can't actually mix salt and vinegar and get DCA, but the chemical structure is similar to those two things put together. Um, it's easily dissolved in water, um, so it's easy to make oral liquid out of it and to make intravenous formulations out of it. Uh, it penetrates into the brain, so what, what that means to us is that uh, it's a nice uh, therapy for brain tumors, whereas when you have standard 
uh, chemotherapies, there's very few that penetrate into the brain. So this gives us um, uh, another option for treatment of brain tumors. Um, and an interesting point about the drug is it interferes with its own metabolism. And that's very unusual for most drugs. Uh, most drugs, um, you give a fixed dose and you end up with a steady state level right away. Whereas with DCA, the more you give, um, the slower it gets broken down in the body. And so it tends to build up over time. And that's important uh, in terms of the dosing. And that's why people sometimes have problems using it. Okay, so how does it work? Um, <clears throat> so basically, uh, we've heard a lot about the Warburg effect, cancer cells using sugar, um, burning it through fermentation, even without the presence of oxygen. What DCA does is it inhibits the enzyme called PDH kinase, or PDK. And the result of that is it activates an enzyme called PDH, or, uh, and that results in uh, a shift from the fermentation of the glycolysis to glucose burning with oxygen or, or oxidative phosphorylation, glucose oxidation. Um, so that, in effect, um, can shut down the metabolism of cancer cells because they're not able to, to burn glucose through the oxidative phosphorylation mechanism. They, they don't use the mitochondria. They prefer the fermentation. So if you shut that down, they, they can't make energy, can't make ATP, so the cell will die. Um, there are other things that DCA does as well. Uh, it also affects the voltage on the mitochondria membrane, and that's called delta psi m, or mitochondria membrane potential. Um, and by reducing that voltage, that starts the cascade of natural cell suicide. Um, that's called apoptosis. Uh, so DCA also triggers natural cell suicide. So even though it's not a natural medication in itself, it triggers a natural cell death process. And that's only in the cancer cell, not in your good cells, because they're already undergoing apoptosis. That's an ongoing process. Um, there's other mechanisms of how DCA works. We're not really sure yet, but some stuff's been published about uh, potentially being anti-angiogenic, so blocking the growth of blood vessels in tumors. Uh, it may also work by influencing the, um, the pH of the tumor microenvironment, so it may alkalinize the tumor environment as well. There's some research on that, but nothing definitive yet. Um, so that's just the mechanism. You know, you've seen all this already. Um, so the DCA, you can see here, it, interferes right here. It blocks this enzyme, this pyruvate dehydrogenase, which allows PDH to work effectively and takes the pyruvate and brings it into the mitochondria here, and then you can generate the ATP there. So it shuts down the fermentation pathway. So the original research for this was done by Michalakis. He was, he's in Canada, he's in Alberta. Um, they published a paper, which was a rat study, uh, where they looked at non-small cell uh, human uh, lung tumors put into the rats breast cancer cells and glioblastoma. They grew the tumors, and then they treated the rats with the DCA, and they found very rapid tumor shrinkage. Um, and then subsequent to that, that was in 2007 that was published. Um, subsequent to that, uh, DCA has been investigated for a whole variety of human cancers. You can see the long list here. Um, mainly uh, lab studies, so all this refers to either in vitro or a mouse model. Okay, so then we have some in vitro data too, which is interesting. It's not been published. Um, potential synergism with metformin. So again, going back to the metabolic mechanism, metformin can do a few things. It, it acts as an mTOR inhibitor. Um, it also reduces the average blood glucose level. So the same sort of mechanism. If we, it's again, simulating fasting to lower your average blood glucose level. Um, it can synergize with, uh, there's a targeted therapy called uh, Tarceva or Lotinib. Uh, there's also synergism with different chemos, but some of our in vitro work, we've seen antagonism with chemos too. So it's, uh, it should not automatically just be given with a chemo in the hopes of boosting the chemo because it can interfere as well. And what we do normally is we do a, um, a chemo sensitivity or chemo resistance assay if a patient wants to combine the DCA on the same day as the chemo, because then we'll get an idea of whether it's going to uh, synergize and boost the chemo or it might interfere. Um, then what's actually been published in humans with DCA, um, the first study was done um, by the group in Alberta. They did a glioblastoma study. It was supposed to be 50 patients, but it ended up only being five patients once they finally published it. I have my ideas of why that happened. I, I think personally they, they overdosed the patients with the DCA. Um, however, despite that, the five patients that they did publish on, um, two of the patients took DCA alone 
for glioblastoma, no standard treatments, and they had tumor shrinkage. Um, two others took uh, standard treatments, which would be chemotherapy and radiation and maybe surgery. And in addition, they also got DCA and their response seemed to be much better than average. In other words, their, um, they survived longer uh, than what would have been expected. Um, there's a case published of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma treated with DCA, complete remission uh, after the patient failed standard therapy, including chemo. Uh, there's a case published of uh, gallbladder cancer or cholangiocarcinoma, um, and that was DCA combined with an antacid and combined with tamoxifen, which is normally used for breast cancer and would have no activity in gallbladder cancer by itself. Um, we published a case showing some of the um, uh, subtler benefits of DCA. Uh, in this case, the patient had an unknown primary tumor uh, in the muscle of the leg with spread to the liver, and um, the DCA resulted in a very significant pain reduction for this fellow. He was on about 200, 250 milligrams a day of morphine for the severe pain in his leg because of the, the tumor being there. Um, the pain was unresponsive to radiation therapy and we treated him with DCA and over a, a period of a few months, he went down from, from 200 milligrams a day of morphine down to nothing. Um, and we have a case that we've published of metastatic uh, kidney cancer, Oops. Um, renal squamous cell carcinoma, a very unusual kidney cancer. Um, uh, that patient had metastatic disease, they operated on her, they took out what they could, they left some disease behind, we have all the uh, records of that. Um, and the patient got a dose of palliative radiation just for life prolongation or pain control. Um, and we gave DCA after the radiation and all the remaining cancer completely disappeared and that patient is now, I believe, about six years cancer free. Um, <clears throat> so we have a number of other cases which we're working on publishing, but uh, I can just give you an overview. Uh, a lot of patients do respond to this drug. It's not perfect, just like any cancer treatment. But in our experience, about 60% do respond to it, um, and we define just response as either biochemical response or tumor shrinkage, tumor stabilization, or uh, palliation such as pain reduction. Um, occasionally, we do see a complete remission like the kidney cancer case. And in our practice, we're seeing that in, in about 1 in 50 or 1 out of 100, which is, doesn't sound like a lot, but it's surprising considering most of these are stage 4 cancers. Um, some of the cases that we have that uh, we may be able to publish, one is a, a young fellow with a metastatic melanoma, 30-year-old male, and we have CT evidence that proves uh, partial response according to the official oncology criteria, and he's now... Um, I believe the last time I saw him, there was no evidence of the cancer, so we're hoping that he's completely disease-free now, but he's due for a scan. A uh, 50-year-old lady who had glioblastoma. Uh, she had the standard surgery and radiation and uh, temozolomide chemo for a year, but she started DCA in addition uh, in between her chemo doses right from the very beginning, and she's now in complete remission for over two years, and she's no longer on any traditional therapy at the same time, just DCA. Um, a young lady with uh, ovarian cancer stage 4, she got three doses of carboplatin chemotherapy, um, was deemed to be a failure by the oncologist because of her uh, worsening symptoms and rising uh, CA125 tumor marker, and she decided to take DCA as well, and she had a complete remission for two years as a result of the DCA. Uh, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we know it works for that. Uh, T-cell lymphoma, sort of a rare lymphoma. Um, young fellow with uh, brain involvement, had stable disease for two years with the DCA treatment plus natural medicines. Uh, angiosarcoma, we've seen response. Young fellow with uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine, another very rare cancer, uh, had standard aggressive chemo, curative intent, completely failed, um, and we gave him intravenous DCA and we proved um, a stable disease by CT scan. In fact, there was tumor shrinkage, but it was less than 25%, so it didn't meet the criteria for partial response. Um, and a uh, 75-year-old gentleman with small cell, one of the most aggressive lung cancers, uh, recurrent small cell, in fact, after treatment with standard chemotherapy, and he had one more dose of chemo, and then he said, I'm not doing this anymore, and we gave him DCA, and it's, he's now uh, six or seven years cancer-free. So that's a publishable case. And then I've got a whole bunch more here. Malignant fibrous histiocytoma, it's a rare uh, sarcoma. Uh, bladder cancer, very interesting. Uh, older gentleman with multiple 
uh, medical problems, refused to have surgery for recurrent bladder cancer, so we treated him with DCA, and it actually delayed, it, it shrank the cancer enough to delay his surgery by about a year, and then his surgeon again asked him for, uh, to go, and go back and have surgery because it regrew, and then we gave him another course of treatment, and again, he's, um, he's stable and he's okay. Gallbladder cancer, as I said. Um, so there's synergism with uh, natural medicine called Honokyo, which is a magnolia tree extract. And then we've also used it with fermented wheat germ extract. We've seen that these two can work well together. And even um, hormone resistant or um, castration resistant prostate cancer can respond to DCA. So it in fact does have a, a, a diversity of action. It's considered, to, I would consider it to be a broad spectrum anti-cancer treatment. Um, it's very safe overall. Uh, about 40% of patients have no side effects. Uh, and that's based on the dosing that we're using. Um, if the side effects do depend on the dose. Um, but the fortunate thing is all the side effects are reversible. And the most serious is probably neurological. Um, peripheral neuropathy or, and, uh, typically presents as numbness in the fingers and toes, which sometimes you get with chemo as well. Um, about 20% in our practice based on the dosing and the, the treatment schemes that we use and it is completely reversible. Um, sedation and tiredness, fatigue, that kind of thing, about 20% risk as well, and completely reversible once you reduce the dose or stop the drug. Uh, can affect your memory, make you a little confused, and sometimes you get a little shake. Uh, worst case, it could cause some hallucinations. Um, if you give too much of it or you persist with a high dose, it can make people a little agitated sometimes. Um, we've noticed some mood changes as well. Uh, heartburn's not that common, but if if it's a problem, we can give an antacid with it. Um, nausea is not very common. Vomiting is quite rare, but uh, it occasionally can happen. Um, and perhaps related to the mechanism of action, sometimes it works very quickly, and sometimes we see uh, a flare-up of tumor pain at the site of uh, where the patient's having their tumors. Uh, and that, that if it happens early on and then it diminishes, that's a sign of a good response. Um, and sometimes we see some liver enzyme increases, but there's no, no consequence of that as long as we uh, back off with the dose or stop the drug. And then there's some other interesting benefits from the drug, good side effects as I put them. Um, one is it's safe in renal failure, and so that's, that's nice because a lot of other drugs have kidney toxicity and you can't use them. And we've treated patients with uh, creatinine in the 3 to 4 range. Um, there's no toxicity from the DCA. Um, it actually can be beneficial in patients who have uh, heart trouble, if they have angina, uh, ischemic heart disease, or even heart failure, it can, it can improve the function of the heart. Um, in, in theory, if you combine it with drugs that prolong the QT interval, it may even reduce the risk of arrhythmia. There's a lab study on that, uh, and it may even improve glucose control in diabetics. Uh, it's also safe in terms of drug interaction. Based on our experience of about, I would say, over 1,500 patients now using this drug, uh, we don't see a lot of drug interactions. And my feeling on that is probably because it's not metabolized by the same enzyme system in the liver. So that, that could be the reason. Um, we just encourage some caution with other drugs that may have the same type of side effect. So uh, drugs that may also cause neuropathy, um, like chemos or drugs that can cause uh, hallucinations or memory problem. Um, for example, uh, marijuana preparations, we just encourage some caution to start really low and, and build the dose up. Um, we also find with the various natural medications, we can reduce the side effects. So uh, for example, lipoic acid, uh, carnitine, and uh, vitamin B1 or benfotiamine, um, all of these have nerve protecting or nerve healing properties. And so they seem to diminish the side effects of the DCA. Uh, and they can also uh, prevent or delay the side effects. Um, they may even have some uh, synergistic effects in terms of boosting the anti-cancer effect of the DCA. Uh, Dr. McKinney has written about that. Uh, he's a naturopath from uh, British Columbia, and he calls his, his natural protocol with combining with DCA uh, mitochondrial rescue, in which he uses uh, some natural medicines here, like, like the ones I mentioned above, as well, along with coenzyme Q10 and quercetin and others. Um, again, to improve the mitochondrial function in the cancer cells. Um, I've got an oral protocol here. This is what we use. Um, I guess it's more for the physicians around here. Uh, so the DCA, depending on the patient's age and their general condition, this is the kind of dosing we use. So 15 to 25 milligram per kilogram per day. Uh, Michalaka, so in the original study, 
uh, they used, they started with 25 milligram per kilogram and they worked up to 50. Um, so they're using double the dosing that we use. And so that's why I think that the patients in the original study uh, likely dropped out. Because if we were to use that kind of dosing, well, we've tried it, and uh, patients get severe side effects. So they either get, either get the neuropathy very early or they get very sedated and very fatigued and they just can't tolerate it. Um, so with the natural medicines I mentioned, this is the dosing. So if we combine the natural medicines, we do find uh, a delay or uh, a prevention of the, a lot of the DCA side effects. And we do some routine blood work, nothing fancy. The main thing is just to look at the liver enzymes um, and then monitoring the tumor markers to see if they're responding. Um, and we use an antacid if uh, they get some stomach upset. Uh, we also do an IV. I'm not going to go into the IV protocol. But if anybody's interested in that, they can talk to me afterwards. Um, uh, with chemotherapy, as I mentioned, um, it can boost the chemo or it can interfere with the chemo. And we don't really know in advance. We've looked at our data and we don't see a definite pattern with, with specific drugs. So we recommend that uh, either to avoid using the DC8 together on the same day with the chemo to keep them separated or to do a, uh, an assay where you, you do a test in advance to see what drugs, what combinations will work best for that particular patient's cancer. Because every cancer is different and everybody's very individual. And so in our experience, DCA can be effective for any cancer type. Um, certainly I haven't seen any, any type that it does not work for. Uh, it can work on chemo-resistant cancers because the, most of the patients we were getting at the beginning were patients who had failed standard therapy and they had nothing else, so we tried the DCA on them. Um, no life-threatening side effects in our experience, um, as long as you follow the directions that I had mentioned. Uh, it's not immunosuppressive. So that's a big plus. Um, and also in patients who've had a lot of chemo and their bone marrow is burned out, um, it's safe to use because it's not going to drop their cell count. Um, it reduces its own metabolism, so it tends to build up over time, so you just have to be careful with that. The dosing may have to change over time. Um, and uh, so what we do is we do a cyclic therapy where we don't give it continuously. We kind of do it off and on. Uh, neuropathy is the main side effect that limits our dosing. Uh, so we, we think it's essential to try to give natural medicines with it to prevent the neuropathy. And um, we just uh, watch the liver enzymes and we prefer using it in combination with other things. So I was very excited today because of the talks I heard this morning um, of the potential to combine DCA with the ketogenic diet or to combine it with the um, glyoxal or uh, uh, fasting approach. And I think that might in fact be uh, a way to get a much better response out of the DCA and perhaps use lower dosing as well. Um, and as I said, we see some palliative benefits, so in terms of quality of life improvement, and then an occasional complete remission, which I don't understand, but you know what, we'll take it. That's it. <laughs>
um, basically you see um, the blood vessels. And this is in a uh, mouse brain, and this is a wild type mouse. And um, this is what the vascular tree looks like in the brain of a wild type mouse. It kind of looks like the back of a leaf. It's very interesting. But uh, this is an, an Alzheimer's. Um, you see these sticky plaques uh, and they're attaching to blood vessels and they actually leave holes in the blood vessels. So they do damage to the microvasculature of the brain and you can imagine that they're also doing something similar to the neural networks in the brain as well, you know, sticking to those and causing damage and breaking them up. You know, so, um, whoops. <laughs> Uh, so instead of this nice, you know, leafy pattern, you see this disrupted um, vascular tree here. It's very disruptive. Um, so uh, recently, the um, beta amyloid scans have been developed, so uh, the people who are worried about Alzheimer's can perhaps have a scan, or it, it, you know, it's very important in research too, to perhaps document, you know, that someone has an accumulation of beta amyloid plaque. If you're going to call them a person that has Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in these slides, you know, uh, well, the, the yellow are areas where there's a high uptake of um, a high accumulation of beta amyloid, and the red is a moderate accumulation. The people on the left are people that have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's clinically. The people on the right are people that are normal. But you can see, for example, this person here seems to have a lot more beta amyloid plaque than this person here who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and this is someone who is reportedly normal. So, you know, are we on the right track if we're trying to develop drugs to remove beta amyloid plaque? You know, maybe yes, maybe no. Mm -hmm. um, another problem that happens in Alzheimer's is that um, on glucose PET scans, um, there is uh, a problem with glucose uptake in the brain. So the areas in this scan that are yellow and red are areas where there's a lot of glucose taken up in the brain. And this is an Alzheimer's brain, and you can see that there are areas that there's very poor uptake of glucose. And um, the vast majority of researchers would probably tell you that it's because the neurons are dead in those areas, that that's why there's no glucose uptake, because the neurons are dead, they're not able to take up glucose. But another idea has emerged, and it is that diabetes is a type of Alzheimer's of the brain, and even um, been... Uh, the term has been coined that it's a type 3 diabetes. Um, there, uh, this is an area that's been researched um, really since about 1970 and just kind of gathering steam in the last 10 to 15 years. But a group at Brown University, uh, Dr. Suzanne Delamonte, Mark Want and Associates, what they did was they studied the brains of people uh, with Alzheimer's disease who did not have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And what they found was that all of these people had insulin resistance in the brain. Um, they found that the levels of insulin and the factors related to making insulin and using insulin are greatly reduced in Alzheimer's. All of the signaling pathways involved in the use of energy are abnormal. The functioning of mitochondria is abnormal. And so they coined the term type 3 diabetes to relate to Alzheimer's because these people did not have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Um, they further looked at people at various stages of Alzheimer's disease and they found that um, the loss of insulin in neurons with insulin growth factor receptors begins early in the course of the disease and that it worsens with each stage and it becomes very severe and is uh, throughout the brain in the latest stages of the disease. And so um, they have suggested that um, treatments for type 1 or type 2 diabetes might be appropriate for um, Alzheimer's as well. So um, Dr. Hoyer, uh, Siegfried Hoyer, um, um, published in 1970 in a German, German medical journal, uh, the first that I have been able to find a report uh, that there, was, um, there were decreased glucose levels in certain people that had dementia and a lower cerebral metabolic rate in, in some of these people with dementia. And he's continued to study in that field. Um, and by 1991, uh, he brought up an interesting idea of, um, you know, looking at alternative fuels. And what he found was that younger people use um, glucose in a ratio of alternative fuels of 100 to 1. And elderly people without Alzheimer's, this ratio has dropped over time to 29 to 1. Mm -hmm. And in people with Alzheimer's, even in the earlier stages, it's, it's only 2 to 1. So... Um, they're not using glucose effectively and they have to turn to using alternative fuels. 
Uh, so he suggested that some of these fuels might be um, fatty acids and amino acids that are kind of laying around the brain that might be utilized as alternative fuels. But obviously in someone with Alzheimer's, they get progressively worse and worse and worse, so they're not getting enough of whatever alternative fuel it is that they need. So um, here's the idea of alternative fuels, and as we talked about earlier, you know, glucose is usually the primary and preferred fuel for most cells, including the brain. Um, but humans are programmed by evolution to switch over to using ketones during starvation. And ketones can provide as much as two-thirds of the energy requirement of the brain during starvation. And, you know, this occurs, you know, gradually over a period of five to seven days to ten days. The key, uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate levels will rise, and then they will kind of level off, and they will stay elevated as long as you have fat <laughs> to produce ketones from. Um, so um, here's the idea then that perhaps supplying an alternative fuel could bypass the problem of insulin deficiency and insulin resistance that occurs in the Alzheimer's brain. So um, this is a fairly complicated slide, you know, showing that there is insulin resistance and so glucose can't uh, enter the normal pathway to making ATP. Uh, however, beta-hydroxybutyrate um, can cross the blood brain, uh, into, cross the cell membrane and enter the mitochondria, enter the same pathway but further downstream to make ATP. And this is a very simple version of that for uh, the non scientists who are here. <laughs> um, so, some other evidence that ketones might be beneficial to people with Alzheimer's comes from Dr. Stephen Kunain um, at Sherbrooke University in Canada. And he has uh, what he believes is the only ketone PET scanner in the world at present. And he studies Alzheimer's disease and he uh, looks at normal healthy people and he looks at people at various stages of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and he does a glucose PET scan and a ketone PET scan. And what he's found is that um, in people with Alzheimer's that glucose uptake is 17% lower in gray matter overall and 25% lower in the areas affected by Alzheimer's. But Ketone uptake is normal throughout the brain, including the areas affected by Alzheimer's and people with Alzheimer's. You know, so this suggests that the neurons are there, that, that maybe they're not all dead in those areas, and that um, supports the idea of using ketones as an alternative fuel. So this was presented as a hot topic in November of 2013. Um, so one way to achieve uh, as we know, is the ketogenic diet, you know, the high-fat uh, diet, uh, low protein and sufficient, um, I'm sorry, sufficient protein and low carbohydrate, and there have been reported positive effects of the ketogenic diet in Alzheimer's and a number of other diseases. Um, so right around uh, 2000, Dr. Richard Beach, um, who had, uh, he was a student of Hans Krebs, Krebs and um, in the 1990s, he became interested in ketones and studying ketones and uh, to find out what they do. And um, he also began developing a ketone ester towards the end of the 1990s. Um, one of the um, landmark studies that he published that uh, is relevant here, it was published in 2000. And what they did, uh, simply as I can put it, was they uh, had cultures of neurons and they, um, submitted or subjected these cultures to toxic substances, one that produces uh, Alzheimer's disease and one that produces Parkinson's disease. Some of the cultures had beta-hydroxybutyrate, the ketone, uh, at levels that you see during starvation, and some of them the controls did not. And what they found was that there were many more surviving neurons in the cultures that had uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate in the mix. And so um, he suggested that a ketone ester be developed to raise um, ketone levels to those that you would see in starvation and that this could potentially treat people with Alzheimer's and a number of other diseases that share this problem of insulin resistance. So right around that same time, uh, Dr. Sam Henderson had the insight that perhaps raising um, ketone levels to a relatively milder degree by using medium chain triglyceride oil could also bring about cognitive improvement in people with Alzheimer's. Um, uh, medium chain triglycerides, when you ingest them, the liver converts part of it to 
ketones. And the rest is um, released into the circulation as medium chain triglycerides. They're not stored as fat. They're taken up directly by mitochondria um, and skeletal muscle. They actually do cross the blood brain barrier. There's some evidence that astrocytes can directly use medium chain triglycerides and further convert them to ketones and um, acetyl CoA to make ATP. So the medium chains themselves might also be alternative fuels uh, for the brain. Um, but, you know, basically raising uh, levels of uh, ketones to a fraction of what you would see with a ketone ester. And so uh, he went about, uh, he uh, patented this idea uh, using tricaprylic acid, which is um, the eight carbon chain, uh, medium chain triglyceride, um, and sought, I think originally he, he hoped that it would be a drug, but they um, decided to go for the medical food status. And the first study they did was um, they had uh, people come on two different occasions and they served as their own control, the pilot study, and they got 40 grams of medium chain triglyceride oil, which I can tell you will cause diarrhea in almost everybody if you've never had it before. <laughs> um, and then on another occasion, they got placebo. Um, the placebo happened to be in whipping cream, which has some medium chain triglyceride in it. <laughs> um, but what they found was that nine out of the 20 people uh, improved significantly when they got the uh, MCT oil compared to the day that they didn't. And um, there was a genetic uh, differentiation between the people. There's um, apolipoprotein uh, 2, 3, and 4. You get one copy from each parent. And um, they found the people who were 4 plus, which, who are more prone to getting Alzheimer's, did not seem on, as a group to respond to this treatment. Whereas um, the people who did not have the E4 gene or, you know, more likely to respond. Um, they continued, they, you know, they uh, went on to another study and, you know, they had uh, people that continued taking, this time it was a 20 gram dose once a day um, for 40 days and 90 days uh, they were studied and some people continued on for six months and they sound, found the same thing that the people who were E4 negative as a group um, improved on average, whereas the people who were E4 positive did not. And, but roughly half of the people, almost half the people in their study had some improvement. So um, this is my husband, Steve. And um, in 2008, I didn't really know any of this about diabetes of the brain. And I, he was going to screen for the two clinical trials uh, on two days back to back. And uh, you can't be in two clinical trials. You have to pick one. So I thought, well, if he happens to get into, you know, one of these um, studies, I want to know what the risks and benefits. We want to be able to choose which, if he happens to get into both, you know, which one he should get into. And um, Steve was 58 at that time. He started having symptoms when he was 51. He was an accountant. He worked from uh, home for my practice, took care of our children, you know, when they were growing up because I have a bizarre job, you know, where you run out for emergencies at all hours. Um, so, uh, by, but by 2008, he couldn't even turn on a computer, use a calculator, do simple math. Uh, it had progressed that quickly. Um, he had a visual disturbance. He said it was like words on the page were in pixels and moving around, so he couldn't read for about a year and a half at that point. He had a tremors. Um, he was extremely distractible. Uh, he had a problem finding words when he would talk. He would lose himself midway through the sentence. And so when I was looking at the risks and benefits of these two drugs, I just happened upon a press release for AC1202 that we were just talking about. Um, and it said that it improved the memories and cognition in almost half the people that got it. And I thought, but it didn't say what it was or how it worked. So I was fortunate to find their patent application online and read through it, learned a, a great deal about diabetes of the brain and this concept of alternative fuels and... Um, that AC1202 was a medium chain triglyceride. And I was familiar with, it's MCT oil basically, and I was familiar with MCT oil because I'm a neonatologist. Um, back in the late 70s and early 80s when I was training, we used to add MCT oil to the feedings of our premature newborns because it would help them gain weight. They, could, they absorbed it very easily, they tolerated it very well, and they gained weight. And then they started adding MCT to the feedings, uh, uh, to, to the infant formulas. Um, so we kind of stopped using MCT oil because it was already in their formulas. Um, 
But what I didn't know was that it was derived from coconut oil. That I, I didn't know it was over the counter either. You can actually get MCT oil over the counter, but I didn't know that. Um, but I did learn that it was from coconut oil. And um, Steve actually went to the first screening. It was 1 a.m. when I found all this, and the screening was at 9. Oh my gosh, you're <laughs> almost to the two minute mark. And um, he scored, um, you know, 14 the day before he started uh, coconut oil on the MMSC. And, um, he drew the first clock there, and it was very poor. Uh, he was asked to draw a clock, and you see a few little circles. Um, and I calculated how much coconut oil he would need to take to get a 20-gram dose of MCT oil. And it's about coconut oil 60% at medium chain, so it was about 35 grams. And he, um, we gave that the next day before he went. And four hours later, he... His MMSC score came up to 18. He needed 16 to qualify for the study, and he actually got into the study that we were hoping to get him into. Um, but I didn't know if it was a fluke or if it was real, and so uh, we continued it. And what we found was that many, many of his symptoms resolved. Um, his depression lifted. His tremors went away. He was able to finish his sentences. He recognized family members he didn't recognize a year earlier. Um, his gait normalized over several months. His visual disturbance went away after three or four months. His memory improved over about nine to ten months. He would start remembering things that happened two or three weeks earlier. Um, resumed house, you know, yard work, and he started volunteering at the hospital, and he did that for about a year and a half. Um, so uh, Steve, his MMSC score over a little over two months went up from 12 to 20, which is quite a big difference. Um, he did enter a clinical trial, but we uh, learned later that he was on the placebo during the first 12 to 14 months. It was a crossover study. And so he had a lot of testing during that year. And his um, Alzheimer's disease assessment scale score improved by six out of 75 points during that year, uh, whereas people in the placebo dropped by an average of six points. And activities of daily living score improved by 14 out of 78 points. Um, he had an MRI right at the point that he uh, had started taking the coconut oil because he was entering a study. And it had deteriorated very markedly from a normal study in 2004 to moderate to severe atrophy uh, by 2008. But then from 2008 to 2010, on you know, taking a gobs of coconut and MCT oil, he, um, it stabilized. There was no further atrophy. Um, I probably am out of time, <laughs> but um, I uh, basically wrote an article about it because I felt this message needed to be out there and eventually wrote a book, and I've heard back now from um, nearly 400 people, and it's anecdotal. It's not a scientific study, but they report improvements, and about two-thirds of them, or about 60% report some kind of cognitive or memory improvement, but a lot of people report quality of life kinds of improvements, you know, better social interaction, better mood, less depression, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, these are actually some Dr. Degasino, <laughs> just ways of raising ketone levels. I don't know if we need to go into MCT oil, ketone salts, ketone esters, can, uh, especially the ketone esters can raise in 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, ketone levels to the levels that you would see during starvation at um, five to seven days. So a very significant raise. And, and that's regardless of what else you eat in the diet. And these are just, uh, relatively speaking, you see the coconut MCT oil compared to uh, ketone esters. Diabetic keto, keto acidosis is off the charts. This is that a lot of doctors worry that it's dangerous to you know, increase people's ketones, but they're worried about this. And these are off the charts compared to any of these other things that we're doing. And, you know, basically this just, um, when you raise ketones, no matter how you do it, it seems that you lower blood sugar. <laughs> uh, with the ketone esters, ketone salts, um, MCT oil, you lower blood sugar at the same time. You know, we've been able to document that in a number of people. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Uh, Richard Beach. Uh, back to Dr. Beach. <laughs> yeah, he um, is, uh, he's been working on this for many years. He has um, a ketone ester that can raise, you know, very easily beta-hydroxybutyrate levels. Um, he's not getting funding. He's not getting funding to go on with it with clinical trials. 
In fact, right, you know, they're trying, he's, I believe he's about 78 years old, and the NIH is trying to force him to retire <laughs> instead of giving him dollars to study, you know, this ketone ester that could potentially help not just Alzheimer's, but Parkinson's, you know, um, ALS, uh, epilepsy, you know, you think of the people on ketogenic diet and how difficult that can be, you know, children, and uh, you could just raise, immediately raise the beta-hydroxybutyrate level. Um, so um, he uh, couldn't be here <laughs> today. Um, he has, uh, you know, my husband Steve, when he had a deterioration, he did furnish us with ketone ester, and um, Steve did turn around again. You know, it's just one anecdotal report of that, um, and it, it, we've measured his levels repeatedly, you know, you know on it, and, and very, very easily, you know, can get levels up to four, five, or even higher um, millimoles um, using a ketone ester. So this is something that, that desperately needs funding. And these, you know, it's, it's been years, six years since I first met Dr. Veach, and you know, he's still struggling trying to get funding, you know, for this ketone ester that could help so many people. Thank you. Um, so I'm a nutritionist, and I'm also a, one of my major uh, clients is the Charlie Foundation. And the Charlie Foundation was started because a little boy named Charlie had uh, very difficult to treat seizures. He basically lived in his car seat uh, for a year when he was having these um, terrible seizures. And um, he was tried on all the available anti-seizure medications. He failed them. He had a brain surgery, still had seizures. So um, the family found out about the ketogenic diet on their own. And a long story short, they took him to Johns Hopkins. He was started on the diet. And within a few days, his seizures stopped completely. And they thought, how could this be? <laughs> how could this possibly be? And um, so they started the foundation to let others know about it. So it's a 90-year-old diet. It actually has roots um, in Hippocrates, <laughs> OK? 460 BC. Uh, I don't think I have room under my belt. That's why I was holding it. Am I getting feedback? OK. So um, Hippocrates wrote that he used fasting to cure an epileptic. And then we find in Matthew and Mark that um, Jesus heals a possessed boy with fasting and prayer. So somebody actually tried this, and uh, the fasting worked. Um, and not until 1920 did a physician actually try this. Um, and it was Dr. Wilder at the Mayo Clinic who noted that his patients with epilepsy kept saying, you know, when I'm fasting for an MRI or I'm fasting for this procedure, I have far few seizures, or I don't have any seizures, and he thought there's got to be something to this. So he designed the ketogenic diet to simulate fasting, because you can't fast anybody forever, right? And you can fast them for a while, you can't fast them forever. So the ketogenic diet simulates fasting. So it was used quite a bit until World War II. There was an emergence of several new anti-seizure, anti-epileptic drugs. And the diet just fell out of fashion because it's just much easier to take a medicine twice a day than it is to use a drug. And then uh, in the 1990s, the Charlie Foundation came about because of um, the fact that the father of Charlie is a Hollywood movie writer and producer. Um, many of you probably remember the comedy Airplane from the 80s. So this is one of the writers, Jim Abrams and the Zucker brothers wrote that. So Jim is father of Charlie. And uh, he went on Dateline. He was not afraid to talk to the media about this and uh, went on Dateline and then ended up producing a movie called First Do No Harm. And all of you physicians remember that is part of the Hippocratic Oath when you become a physician. Um, but it's a story of, uh, about a little boy, not his son, about another little boy. Because when he went on Dateline, he got bombarded with letters from people all over the world who had a similar story. And this one caught his attention. And uh, so he asked Meryl to uh, play the role of the mom. And at that time, she had never done a made-for-TV movie. And um, he knew her from, uh, I think their kids went to school together. So she, uh, of course, said yes. Um, and this is, even today, this is how a lot of people find out about the diet. Yeah. We hear this all the time in clinic that my, my aunt said she saw this movie about this diet that helped his, her kids' seizures. So it's still, the diet still is not has not been elevated, even though it's been run through um, a class one study, which is a randomized controlled trial 
uh, that was published in 2008. So that sort of was the pistol that catapulted the diet into what I think is sort of the tipping point, which it's going to reach soon because um, my role has changed dramatically since, uh oh, um, since that point in time. And I, I've been working with the diet for 20 years. So when we talk about ketogenics, we're talking about macronutrients. Micronutrients are really super important, but we focus in on the macronutrients for the structure of the diet. Okay, so that's the first thing I teach. And the, and the macronutrients, of course, are protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And you can see some of them here. Uh, I have, why do I have coconuts here? Because we think of coconut as being carb, but the coconut oil, which Dr. Newport talked a lot about, is important in the diet. Uh, olive oil is important. Um, we do use um, dairy fats, particularly for children. When I'm working with adults, I get away from the dairy and focus more on, on oils. Uh, coconut oil um, is high in medium chain triglycerides, which you heard a lot about. Palm fruit oil also is, an, is the second uh, highest MCT oil in the world. So those two are the highest, and there's small amounts of MCTs in other high fat foods. Um, the now brand, uh, now brand uh, MCT oil that you showed earlier actually is a combination of these two oils. It's the only one I've found that lists both of them in, in one oil. But um, we rely heavily on oils and um, uh, nuts are included in the diet, small amount of vegetables, try not to do fruit, if we do it's berries. Um, so what happens when you eat a high fat diet, and I'm talking over 80% for my children on the diet, adults are a little bit different, I usually do a little bit lower, and uh, particularly if they have a lot of stored adipose, they can use that to make ketones, truly. And that's why you probably see people go into ketosis here, because you have them on a low calorie diet, basically, they, I mean, you, lunch was wonderful. Didn't you feel like you ate a lot of food? But it was a lot lower in calories, probably, than your typical lunch meal. And um, so what happens, your body goes looking for some energy, and once it burns through the glycogen that's stored around the liver, then it starts saying, well, where else is energy? It's in my fat cells, and, we, and, and a lot of people have that tucked around everywhere. So I'm sure, I'm sure you have uh, people that go into ketosis here. Um, and so fat breaks down into triglycerides and fatty acids, and then we get ketones, protein into amino acids. You can also get glucose from protein, carbohydrate into glucose, okay? So we are manipulating these fuels. And so during fasting, um, fat cells are broken down, right? Oops, sorry, jump ahead there. Fat cells are broken down, fatty acids, converted to the liver into ketones, and then they can travel through the bloodstream. I also want to point out in a fasting state that the pancreas releases glucagon, and there's a decrease in insulin. And uh, Dr. Yu and I have talked about this sometimes, how um, if we have somebody on caloric-restricted ketogenic diet and they're losing weight, because typically that happens, they're very satiated, but they lose weight. Um, and we wonder if they're cachexic because they also have, if these are patients with cancer, are they cachexic? That's a big worry uh, of healthcare professionals. We don't want people wasting away on this. My father died of uh, widespread cancer when he was 52, and he died of malnutrition. Um, and my mother, who was a very forward-thinking nurse, did not want him to die in the hospital. She wanted him to be at home with the 10 kids. Right? So she held off on any further chemo. And this was, this was hospice care back, this is 80, uh, or I'm sorry, 1979. Um, very forward thinking, and, and I think a lot of people were very upset with her, her colleagues, but she kept him at home. And this man pretty much stopped eating, he was so sick. But he had great quality of life until the, the last breath that he took. He was very lucid and he could talk to us. And I don't think it would have been that way if we'd let him go through the traditional standard of care in the hospital. So people feel quite well in ketosis. Um, and oops. And uh, at, at any rate, we are, if, if we're concerned about cachexia, we can check their insulin level, right? And it'll be increased. It'll be high. If they're cachexic, it'll be low if they're just ketogenic and uh, lean.
Okay, so what happens with glucose? We've heard a lot about this. The ketogenic diet suppresses glucose. We don't get these huge peaks and valleys like people that are eating a regular high carbohydrate diet get peaks and valleys. You've heard of the glycemic index, right? You eat food that has a high glycemic index. And most, when I say that, people are say, well, candy, yes. Well, yes, candy, but white rice and bread and pasta and bagels and pretzels and popcorn. These are things that people snack on instead of candies, but they also have a very high glycemic index. They shoot up your glucose and then it comes down. So there's this up, down, up, down. Whereas here, uh, we have a very stable glucose. So this is on a um, young man who comes into clinic. He may have just eaten and it doesn't matter because his glucose is going to be between 60 and about 80 on his ketogenic diet. So we see low uh, levels. Um, so normal glucose level is considered 80 to 120. So um, I see children who tend to be uh, between 55 and 75. Adults tend to run a little higher than that on the ketogenic diet. And I just think that's the difference in in uh, physiology of metabolism, age uh, related. Uh, this is beta hydroxybutyrate level, and somehow this slide got skewed, but this is the same uh, child, and his beta hydroxybutyrate levels ran between 4.5 and uh, I think this is 7.5. And um, this is a seizure free child, so we were just, we uh, check levels when they come in for clinic every three months and um, we don't need to worry about this kid because he's also very compliant on his diet, but um, uh, these are the biomarkers that we look for. So fat is ketogenic, carbohydrate and protein are anti-ketogenic, and this ketogenic diet is established in what we call a ratio of those two, fat versus protein and carbohydrate, and it's simply an algorithm of math, and of algebra, in a four to one ratio. This is something we use mostly in children, there's four times, excuse me, I'm pressing the wrong buttons here. Uh, whoop, very sensitive. Uh, there would be four times the grams of fat as grams of protein and carbohydrate combined. And if we did the math on this, we would see that a thousand calorie diet would have 100 grams of fat and 25 grams of protein and carbohydrate combined. Okay, and let me, let me stretch this out a little bit further. Here's that same uh, information spread out in a chart here. Four to one ratio for, this is a 1,000 calorie example. 100 grams of fat, 17 grams of protein, eight grams of carbs. So let's say this is a 17 gram, a kilogram child. We, would, we use about a gram of protein per kilogram on this therapy. And then what is left gets allocated to carbohydrate. So we also uh, can flex the ratio around to allow more protein and more carbohydrate and I'll explain why in a minute. So here's a two to one, and here's a one to one. So these are all ketogenic diets. They're just individualized for different reasons. And one reason would be if we had an overweight child that had a lot of adipose tissue to burn off, we wouldn't need to use a four to one. We could use a two to one or a one to one. If we had a child that was from a vegetarian family or an adult, and I'm saying child because this is a thousand calories and adults would be higher. Um, if we had a vegetarian family, I wouldn't force them to use a four to one because it would require um, pure protein sources and, and most protein sources, vegetarian protein sources have some carb in them. So I would use this one to one and then in my fat mix, I would use MCT oil to get uh, stronger ketosis. So an, a one to one diet with a good mix of MCT oil would be as effective in ketone generation as a four to one diet. And that's actually been proven in the uh, controlled study that I mentioned. Modified Atkins, I don't know if you've heard of this. This is a, um, a diet that the Johns Hopkins group came up with saying, yeah, it's great that this works for kids, but how do we get adults to do this diet? We can't get adults to stick with eight grams of carb um, or 16 grams of carb um, with uh, such limited protein. So they actually took the Atkins diet and modulated it to, um, actually it's a little bit lower in carb than modified Atkins, but they raised the fat on it. 
And then another uh, organization in, in Boston, to Tom's neighbor in Boston, um, Mass, is it Mass General? I always say that Mass General in Boston came out with a low glycemic index treatment that is um, selective of carbohydrates only from low glycemic sources, a um, little bit lower in fat, um, kind of flexible in both protein and carbohydrate, and this is also effective for epilepsy. And then the MCT oil diet, which was also designed at the Mayo Clinic, um, quite high in MCTs, and therefore high, it can be higher in carbohydrate. And then I just threw up a regular diet, so those of you that aren't familiar with this know, well, what are we looking at on a regular diet? Look at the difference here. 0.2 to 1 fat, around a third of what we're talking about. Protein, sort of in the ballpark, but here's the big difference. 140 grams of carb. And I'm really disappointed in the government's my plate. I'm saying this on national <laughs> TV for the first time. I'm very disappointed <coughs> as, a, as a healthcare professional that the government has come out with my plate, which is even encouraging more carbohydrate than the pyramid diet and doesn't even mention fat. It, may, it makes it look like we shouldn't eat any fat if you look at the chart. So um, I think the MyPlate diet would be almost 200 grams of carb for this 1,000 calorie diet. So what happens when we put people on the ketogenic diet is they produce ketones. And initially, the ketones are very, very strong because their bodies go into this adaption uh, phase. And, um, a transition phase first and then into an adaption. So no matter what ratio I use, everyone seems to have strong ketones, and then over time that kind of simmers down. So we can modulate their diets to produce stronger ketones um, depending on what results we're going for. Uh, it, I might do something different for somebody that has epilepsy versus somebody that I'm managing with, with cancer. Um, both With cancer, it seems like we're just trying to get to a state of strong ketones. With epilepsy, we're trying to get to whatever state of ketones they have good seizure control in. So that's the main difference. Okay, some of the meals. Um, I tried to select ones I thought would be appropriate for the, the Hippocrates Institute here. This is fish. We tend to use, um, I encourage fish especially, but we can do it uh, vegan, vegetarian, um, I've done gluten-free, casein-free, the combination of those. I wish I would have had a picture of um, tofu uh, made from sprouts. So there's sprouted tofu, which is something fairly new. It's much uh, lower in carbohydrate than regular tofu. And so a great, great uh, high-protein food for the diet. Here's the oil here in this little container. Uh, lots of avocados on the diet. They have a great laxative effect because they're high in magnesium and omega-3s. And you people all know this, so I don't have to go through that. Um, but the amounts of vegetables are very small, uh, you'll see. So um, here's a great peanut um, type of high-fat dressing. This is a... Um, trying to be an Asian type one. These are, um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the, the, the root, daikon root, thank you, um, that we, sh we th put through a, a grater to make it look like noodles. And um, uh, what else do we have here? My colleague did these meals for me. These are, uh, yes, this is, and um, chopped cabbage, red cabbage. <laughs> and some greens and some green onions and avocado, of course, and, um, and soups. We, so I live in Wisconsin, so I encourage soups during the winter. People are always uh, in a better mood when they eat some, a meal that has some warmth to it. So we do a lot of broth soups. Uh, we can do vegetarian. We can do meat bone broth soups. Um, but these are typical meals for adults that we use. We can do blender meals, and a lot of my... Uh, very active adults who are healthy enough to work prefer one or two blender beverage meals a day. They, they don't want to sit down and, and weigh out foods because that's how specific the, the diet can be. Um, I do start off with a weighed diet. I give them a, a recipe or a menu that has gram amounts for each food. So the only change in the buffet here that I would do to somebody that was coming to eat ketogenic is I would have the gram scale um, as the, uh, at, at the stations so that they can weigh out their food. Not all of my patients do that, but most of them realize that that is the best way to get strong ketones and to learn the structure of the diet so that they aren't overdoing protein or, or underdoing fat, which tends to be the problem. So blender shakes, we can use the nut milks, uh, medium chain triglycerides, berries, cocoa, flaxseed, chia seeds. These are really 
um, helpful for fiber and omega-3s, hemp seeds. Um, and then we have to worry about all the sugar that's added to other non-food things, right? We count all this. We can go through everything. What toothpaste are you using? What mouthwash are you using? Anything in the mouth gets absorbed very quickly. Even if they don't swallow, it can be absorbed through the capillaries, and this can play havoc on their ketones. Um, one, uh, this is a story I used to uh, scare families into cleaning up the house. I had a little boy who, um, uh, he needed an increase in calories, um, but didn't know it at the time. The family found that he went in the bathroom one day and he found toothpaste and he sucked the toothpaste out of the container. It just took it down like it was, you know, candy. So um, there are a couple toothpastes that are extremely low in carbohydrate, but most toothpastes are 50 to 60% glycerin. And again, you're not supposed to swallow that, but some of it does get absorbed. So everything, including mouthwash, and then of course anything um, swallowable, chew tabs, syrups, elixirs are very high in carbohydrate. Uh, a teaspoon of children's Tylenol has six grams of carbohydrate. Well, if we're limiting a kid to eight grams of carbohydrate a day, we don't want it to be from their medicine, we want it to be from real food. So we have to sometimes use adult medicines and crush them down for kids. There are contraindications to the diet. So all of you out there that are thinking of trying this, you really need to take a step back and uh, from the standpoint of um, safety. Uh, so these are not common, but they do exist. Beta oxidation defects, it's simply an inability to make energy from fat. A carnitine deficiency. Um, a lot of my patients that are on um, uh, medications that um, interfere with or, or use up carnitine and that includes medications for seizures as well as people with migraines oftentimes are on the same um, anti-seizure medications. Um, a lot of my people uh, with um, uh, brain tumors end up having seizures, right? So they're often put on anti-seizure medications. So I have to watch out for carnitine deficiency and check them. Porphyria is very, these are very rare metabolic disorders, um, generally diagnosed by the time that somebody is uh, through childhood, but um, again, we have to be careful. Same thing here, adverse effects, before I show you what they are, all of them can be prevented or minimized. The long-term adverse effects of the diet are not, not significant. Johns Hopkins has actually looked at this. Um, but um, we do have reports of constipation, acidosis, and elevated lipids. And uh, we can prevent these. So I go at my patients with a prevention attitude, and I, I know that these could be a problem. So I ask, and I, they have to fill out an intake. I ask about heart disease um, and uh, uh, constipation issues. And uh, sometimes these are uh, problems that are already occurring. So we want to make double sure that they are taking steps to prevent these um, with, uh, of course, high fibrous foods and uh, the sprouts. Uh, um, other vegetables, um, we can use buffers for acidosis. Um, the electrolyte water that you provide has a buffer in it, which is very good. Um, and people are most worried about elevated lipids because this is a high fat diet. And it's not a concern if they, as long as they are following the therapy correctly and using the right type of fats, we can amend that pretty easily. And I just have this one or two more slides here. Um, other disorders, a couple of you have already showed these, so I just want to show them again that these have been uh, anecdotally reported, and um, there are a couple studies in process. Uh, there is a study at UCLA on traumatic brain injury in ketogenic diet. It's been shown in mice that if they traumatize the brain and then feed the ketogenic diet through the gut that the, and, and compare this to um, regular formula that is used or no formula, just fasting, the ketogenic diet uh, in, um, mice recover much quicker. So now they have a human study in process and they're um, accepting patients for this. Uh, but these other conditions are, are all being looked at and as I said, many uh, anecdotal reports of improvement. And finally, I just want to bring Charlie in to the picture because he doesn't know that he's famous. He's um, just finished his uh, certification for childhood um, education. He, so he's a preschool teacher, and lives on his own, and um, 
He's taller than his dad. A lot of people worry about growth retardation because um, there is linear growth uh, that is thwarted during the therapy. But the therapy for epilepsy, at least, is only short term. It's one to three years. And that's, again, we use the strictest form of the diet generally for children. We want to get them, hit them really hard, keep them on it until their seizures are at the lowest point. 15 to 20%, depending on whose study you look at, of these kids become seizure-free. Um, the rest have a uh, better than 50% improvement. So um, he was on it actually for five years. And um, like I said, he's 22, he's taller than his dad. He just, he grew fine. And when I'm around him, I notice, and I eat with him a couple times a year when I'm visiting in LA, um, doesn't like sugar, doesn't have any inclination to eat candy. He's big on vegetables and protein. And, um, uh, you know, he's, he's thin. And, and so it hasn't hurt him at all uh, in the long run. He's a very healthy kid, pretty active kid. And I think that's my last slide. Yes. <laughs>
is important in some respects. You don't just give insulin, you give an IPT treatment and, and walk away and not see the patient again. We give it in smaller frequent administrations. Traditional chemo or some chemo regimens might be like every third week. We give it every week. Why? Because if we're giving insulin, we're pushing those cells into a division phase. And that's where most chemo will do its work. When the cells are dividing is where chemo will do most of its work. We want to get those cells into that division phase. So you slow, you give insulin on a weekly basis or sometimes twice a week when people have a large tumor burden. Right? So there's a number of different, just some new terminology. Endocrine function, endocrine is where the, an organ will make a particular chemical. Okay, the pancreas makes insulin, it has a metabolic effect someplace else or throughout the body. Exocrine function is more about digestion. The pancreas will make digestive enzymes. Those get excreted into the, into the GI tract for digestion purposes. Paracrine is communication from one cell to another. So there's messaging going on. This is what we're going to see in cancer. Autocrine is self-messaging. Cancer can self-message itself in the way that it can make insulin to stimulate its own growth and stimulate its own metabolism. So in a cancer cell, we found that the insulin and, and the IGF factors, insulin receptors, are actually working autonomously. They don't work and they're not as being well regulated by the regular mechanisms that, other, that normal cells are being regulated by. So cancer in itself has its own operating system and therefore it's able to grow faster. And this is based on the two mechanisms being autocrine and paracrine, which I just reviewed in terms of meeting these messages and creating more growth for the tumor. And also, as you can understand, that the growth factor allows the tumor to grow. The insulin itself becomes the fuel for the tumor to grow with. So you have two mechanisms working to support cancer growth. Now, the receptors, there's a lot of receptors on normal cells. But what you actually find is that there's much, much higher ratios to this on cancer cells. I'm going to show you a diagram of that in a second. But the physiological part of this here is that we're overriding the insulin growth factor with higher dosages of insulin to open that cell up even more. Right. So here we actually, you would take simply um, breast cancer cells in a petri dish, you have methotrexid in there and you don't really see a lot of uptake. You put insulin in the petri dish and you begin to see almost a thousand fold increase or 10,000 fold in this study of the, ins of the cancer cells pulling in the methotrexid out of the medium. So here you see another effect. There's increased cytotoxicity. You're getting those, those, that chemo, which generally floats around the bloodstream, okay, in vivo, floats around the bloodstream. If you actually target those and open up those cancer cells, they're the hungriest when the blood sugar is lower, and they're going to be the ones taking up the chemo. So you're, you're going to see the effect where we spare a lot of the side effects with that. So you're going to see, so here's a comment by St. Augustine. Miracles do not happen in contradiction to nature, but in contradiction to that which is known to us of nature. Right? Just a little, little insight. So, so explaining how does this actually work. So here we're going to go over the different parts of this. You have exogenous insulin. You're seeing that you've got, and I'll explain, altered cell membrane permeability, increased intracellular dose intensity, increased S phase, which S phase is just prior to mitosis, just prior to division. And you're getting more sensitivity to the tumor, to any type of anti-cancer agent that you're giving. And let's see here. Right. So we know that Chemotherapy is cytotoxic. It kills, it kills cancer cells, but it also tends to kill a lot of other things. So you have, there are some problems, obviously, with chemo in terms of being specific for, for cancer cells. And that's sort of the problem. You've got really not getting an adequate intracellular dose of chemo from the bloodstream into, into the cell. And that's where IPT has its major effect. And there's lack of tissue specificity for these drugs. So this is why we have side effects. What are the cells in our body that are replicating the most are your GI tract, your hair cells, hair follicles, hence why you see those types of side effects with hair loss, GI, nausea. Okay. All the great discoveries are made by those whose feelings run ahead of their thinking. It's probably how I got to this field in the first place. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why did I get here? <laughs> I'll share it later. I'll share my, a little bit why I'm actually doing what I'm doing. Um, okay, so what will be the elements of an ideal solution to getting chemo? One is that there is some sayings in medicine where, and I don't remember who said it, but use poisons in low dosages as your medicines. Okay, so if you ever think about how mercury was used and arsenic actually was used in very low dosages, and you could take it to that extreme almost with homeopathy because that's where some of these, these therapies are, originate from. So ideally, you would be actually able to differentiate a cancer cell from a normal cell. You'd be able to give a lower dose of a particular toxic drug, 
and you'll be able to maintain that cell killing effectiveness in those cells and of course reduce side effects. All right. So here's where IPT, just going to go over these sort of three major effects of what IPT is doing. There's a cellular differentiation effect, membrane effect, and a metabolic effect. The cellular differentiation effect is based on the number of insulin receptors and insulin growth factor receptors, IGF receptors. We're going to see more of those, so that allows chemo to sort of be that smart bomb to get to those cancer cells. So here you see normal cells do not have as many insulin receptors or insulin growth factor receptors. Um, you should actually see malignant cells having six times as much, and then you also see ten times as much with the uh, IGFR. Okay. So that membrane effect is you're increasing that cell membrane permeability. You're allowing those things that are in the bloodstream, once you've deprived the body of those, you're, you're pushing things into the cancer cell because you unlock the doors to the cell. So you get a higher dose intensity. We need lower dosages. Why we get away with 10%? And the side effects are less. You can't never tell somebody when you're giving them chemo, hey, there's no side effects here. What you say is less. I mean, and each person that we see depends upon how soon they get side effects begins to tell me, make me think of other things. Why are we getting side effects? And I've actually seen people do quite well on some types of diets, particularly the ketogenic diet, have, have fewer side effects. So when you metabolically build people up and then give them this treatment, they do much better. So here we do reduce side effects, shorten treatment of the cycle intervals. Right? Here's another thing I, I, I learned too, is the, is the insulin has an effect on one of the um, delta-9 desaturase enzymes, which is part of the fat metabolism process, and you actually get more um, membrane fluidity and permeability. So I think that's actually an added benefit that we're not even aware of. Drug, so another mechanism is drug absorption, or drug adsorption. So actually we're, we're saying, hey, is the, uh, the are uh, the drugs binding with glucose molecules going into the cells? Are uh, the drugs binding with insulin as they go? My analogy for patients is really just saying, hey, I think we're opening the doors to the cell to allow these things in. Right. So here we make a little more of that diagram focusing more on just what we talked about, the, the altered cell membrane permeability and the increased in intracellular dose intensity. The next part here is the metabolic effect. These cells are now being lined up, okay? These cells, as we're trying to get them to receive chemo in small dosages, we're trying to get them to that point where they're more chemo receptive. I do a lot of nutrition with this, even in the IVs, before and after treatment to sort of set this up, but also knowing the insulin in itself is the strongest one that is setting up these cancer cells to receive the chemo, right? So you get a greater kill cycle. You get a greater percentage of kill with each round of, of, of the chemo that we give. So the drugs are more effective in cycling. They've also used things like estrogen to cycle the drugs, cycle breast cancers, and see whether they can become more receptive to chemo. And that's been shown to be helpful as well. So here it is. So you actually double. So if you look at the 66% to 37%, we've doubled the, S, the cells in S phase. We've made them more prepared for chemo by way of insulin. And we've also used higher dosages, super physiological dosages of insulin to override those insulin growth factor receptors to get the chemo in there. Okay. So hence the low-dose chemo. We've shown here S phase, increased sensitivity to the anti-cancer anti cells. Okay. So is this a better way to go? You know, I'm not allowed to make that claim, but it certainly seems like from the patients we've treated that we're seeing less side effects. We're seeing better quality of life. Okay. We're having a hard time as an organization to get approval through NIH and through other organizations to actually do studies. We have one um, study that we are doing working on right now, which is really a quality of life study. We're trying, we've actually have an independent investor wants to actually sponsor and fund a study to look at the use, uh, look at treatment with breast cancer. And I think that's kind of where we're gonna get the, the best advocacy. If you notice the people are out here, you got women wearing pink, you got women going out doing 5K walks for breast cancer, but do you see that for prostate cancer, right? So really, I'm almost saying we should look to the women in our society who are movers and shakers that are really going to bring some of this about because it's the men that are not really doing it, at least not with regards to these types of cancer. That was actually where we were going to start on a prostate cancer thing, and I said, guys, wait. <laughs> I said, the women are really doing much more with uh, supporting breast cancer and breast cancer awareness. Right. So... Based on these protocols, we're using IPT as a bioresponse modifier, and we're using it to create that selectivity. I think we're pretty much done with. So I can get into history, but I think what I wanted to do was explain to you a little bit more how that process of IPT actually works. Is this going to be okay to move that over to here, the board? Okay.
This, I have one of these in my office, and every person gets a lecture. All my patients come in, they're like, man, by the time I'm done, I don't know what he said, but I, he said a lot. He sounded good. All right, so what we're thinking about here is we've got patients coming in and pretty much tell them, this is no light too much, huh? So I'm pretty much telling them we're going to start with an IV. Right? So there, we check a blood sugar. We, we have to have an IV. Most of our patients, because they come back frequently, their veins are kind of getting destroyed over time. So we just have, we get a Mediport and just start with that. It's a lot easier. We can leave the access in for several days. We start off with a calculated dose of insulin. So you don't just give you know, a random amount. We give a certain calculated out dose based on their weight. And the intent is to start off with their blood sugar, preferably between 70 and 100. And then with the insulin, we're going to bring that sugar down between 30s, 40s, roughly. Okay? Now, most people are going to say, oh, my God, that's, that's dangerous. I'm going to seize. I'm going to you know, go unconscious. Most patients are having a conversation with you. Now, they don't remember it, but they're asking you questions. Oh, Doc, I'm, I'm so glad you're here today. I've got to ask you something. I'm like, wait, hey, you know, your blood sugar is 35. I think we should wait a little bit. So they're awake. They're cognizant. I think in the, I've done this for nine years. I can't remember how many treatments we've given. But I can tell you, I think maybe twice in the last nine years have I actually had to give somebody a little extra glucose because we got them a little bit too low. And you can tell they get low. They just get really tired and, and you know, they just sort of their eyes roll in the back of the head and you're like, okay, that's too low. Let's give them the glucose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definite obvious sign, right? All right. So giving it, the, and that is actually a very safe, we were just talking with Dr. Cabish earlier and he sometimes has patients in the 20s. They're still talking, they're still awake, they're still alert. So this here actually is what we define as the therapeutic moment. And, and why that's crucial is because when this first started studying this, nobody knew what the blood sugar really was because they didn't have glucometers back then. So they just knew the patient had a reaction, and that reaction was the release of adrenaline. Right? Your, your, your brain says, hey, look, you know what? It's low enough. Thank you very much. And it's going to kick out an adrenaline reaction so the patients get hot, they get a little sweaty, the heart rate goes a little bit fast. And that to me and, and to, the, to the nurses that are trained in my office is that's the therapeutic moment and I usually get pulled out of the office and we administer the medications. This particular therapeutic moment is where, this is where the cells are the most receptive. And this is where we're introducing chemo. Right? So we're giving 10% of standard chemo dosages. Right? Simply, for example, if you're going to get cisplatinum, that could be 150 milligrams, I would get 15. And to other oncologists, that sometimes just sounds homeopathic to them. But when you do that, we also found there's some synergism in chemo combinations. We know that taxol, taxanes, and platinums have some synergy. There's a study on um, uterine cancer using an um, anti-metabolite followed by a taxane followed by a platinum. We do know that, so that's how we give it. So if we can look for those combinations that are gonna, patients are going to be sensitive to. And even patients who have failed conventional chemo, you can still use the same drugs in an IPT format and still get an effect. So here we leave the patient here for probably, I don't think more than a minute or two as we're administrating these things. They get other things administered. I'm, I'm sort of leaning a little bit towards more natural things or DCA and um, we give psyllium air and I actually give cesium up to um, a gram of cesium. You just have to monitor the potassium levels, which we do. Cesium is a very good intracellular alkalinizer. So let's alkalinize the cancer cells. And that's what, by way of, so one of the adjuncts that we do. So this, then here, now that they're here, they get this treatment. Now they're given something to drink, okay? I usually give them, I don't want anybody to cringe in this room, but we do give them a little sugar. Oh! <laughs> yeah. <so. laughs> Can't do that. But you got to get their blood sugar back up again. So sometimes, and, and this is really happening, in the very beginning we're doing this, Patients would come in with their lattes and they wanted to get anything that they could eat that they loved sugar-wise and start pounding this while they were, blood sugars were in their 30s and 40s. And we're like, hey, hey, stop this. So we get a very small calculated dose of green tea, okay? Because green tea has a, has a little bit of caffeine which has a benefit of keeping the cancer, keeping the chemo in the cancer cell longer. The theanine does the same thing in the green tea and the EC, EGCG has an effect as well. So I give them a small amount of green tea with about maybe five to 10 max grams of sugar to bring that blood sugar back up, right? So bringing that blood sugar up to about 100. And we also will give, administer at least maybe five grams of dextrose in the IV as well. By this point in time, they're ravishingly hungry, right? So they're, they're trained to bring healthier food options versus the previous lattes and whatever else they were bringing. So they're actually brought, trained to bring a good, you know, somewhat carbohydrate-based meal with some protein to balance it and fats and sort of a more balanced meal. 
So that's the process, okay? It takes about 30 to 40 minutes to really go through this whole process of doing it treatment-wise, but the effect of that is what you begin to see. So you'll see patients will tell you quickly, you know, the tumors are not as swollen or the tumors are, are having less pain. I mean, there are other things that the patients will tell you that you know something's happening. We'll monitor the tumor markers, which tend to go up first with treatment and then tend to come down over several weeks. There's a lot of adjuncts, and I spend a lot of time, and I've lectured to the IPT group on a lot of different adjuncts that we can do. So we add high-dose vitamin C. Some of us are doing hydrogen peroxide or other oxidative therapies. Some do poly-MVA. I mean, there's a whole mixture of things that you can do. So hence, we get into looking at chemosensitivity tests, finding out, hey, does it make more sense to use DCA or poly-MVA? Does it make more sense to use high-dose vitamin C or testinate? What other, other types of natural things we can use, along with the types of chemo combinations that we can use? That pretty much covers what we do. The okay. So the RGCC, the, R, the the most prevalent test being used in our group right now is called the RGCC. It's a regional Greek um, cancer center, and they, they give us um, chemosensitivity testing, nutritional sensitivity testing, and some genetic information of the cancer cells based on the circulating tumor cells. So they take the circulating tumor cells, they expand those cells and they create them in, in live petri dishes. And then based on that, they'll tell us which chemos you can actually, the, the cancer cells are gonna to respond to and they watch those cultures for six days. And you can ask them, please put insulin in the, each one of those petri dishes to see if there's an added effect to any of those particular chemos. Yes, uh, uh, Stephanie. Okay, this um, is an interesting approach, but um, my concern is that insulin will drive glycolysis. This is indeed showed this in numerous papers. If you elevate glycolysis, you stimulate the P-glycoprotein, the pump. Mm -hmm. so you may PGB. in fact get more chemo into the cell, but it'll be pumped out just as fast. And I, I you know, as far as uh, getting a delivery of a, of a toxic drug better into a cell um, and sparing the normal cells, it, you know, I, I appreciate the lowering of the glucose. I think that's very important. In fact, if you push ketones in there, you can get them way down, even lower than, than 30s to 40s, and down to 20s and teens, without any cognitive uh, difficulties, as long as the brain is shifted to ketones. Mm -hmm. But my concern is, is that you are stimulating the metabolic apparatus of the tumor cells. And uh, not all the tumor cells will be divided. You have a lot of very slow dividers where this technique this especially those that are the most invasive. You're going to kill a, the, you're going to kill a lot of the, 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 the rapidly growing ones, but you could potentially select for the worst ones. And, and that's just the concern that I would have. Uh, it's just something for you to consider. You, may, you might want to encapsulate that as you finish now and just sort of explain because people couldn't. Okay, so Dr. Zyphi was asking a question about whether we're potentially um, differentiating out more aggressive cancer cells and increasing glycolysis, so stimulating glycolysis in, uh, in cancer cells. I think they're great questions. I don't know that I have the answers to those. What I can tell you from clinical experience is that we, you know, we do see tumors regression. We do see improvement of PET-CT scans. Um, we do have plenty of patients in remission. And, and also what we do notice is we have to taper these treatments over time as we do this. And the other issue was brought up earlier was, was addressing cancer stem cells. And there's a whole other thing that we're doing to address those. So I think, well, of interest, the results, it's hard to really tell you results because what, what happens is because this is a cash-based situation and patients are paying for these and they're not necessarily getting a reimbursement. All right, almost, I would say about 95% of our patients that come in get some response. There's occasionally I'll see one or two patients that won't respond. Those that actually complete the course and they go through everything are going to have I can't tell you what the remission rates are because we just haven't really tabulated the data. We don't, you know, we I've moved around from practices and patients, we've had patients come in, we've known that we have had stage fours with poor quality of life, that we've added some quality of life to, but they've passed away. We have those that come in at stage one or two and say, look, you know, I, don't want to get, I don't even want to get surgery. Can we help them with that? So it's really, really hard. Would you not assume that the mortality rate and the speed of mortality would slow down because of the amount of nuclear medicine? Could you at least... Wait, 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 say that again. The, the question is about nuclear. Would people die as rapidly taking less chemo than more chemo? People die as rapidly taking less chemo 
as no. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I could make the assertion that there is some evidence to support the, the, of your argument of saying that, hey, higher dosages of chemo are, 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 are more toxic, yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, there is a look. Let me, let me just one other question about PGP. I, I've done a lot of research on this. A lot of the nutrition that I actually do in my pre-IV chemo is to address this M, the, the MDR PG process. And there are ways of blocking PGP. And there is, and I can't remember, quercetin, resveratrol. There's, um, I use niacinamide. I use a bunch of different things. Even verapamil can be used in low dosages to block PGP. So there are ways around this particular mechanism. You had a question first. Sorry, I'll get you soon. You mentioned about calling of the Pardon? About, okay, so, so poly NBA is, is, is put together by, um, God, I don't remember the name of the company. Uh, Garnett. Garnett, okay. So the poly NBA is, is really, really helpful. Palladium I found, lipoic acid. Yeah, it's a palladium lipoic acid. It has, it has a number of um, minerals, vitamins, as rubidium, uh, palladium. The use of that I find really helpful in terms of patients that are really, really sick and a lot of pain. I find that for some reason there's an improvement in pain and we give it an intravenously. We start with 20, milligram, 20 ml diluted out in a, in a large IV bag, the 30 to 40, 40 being the max, and then supporting them with oral poly-MBA. It does have an effect on turning on um, some Krebs cycle function and also the electron transport chain. I think it works on complex one, if I don't recall. And Dr. Antonovich knows that. Uh, we wanted to mention, not only in the room, but uh, around the world, that uh, this is actually food is medicine uh, in sodium, but at the same point, we've gathered together with doctor days. And here at Hippocrates, three times a year, we invite doctors gratis from around the world to see the kind of work you're viewing now. Here happening at Hippocrates, as well as you know, in many institutions and uh, universities worldwide. So what we want to do is invite you, if you're out there, as a physician, uh, to give us a call here at Hippocrates, and I'm going to have uh, Caroline actually give you the way to contact. You would get a hold of us by info dot c one at gmail. So Say that's again? info i n f o dot c one c e a o n e at gmail dot com. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to share my story, to share my story with you. Um, I was diagnosed with colon cancer about three years ago. Um, I had, um, I thought that I had a good diet, a healthy diet. I was exercising and um, I don't think anybody is ready to hear words, you have cancer. I mean, it was a devastating, you know, devastating prognosis. And, it was a total shock to, to, to me. So uh, I went to um, radiation, um, uh, surgery, and then chemo for about six months. Um, after chemotherapy, um, I felt that a nuclear bomb actually exploded on my body. I was, uh, had very little energy, and I felt very sick. So then during an examination, after the chemo, my oncologist, who I love very much, told me that she identified some dark, suspicious spots on my lungs. And she asked me to come back in three months for a checkup. So at that time, at that point, I uh, came to Hippocrates. They were my brother's recommendation. And um, I stayed here for three weeks went to the program, to the regular program. And um, after Hippocrates, I came back and saw my oncologist, who was amazed that I was free of cancerous cells and there were no more dark spots on my lungs. So she had asked me, what did I do? I mean, what did I do different? What was the difference? And I told her, uh, I responded that the difference, the only difference that I, that was made is that I've changed my diet. And I um, adapted a, a raw food diet. And she told me, smiling, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, it seems to be working. 
She's in Boston. Where She's in Boston, yeah. So that was the response. So to me, that was enough evidence that the program that I went through for three weeks is working. And uh, I was very grateful. Um, thanks to my wife, uh, our home became a little Hippocrates. We, we, you know, we, we pretty much we follow all the Hippocrates recommendations um, at, uh, at home. Um, I, I want to say that uh, during my most recent visit to my primary care doctor, I think it was the end of April, uh, my doctor actually asked me, um, what supplements do I take? So I've told him the supplements, and he actually suggested that I continue taking the supplements. To me, that was very gratifying. I thought that was um, the, the Hippocrates recommendations are actually being incorporated into conventional medicine. And I felt, I felt very gratified. So I thought that was, that was great. So um, in conclusion, um, I'd like to say that I, am, I want to express my deep gratitude to Hippocrates stuff. So in conclusion, I say, thank you, Vigras. <laughs>
the doctors were like all the time, this is a miracle. And at that moment, when the healing and all that, I started asking God, please teach me and help me to have a healthy lifestyle. Because I thought I was healthy. You know, I exercised a lot. I was very careful with the food and all that, but I realized that no. And God not only teach me uh, how to do it, but he also like gave me a new perspective about disease and life. And now when I lecture, I just came back from Mexico, like the doctor told you, I, my main, at least now, my main goal is to bring this to the Spanish community. And we are traveling together, but I'm traveling also by myself. I call one of my lectures, Cancer, a new perspective, because for me, it changed my life completely and gave me a new passion, a new passion to find out the real cause of disease and to fight against that. No? As doctors, uh, you guys maybe agree with me that we are like how to, to heal, but like, like to cover holes, you know, but we never got to find the cows. And uh, I changed the way that I was eating completely. I started studying integrative nutrition, cancer and nutrition, and I moved to Florida. And I started coming here to find, to get some supplements. I did the health educator program. It was an amazing experience. Um, one of the greatest experiences of my life doing that. And after that, I started working here with the main um, reason, my main goal to bring this to the Spanish community. And I am very thankful. And I really, this place is, is amazing. doctors and scientists and other health professionals that came here to Hippocrates definitely appreciate you guys coming out and I uh, wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and some of my testimony if you would and uh, originally I'm from Philadelphia the uh, city of brotherly love and there it's very well known for certain foods and they would be the cheese steak, <laughs> the hoagie sandwich, <laughs> salt pretzels and Breyer's ice cream. <laughs> So back then, I was really covering all the food groups. I had, this, I had the sugar, I had the salt, and the fat. So I was doing pretty good. I was living that American lifestyle, if you would, and that standard American diet. And as I was going through, back then, I was quite athletic, and I was playing lots of sports, and even went to the collegiate level of uh, playing basketball. And as an athlete, you know, I had kind of that air of invincibility, and I felt, you know, I can pretty much do anything and my health I'm not worried about that I can eat whatever I want do whatever I want I'm never gonna have any problems and so at that point you know I was working in uh, physical therapy at that point as an assistant because I really liked helping people I liked seeing that healing process and I wasn't really making any money though and so uh, at that point my sister was into the computer field and she kept telling me get in the computers you know get in the computers and I said Okay, so I went back to school, went up to Boston, went through some computer training and started working in that field. And once I was working in that, I was making a lot more money, but it was something I wasn't really passionate about. And with that, continued my lifestyle and my diet at that point. And then I started to notice certain symptoms, and I started to become more fatigued than I used to be. And as I continued on, and like a guy back then, I was just, I'd, I'd shrug it off. That's nothing, you know, I'll just keep doing what I want to do. And then I started to get some shortness of breath at times as well. And I said, well, you know, why don't I go get a general checkup from my doctor? So I went to my primary care physician and he said, well, you know, the blood work shows you're anemic, takes an iron tablet, you're on your way. I said, okay, I'll do that. And so I started doing this and 
during that time after that, I started to have these night sweats where, I mean, I could literally be swimming in my bed. I was sweating so much. So I knew some things were not right, but again, I kind of shook it off. But man, maybe I have a little virus or something, and I'm just working through that. And it wasn't until I started to get pain, I started to get pain around my uh, chest region. Um, I was uh, keeping me up at night, the pain. So at that point, I said, well, we have to go to the hospital. And at that point, my family had a bit of a cardiac history. So that's what I thought it was. But in the back of my mind, I felt not really because I was always an athlete and I felt cardiovascularly, I'd be, that'd be one of my stronger points. And they started to do uh, lots and lots of cardiovascular testing at the hospital. Pretty much any cardiovascular test you can think of, they probably ran. And I was passing all of them, no problem at all. But then they took an x-ray of my chest, and they saw a mass at that point. So at that point, they thought there was other things going on, and we started to do lots of scans, PET scans, CAT scans, gallium scans. You name the scan, I've done that. And so lots of scans, uh, and then at that point, they said, well, you know, it's looking like it might be a cancer, so we're going to have to do a biopsy to really be sure. So after they did the, uh, the biopsy at that point, they confirmed that it was a cancer, it was a lymphoma uh, Hodgkin's. And at that point, as they started to do staging, it was actually, they found out it was stage four, so to the bone at that point. So uh, I knew, you know, at that point I was in bad shape, but back then, like I said, I didn't really know much about nutrition. I didn't know about integrative medicine. And at that point, really, I felt, you know, I didn't really have many options, although I did want to do something more integrative. I didn't know about anything back then. So I did do some chemotherapy at that point. Did about six months worth. And after that experience, it landed me back in the hospital with a highly compromised immune system. I was neutropenic, getting sick with all types of viruses, had electrolyte imbalances. And back then, I was quite heavy as well. I was about 50 pounds heavier. And my memory was shot from the chemotherapy as well. And at that point, statistically, I learned I had less than 40% chance of living five years. So I knew I had to start making some major changes in my life. And at that point, I started reading everything I could get my hands on about cancer and nutrition and started scouring the internet, started meeting with registered dietitians and other integrative and naturopathic doctors. And during that time, I started to do lots of seminars on health and wellness. I came here as a guest myself to learn how to really do the program in full. And then I also did our health educator program, which is a nine-week course that gets a bit more in depth with the lifestyle, the foods, and other types of integrative therapies. And as I continued on, you know, I've, uh, I've done more and more testing, but I haven't had any issues with cancer for over 14 years. So this lifestyle... The lifestyle has helped me tremendously, and basically I believe if I hadn't changed my lifestyle, I probably would not be talking in front of you here today. So it's helped me a lot, and with that, you know, with, we talk about the lifestyle. You know, if there's other people out there that are going through cancer or other health challenges, to me, you know, of course it's much more than just the foods, but also maintaining a positive attitude as best that you can through that process. Also aerobic exercise, very important in the detoxification process. And then certain nutraceuticals, IV and or oral. And these things, uh, in my belief, kind of have a synergi synergistic effect and help speed up that healing process. And that's what I've seen here working at Hippocrates now for over uh, four years. So it's been a very rewarding place to work because I get to work with people from all over the world with different types of health challenges and see them do very well. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Freeman, a lot of people know in this room. Uh, I was a junior resident in surgery. We did the extra fee re reconstruction. He was the head of that section with Bob Jeffs. I did a lot of surgery. I had called him up a lot in the evening. We had to work together very closely. I admired him, but I had no idea that he was actually interested in epilepsy. For him, for me, it was about surgery. 
And we found out about 10 years later that spinal bifida was related to vitamin B12 deficiency. And we see less and less of this. This is heroic surgery. We would do three stages of surgery. Number one, number two, number three. And these patients would be in the hospital sometimes at a one month interval stay. Okay. So what happened was I visited John Freeman in 2013. He was retired. He was not happy about retirement. And I asked him what happened to his protocol that he designed in 2008. And um, is this the pointer? Yeah. 2008, he did a feasibility study for ketogenic diet for brain glioblastoma. It was totally approved, IRB. And by 2013, he had not gotten dismal consults. What that told me was that it isn't about publishing more truth. It's about firing power. I take care of a lot of people in Washington, and my favorite are the lobbyists. They look at me and they say, George, you scientists, you doctors don't know anything. You have to have much more than firing power than the, what you have. Truth does not always prevail. So this is a consortium that we wanted to put together because I realized that we have to have the help of everybody. And the biggest firing power is the mandate of the public. We want that to come. This is the paradigm shift that has to occur. And you can see here that we're the basic scientists are way down here. We want to get the vets involved, the doctors involved, clinical doctors. Then we want more publications. But this level is not enough. What we need is journalists who are brave enough. Tom Seafried will tell you very much about an article that he was supposed to publish in the Boston Globe and the day before publication was canceled. Okay? This is the mecca of medicine. This is where I trained. I dreamed of training in Boston. And I did. And not a word. Um, we need corporate industry support because they have firing power. They have money and they have a lot of influence. And needless to say, the celebrities are there. The politicians will go wherever they're going to get the votes. The lobbyists are very important because they know how to squeeze the system. And most of all, we got to get the young people involved using the social media to what they call go viral. And we need to do that or else you don't have what Malcolm Gladwell talks about is the tipping point and making it stick. You got to do this or else it's just more and more papers. This is the concept that I try to use simply but it means basically the energy of cancer cells. To make it really simple, because I have to reach so many people from laymen to, guess what, medical doctors. I gave a talk to 700 doctors. There were two people who understood it before. <laughs> okay, And some of them don't even get PET scans. These are oncological surgeons and oncologists. So basically, if we could look at an H&E, you know, I go to every, every case I've done as a surgeon. I've gone to the lab to look at the pathologist. The pathologist would go over every case with me. And I would look at all this nucleus that looked terrible, but I could never see these guys because it was Electron microscopy cost too much money. If we could have seen this, we would have probably dealt with this issue of mitochondria dysfunction a long time ago. But by what you can't see, you're not going to do anything about. And it will never come about. So what I have a bias, I work with Peterson and Dr. Cole, and I'm sorry that they couldn't be here. Dr. Peterson sends his best. He's one of the greatest pioneers in this, in this field when it was out of fashion until they discovered 3 bromopyruvate <laughs> He feels very strongly that, as discussed before, the normal cell has function. And it's 90% oxidative phosphorylation, whereas the cancer cell, without much function except reproduction, just like the yeast, has 
a 60% or more glycolysis and they have designed something to mutate to get 40% oxidative phosphorylation. If you remember this slide, I'm happy. So what happens in caloric restriction, and this slide I got from uh, the Roy Wolford publication, is that from 0 to 90, I'm sorry, you can't see it, disease usually starts occurring around age 30 on. When you do caloric restriction, it just pushes it all the way back to around age 90, and you just drop dead. Perfect. <laughs> OK. So how did this start? I was asked to do an audit as a surgeon. And they said, well, you, can only, you only have to spend two hours in Massachusetts. You could go to Tanglewood and listen to Sergio Ozawa's music. So I bought two tickets to the concert at Tanglewood. And I said, I'll go there and look at this stuff in this institute called Cushy Institute. And when I got there, I got 300 cases waiting for me, all the charts waiting. And I looked and I said, it doesn't look like I'm going to leave this place. So I spent Friday, Saturday, and they took me out on Sunday to the airport, and I flew home dead tired. But what I did notice was after the third meal, I wasn't tired, and I wasn't hungry, and I wasn't looking for the nearest sub shop for some hoagies. <laughs> so this was a very important uh, event. There, and you could see the bureaucrats all here. Uh, each one of the, this is a pile of six cases we selected, terminal cases, looking at only nutritional intervention. Each one of these were about five inches thick. And we made sure that this panel of 15 members from all over the world would scrutinize this before they came to the meeting. Each page was numbered. So we knew exactly which page that they had not read if they asked a bad question. This is retaliation. Yes. OK? <laughs> so once I found out one person gave a question, I said, refer to page 94. He stopped asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get him that way. So what happened was the, 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 the work was done by Christine Akbard. I was just the auditor. And I was up there to take the hits. And when we schedule it this way, there weren't many hits because they were afraid to talk too much. That means they hadn't done their homework. Okay. So unanimously, the whole team were elated because out of the six cases, every case was voted as acceptably influenced by nutrition, not by the other therapy. So to make a long story short, out of the six cases, uh, just to show you, pancreatic melanoma, lung, uh, lymphoma, endometrial cancer, and breast cancer with liver metastasis. These people do not live, but they all lived. I even scrutinized it to the point where I called each one of them to talk to them to make sure that they were for real. Since that time, what I did was, let me just give you a case example. MN is a 48-year-old 48 year woman with metastatic uh, melanoma in a small bowel, retroperitoneal nodes. We resected 25 centimeters of a small bowel. And we saw so much black stuff in her retroperitoneum, studded with lymph nodes, that my colleague, Ben Kasimi, who did the surgery at Mass General, said, let's close her up. Let's let her go home. And let's give her interferon. This is a pathology, clearly a very aggressive melanoma case. I consulted uh, the NCI, and they said they won't live. Okay, So she said, I don't want interferon. I'm going someplace else. She lived. She had two children. And what she told me was interesting. She said, once I went on this caloric restricted diet, my menstruations, my blood became bright, brighter. It was brighter. It was a brighter color. And I always remember that. Always remember that. So it has something to do maybe with some oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> so what did we learn? We learned between 1,200 to 1,500 calories, very dense food, easily to digest, some raw, some cooked. Food had texture, flavor, and volume. And that's what I wanted the scientists who came to experience, that there is texture, there is taste, 
and it's not total cardboard eating. <laughs> what happens is that they lose 10% of their baseline weight. We know it happens. And if you don't have it, we get suspicious about you. We take a look at their CAT scan, and we see their visceral fat is gone. Peter Choiki, the NCI uh, radiologist, was pointed this out to me because I was so fixated on making sure the tumor was gone when I presented it. He took me aside and says, George, do you see something that I see? Oh, their visceral fat's gone. It's gone. So they have used up their fat storage completely. What happens is their sugars, on the average, ran around 80 to 85. When they got too low, they got uncomfortable. And when they got uncomfortable, human beings will talk back and say, I don't want to do this anymore. Beth and I have that common, common, common feature that we have to deal with. We can't deal with rats or animals because they talk back and they get mad. <laughs> okay. Hemoglobin A1C is around 5 to 5.5. Ketones in the urine and blood. The PET scan, this is, this is what every clinician uses. We use PET scans to see how much sugar there is, and it always decreases when they go on this diet. Long-term caloric restriction has problems. We have seen thyroid and sex hormone changes. We have seen osteopenia, osteoporosis. And the conclusion after looking at about five centers is that they all have nutritious food. That's not, that's not the issue. The issue is that a third of them do very well, and two-thirds of them do very well, and then they later on falter. And it's not because of non-compliance completely. So I said to myself, I've got to focus on this and find out who is the one who's doing so well, and why is it that these people do not do well? All right. Everybody knows about this. 70 years of research. You had enough of this. And you can see the old monkey, the young-looking monkey, same age. This is a human, Roy Wolford, before and Roy Wolford after at 1,200 calories, okay, to 15. The brain of these, uh, of these animals also look different. So this is a young one, this is an old one, geriatric hunchback, and look at the brain. The brain is shrunk in the older ones. This is an article that you should all read because this is the most expensive human research ever done. And you can see the weight go down, the sugar goes down, the cholesterol goes down, the blood pressure goes down, and interestingly enough, the white cell also goes down. Repeat how much that costs. $250 billion by the Bass Brothers, and it's still, he's still paying for it. His idea was to see whether people could live out of space without all the things that we get. And this was the outcome of it. Now, what happens? In the two years there, the Biosphere 2, the weight goes down, the sugar goes down, the hemoglobin goes down, and uh, the insulin goes down, and the hemoglobin A1C goes down. No question, no debate. This is a doctor before seven years and after. You see what the look is. You could tell by the look. You don't need to do a lot of testing sometimes. You could look at a person and say, that person's not practicing it. I could tell just looking at him. Okay. So in Okinawa, I went to visit Wilcox and Suzuki right here. And this is three generations. 104, this one's younger, and this is the youngest. So they eat meat, by the way. They don't eat a lot of it, but they plant a lot of vegetables because it's easy. And what's interesting is they're not big people. They never published that. And I said, geez, I feel like a giant next to them. <laughs> OK? It's interesting, but it's a characteristic they did not publish. Now. Beth mentioned this before. This is by Kotler, one of the classic studies. He calls it starvation. But the difference between cachexia is the insulin's high. They are wasting away quickly. And these people do not have it, and they feel great. This is the biggest barrier that I have to face with clinicians. No, 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 no. You look terrible. Get some Sustacal in you. Let's fatten you up. And I'm just cringing because that's the debate. And I show them this, and they still can't believe it. 
But this is the real world of clinical medicine. You have to deal with your colleagues and you have to deal with a similar language and similar sympathetic discussion with respect for each other, which is not easy, but you've got to have it. By being a surgeon for 35 years and doing oncological surgery, I was privileged to have their attention and their respect. You will not get the respect of people until you pay your dues. This is a case uh, from England. He went on a caloric restriction diet. He did well, but what we found is as soon as they got out, I do another PET, a CAT scan and I could see new lesions. So on one hand, the tumor goes away and on the other hand, there's more coming. Long-term caloric restriction, the T3 goes down, their body temperature is always low. They get osteoporosis, they get sarcopenia, unless they do weight training, and then unless they have protein and amino acid, and sometimes we even like a little testosterone in them to make sure both for men and women. Interestingly enough, this is a big concern of the younger people when they go through this. And when they're on it for about six to seven years, you, you, they complain. So what happened was I discovered a new concept, short-term caloric restriction, a new concept, and this is what happened. I was doing a 10-hour resection of a huge renal carcinoma that went into upper diaphragm, invaded the adrenal vein, and into the vena cava. I came out for a short break because I had to do my natural things. And as I was walking by, I grabbed a donut and orange juice, and I saw this article next to the doctor's room. And I looked at that, and I said, I think I want to take that. So I put it in my bag and walked back to the OR, finished the operation, and that changed my life. Because what he showed was short-term caloric restriction and long-term caloric restriction have very similar features. And he could see that in short-term caloric restriction, what you see is within, uh, within eight weeks, you see the MRNA change, and long-term, uh, about two weeks, you see 55%, and by four weeks, you see 72% changes in the micro uh, messenger RNA. This is published 2001, a classic article, highly quoted. So, in a way, what I like to think of as a uh, biological anthropologist viewpoint is that by evolution, we have developed to grow bigger, reproduce, and then you are free to die. <laughs> <laughs> when you go into a caloric restriction, it says, wait a minute, we got to go and repair, maintain. How about reproducing later and then living longer? So in a way, <laughs> in a way, I keep thinking about my family and all the cousins says, look how big our son has become. I keep saying to myself, geez, how long is he going to live? <laughs> so what we do in the clinic, and Beth and I talked about this, is caloric deregulation cycles. So I just want to tell you that in real life, you have a hard time getting compliance and workability with people unless you do something like what we do, we give them the treatments, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation, and then we put them into a, a, a nutritional uh, intervention, which we call a slightly higher calorie, and then we put them onto caloric restriction, and we can cycle. So the second scenario is nutritional intervention, real treatment in a sense of interventional, conventional treatment, put them on CR, put them on real treatment again, and then use a nutritional intervention. So we say, when I say real treatment, it's something that my colleagues can accept. But one of the things we notice is that when we do a caloric restriction or even a mild fast before the chemotherapy, they do great. They do great. And they don't mind. Whereas the other ones do mind. That's why I was talking to you about that 10% chemotherapy because we are always looking at decreasing the dose of these toxic substances when nothing else is going to work. So what happens is 
I realized that after looking at these, honestly, without any bias, I never worked for any of these organizations. I said, there's a part, there's a group of them that fail. We have to do something else. And Dr. Moran, here we go. So this is a case that uh, a gal who had glioblastoma, she was inoperable, so they gave her chemotherapy radiation and she went on a ketogenic diet. This is a pathology. This is the lesion after the therapy. And you know, it's multifocal, you can see here. This is right after the uh, uh, radiation and the chemotherapy, and they said, we're gonna give you double dose chemotherapy because I'm not sure if this is tumor. She survived it, two years, she's fine. The day I gave a presentation to 700 doctors, she called me up that night and she says, I got two new lesions. So it's not to say that this doesn't work, but it's to say that every therapy has its limits and you must be not vain enough to assume that you will cure somebody with one form of therapy. I always tell people, you don't make a chair with one tool. You need a lot of things. So, here we go. Peter Peterson, the pioneer of them all, he came to Hopkins from Oklahoma, and at that time, uh, Dr. Leninger was the head of biochemistry. He was very much interested in Otto Warburg's concepts. He, he probably had something to do with hiring him, but the important thing is that he worked for 70 years to discover hexokinase II. This is when he came to Hopkins. This is what it looks like now. Cancer cells have the capacity to consume glucose. You heard that. Makes a lot of lactic acid. Most normal cells do not produce that much. And this is what he published in 2002. And what he says is that Normal cells look like this, they're mitochondria, it looks very healthy with 90% ATP production. And the cancer cell has these two, these little studs of hexokinase 2 that can use the oxidative phosphorylation. Why is it that, why is it that we can have molecules to take advantage of this little weakness? because they produce a lot of lactic acidosis. Unless you are doing marathons or triathlons that Dr. Maroon does, not many of us go into lactic acidosis. But cancer cells always do because they fail to go into the next phase of respiration. So what happens is when this door is open, something else happens. Now, as I said to you, if I had seen the mitochondria as a surgeon looking at every specimen of surgery that I did, I would have figured out that this is a normal mitochondria and this is not. And, and you know, Pete Peterson showed me something like hundreds of these and his description of the mitochondria when he first did it, he used to draw it out himself draw out the mitochondria. They are definitely abnormal. And if every clinician saw this when he went down to see the pathologist, we wouldn't be having this discussion now. We would, they would be saying there's something wrong. But all we do is look at the nucleus. By the way, that was published in, okay. So what happens is that most of us look at PET scans and basically the PET scans nothing more than to see how much sugar is going into those cells. And one of the nice things is that you can use the PET scan as a prognostic tool when they do better, whether any kind of therapy, if it's going down, the uptake is going down, you know something's happening. And this is a physiological study, the best study for anatomical is a CAT scan. 3BP, this is Young Ko. Uh, we're with a representative from the NCI part of 
what we later on went to see is a CTEP, new drug development. And she did over 100 experiments in which she used 3-bromopyruvate, which is an analog of pyruvic acid or lactic acid. So they look alike. But what she did similarly is that she added a bromo. She found that if she went to many different kinds of molecules, you got toxicity. And that's why I, I was sad that the people who designed palladium lipoic acid couldn't be here today because they have a similar molecule that is simple and doesn't change the shape too much or add too many arms to it to cause toxicity. So what happened? This was done, the, this is the animal studies. Uh, human studies have been done in this. And so what happened is this. She took the hepatic cellular tumor that was implanted. The tumors grew zero week after she gave them the 3-bromopyruvate in succession, there was complete remission of all tumor and metastasis and all the animals lived to senescence and died. She kept all of them. There's nothing that has ever been done that way. This is what it looks like, a fairly simple molecule. Okay? And that's the beauty. Dr. Cole has a lot of experience. She's been to Europe, she's been to Asia, she's been to South America. She even works in Czechos in Poland to do some of the pharmacokinetics. They need money. And I told them our foundation doesn't have that much money. So we went into crowdfunding because we had to reach the people. We had to go further than the science. We had to reach the common person because that's the person who gains the most. So, the Trojan horse hypothesis. This is the normal cell. When, when what happens is a cancer cell has a lot of glycolysis. It secretes a lot of lactic acid. At that time, the transporter will allow the 3BP to get in and it does not happen in the normal cells. That's the Trojan horse that goes in and destroys the tumors. And you can see these tumors causing massive atrophy. And this is, you know, I'm just showing you one slide. She had thousands of slides. This is a human case that was done in Germany. The Germans are very interested in this. They would like to work with Dr. Cole and Dr. Peterson. Why am I here? Because I'm the clinical arm to see whether I can move this to the clinical area and make more clinicians aware of it. In fact, Dr. Maroon is the one who I talk to a lot because we're both clinicians. We got to make it happen one or another way. So what happened was this boy had a massive tumor and the Germans asked her to come and help. Uh, there was nothing else. They gave it intraarterially into this tumor. He was not supposed to live very long. She got the 3BP into him and look at the necrosis. In fact, he was presented at Johns Hopkins Hospital to show this entity. But it did not receive a positive response. It seems to work in a lot of different cancers, whether PET scan positive or not. The way I see it, Dr. Maroon, I would like you to think about this. I challenge you and the University of Pittsburgh to look at your entity, we like the other entities also. We'd like to see them go on a ketogenic caloric restricted diet. And then if they show recurrence, I would like to see them go on 3-bromopyruvate. Now this is a bold thing. They have the IND approval for liver cancer 
intraarterially, but we don't have the IND for all solid tumors. This requires another $7 million. Who's got it? Okay, that's why we need corporate help. More and more, we're seeing people understanding fasting, caloric restriction before chemotherapy. This is one step I have to take to reach the doctors that control the patients. Because when they see that and they see they have less complication, they say, okay, we'll do this. But if you just talk about caloric restriction, they're not interested. Okay? And we see this. This was published, oh, this is Longo's recent publication, but this was done in 2008 at Stanford. We know this. And for our own practice, we do this every day. We've been doing it for 15 years. What's interesting is many of them accept the low, lower dose chemotherapy because they haven't lost all their hair. Simple as that. The way I see it in the future, we have integrated CR. We use with hormones, with chemotherapy, with surgery, with radiation, with biguanides. And you know, I was hoping that Pamela Goodwin would be here. She noticed at the Women's Health Initiative study that the women who had breast cancer who were on metformin did not progress as quickly. This was a very interesting finding. And she has 3,500 patients, a powerful tool in which she's following uh, mainly from the University of Toronto, but it's all over the United States. And this is the first major step in which the clinicians are saying, okay, there's something to this. Maybe it's not perfect. Maybe you don't agree. But if they can join forces, you have something going. I like this from Tom. Respiration is responsible for maintaining genomic stability, the DNA stability of differentiated state. And respiratory insufficiency will, event will, insufficient will eventually induce the default state of unbridled growth. I like that a lot. It's as beautiful as I can make it. Nice work, Tom. Again, we need all of us to win over this. We have to work towards the person who needs it the most. You know, on television, you see all these drug advertisements because they're bypassing a lot of people. You have to do the same when it means so much to you. You can do something, and I'm hoping that all the young people in this room, are there any, <laughs> needs to help us. We old folks can't do it. You can make it go viral. And I appeal to you, as part of the stream, to make an effort to push this forward. We do crowdfunding. We also do crowd thought. These are industry people. Um, Lloyd, would you stand up? He represents CVI industry. And these are the people who we need. These are the people with the bucks. These are the people with the appeal. I learned a long time ago, if you want a thought to go through, you approach the music, fashion, beauty industry, and you got them. If you don't do that, you got a long fight. You could see by the iPhone, when Steve Jobs made the iPhone for music and for pictures, it just took off. Whereas most of us are typing and writing papers on the Word, and it doesn't take off as much. Once that came, it was explosive. And that's what we want. I understand human nature. These people have understood this, and they are making a major challenge to industry, just like CVI, to support this. And I'll show you this later on. Okay. <laughs> To go. I, I know, I know. <laughs>
decided to make a change in my life, partly because I was reacting to some of the medications that I was taking. I had cramps in my muscles. And at that stage, I started looking at food as an alternate to medicine. And then my journey began there. And then three years later, I quit my job at University of Michigan, started a restaurant. And at my restaurant, I actually got a lot of different kinds of patients. I'm not an MD. I'm a PhD. So I talked to them with all the disclosures. And prior to neither am I a nutritionist. But I explained to them what I have learned as a molecular imaging person. And I know to many of you, it may be just a repetition of what we have been talking about, the Warburg's effect, the PET imaging. But I'll give you the molecular imaging aspect of it. And I'll also, at the end, talk to you about esophageal cancer, which I worked with when I was at University of Michigan, and why there is a 500% increase in esophageal cancer, which we could actually easily probably prevent it with food. So as I said, I own a restaurant. So this is a disclosure. Anything, anything that I say with respect to food, please take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Then these were just to show that I worked in the area of molecular imaging, and these are my publications. And I had written a multiple different book chapters in, in this area. And so as I said again, this is a basic information that I give patients when they come and to prepare them for a link between cancer and food. So working in the area of molecular imaging, I, we developed actually real-time imaging tools to monitor cancer progression and also cancer therapy responsiveness. So we use a lot of nuclear imaging. We use optical imaging. Today morning, uh, Dr. Uh, Tom showed a series of different bioluminescence imaging. We had created a very novel uh, complementation-based uh, imaging tool to monitor kinase activity. Now. One of the things that I learned and which didn't shock me when I was working at UFM is positron emission tomography is commonly used to, uh, in uh, cancer. And these are a series of different reasons that it is used to locate tumors, also to determine the size of tumor therapy responsiveness and detect any malignant uh, sites away from the primary site. Now, Typically, uh, doctors ignore this part, but when patient comes into the clinic, generally what they do is they inject a chemical into the body and they send the whole body into a scanner. And then, then they start to look at wherever this molecule localizes in the body, that site could be a site which is either malignant or primary site or a metastatic site. And what's interesting when I tell patients about this is that the molecule they use is glucose. It's a simple molecule of glucose. So what we are doing is we are exploiting high affinity of cancer cells for glucose. And this has happened a number of times when I talk to uh, people who come to the restaurant that there is indeed sugar plays a havoc when you have cancer. And then most of the patients that I talked to, they said, why don't my doctor tell me that? And the reason could be because they're not trained in that aspect. And then the other aspect that I uh, talked to them is about where do you get your sugars from? And OK, I'm sorry, Like before we go to that. so. This may be preliminary for most of the doctors here, but why cancer cell love glucose? So I talk to uh, patients and say that the glucose molecule is actually the energy from glucose molecule is released in two stages. One is the first stage that happens at the early in the uh, glycolysis, which is in the cytoplasm. And the second part is in the mitochondria. And that is called as the oxidative phosphorylation or Krebs cycle that a lot of the previous speakers spoke about. So what we are doing during this process is the energy that was fixed by plant using common molecules, and I'll come to this in the later slides, using plain sunlight, some of the water and some minerals from Earth, 
and carbon, dioxi carbon dioxide, water and sunlight, what plants do is they take carbon and oxygen, they break the bonds, they take water and they break the bonds and make new bonds. In a simple form, these are the carbon, 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 carbon bond. It's a six carbon bond and that's where the energy of the sunlight is stored in them. And what we do is the reverse. So plants do photosynthesis, we do respiration. And during this process, we are releasing that energy which the plants have fixed for us. And I'll come back to this on the relationship between plants and us. And the energy that is released in me is measured in terms of ADPs. So we generally release 36 ADPs. In cancer cells, we don't do that. In cancer cells, we do not go to the end product, which is from a six carbon to a single carbon, at, single, uh, carbon moiety. We go to a three carbon moiety, which is a pyruvic acid right in between. And what we do is we are actually releasing only two ADPs per molecule of glucose, whereas in the normal cell has the ability to release 38 ADP molecules. Now, in order for a cancer cell to be at the same energy level as normal cell, then we require just one molecule of glucose in normal cell, whereas in the cancer cell, we approximately require 18 molecules of glucose to be at the same energy level. But Warburg's phenomenon, and lots of scientists have researched this and show it's not just 1 to 18, but probably difference could be up to 1 to 200 molecules of glucose between normal and cancer cell. And that's why when I talk to people who, uh, when I give lectures, I said that the first and foremost thing that you would do is reduce your uh, spikes in blood sugars. And then I explained to them, where do you get your sugars from? And this is a very interesting slide, but this is a very unusual source. Now what's happening here with the fruit is conventional fruits, when they are plucked from the tree, then they are sent to a processing plant. And at the processing plant, they spray a series of different kinds of chemicals. So this is after the fruit has been plucked and it's sent to a processing facility with a series of chemicals like thiobenzodol, ophenyl, phenol, ethoxyquin, captain are sprayed onto them. Some of these are agents which actually prevent maturation of fruit. Some of them are fungicides, some of them are bactericide. Now, fruits like pears, when you eat them with the skin on, then these chemicals taste bitter. So then what do we do next? We spray food grade sucrose. So sugars come from very unusual sources. A food grade sucrose is sprayed onto fruits that we eat to mask the flavors of the chemicals that are sprayed to increase the shelf life. So sugars come from all different sources and this is a very unique source where your sugars are coming from so that to mask the bitterness. What's the other source of sugar? Your common salt. Look at it, an iodized salt contains salt, calcium silicate and dextrose. So now sugar is literally added to anything that you can imagine and most of the patients that I talk to, I tell them, read labels. And it will tell you very odd places you can get your sugar from. And unfortunately, things like these. When you take the retail packages, there's no label on that. It just says oranges. But if you go to the wholesale package, oh, sorry, I said uh, pears, because I talk about, like, actually I have slides where I, what are the different kinds of chemicals that are sprayed on different kinds of foods? And what is our post-harvest technology? after we pluck fruits and veggies, what are the kind of different kinds of chemicals? So that's why I went to orange, but like things like uh, these are only labeled on the wholesale big bulk boxes and the retail boxes are not labeled with these kind of uh, chemicals, but the, my focus here was sugar. So I wanted to t uh, just show that sugars come from sources you don't expect, although eating fruit, you may get a lot of sugar, but you also get a lot of added sugar on them. So the main therapy that I talk in respect to food with patient is a multi-pronged therapy. The first thing is cutting down the high energy thing. That's our uh, cutting down the calorific intake that everybody talked about in the beginning. Second is 
managing free radicals. In the next couple slides, I'll talk about what I think about how do you uh, have uh, increased free radicals uh, and how do you control them with respect to food. Then immune system, boosting immune system, probably getting good rest. And uh, various different factors uh, associated uh, in terms of immune system. And I uh, generally think about some of the ancient, since I'm uh, from India, India has a variety of different kinds of herbs and spices that we use to boost our immune system. One of them is ashwagandha. And also uh, the herb that we use is holy basil. It's a very potent immune booster. So I talk about ways to boost immune system, de-stress, and mind-body relationship. And with these, I should tell you, uh, there are many people that have actually, uh, partly, I shouldn't say healed, but in the process of healing. And one of them came to Hippocrates like a couple months back. His name was Pradeep Chaudhary. Uh, Pradeep had uh, kidney cancer, which was stage four, and multiple metastasis to liver and lung. And over last, <clears throat> doctors had given him three months to live, and that was last year. March, and he's still living, and he's in lovely health now. He's much better than what he was actually before his cancer. And this is an amazing part of all the integrative approach that you take towards uh, healing cancer. And this is the chart that I uh, generally present to uh, patients. And many of you may know this. But I also present to them what happens when you eat food that raise your blood sugars. So when you raise your blood sugars to, this is the kind of food I would love to eat where the, the rise in blood sugar is barely minimum. But when you raise your blood sugars, this is the area body does not like excess sugars. And the reason body does not like excess sugar is I. I give them a, a simple example, asking them to think about sugar as a preservative. And many of you would have used this uh, in terms of when we make jams. So basically what we add together is a fruit and a sugar, boil them together, and now this stays very well at room temperature for a prolonged period of time. And the reason these jams can stay without preservatives is simply because if any microbe any bacteria or fungus were to come and sit on those jams, what the mixture does of high sugar, it dehydrates them, and now they can no longer grow. And another way of such preservation is our simple salt. So you put excess salt, same thing happens in terms of their uh, uh, like so, uh, pickling and preservation. So when there is excess sugar in the body, our body does not like it, because we partly tend to also dehydrate the blood cells that are there within it, and the immediate response of the body is to secrete insulin. And higher the amount of sugar in the body, higher is the insulin. And then when higher amount of insulin comes in, then the drop is dramatic. And sometimes it goes way below what is the normal blood sugar level. And when that, that happens, then you start to crave again. So this is a very vicious cycle, and I explain to patients who come that if you go through this cycle then actually you'll be eating much more and you have to maintain your blood sugars throughout from uh, there should not be rise and an ideal uh, diet for a cancer patient would be a food that hardly has any it's basically even after eating uh, food that your blood sugar level should be low. And I've created a series of dishes. I'll give you an example in the end where your blood sugars don't really rise and you actually feel very satiated after eating it. So the next question I ask them is, do we understand what our food is? And I take them, this morning I think you had a slide which took us a couple million years back. And this is even before that when there were only plants on earth. And at that time, Plants were very happy. They were taking carbon dioxide, water, photosynthesis, and creating oxygen and sugar. And the number of plants were so high that the amount of oxygen in the environment became very, very high, and it became toxic, especially for certain plants which were underwater. 
it became very toxic for them to survive because of higher oxygen. Currently, like if you look at the other analogy would be what's happening with the level of carbon dioxide in air now. I think we are close to around 250 or 70 parts per uh, millions. And then if we reach up to like 1,200, I think, then it would be very toxic. No one can live on Earth. We are still a long way to go. But then if we reach a certain level of a specific uh, gaseous molecule, then, then the life becomes impossible. So that's, that's what had happened. Oxygen reached a level. And then evolutionary pressure was brought on to cre create someone that could utilize the oxygen and the sugar and convert it back to carbon dioxide and water. And that's where the balance was restored. So there were animal cells now which are dependent on plants for their oxygen and then the foods that they create. And then in turn, we give them back what they need and that was the carbon dioxide. So this balance in nature was very critical. But one thing that comes with this is if you look at here, sun is the one which provides energy to literally every human being. So we can safely call ourselves solar powered. Although we don't directly fix energy, but it is the plants who fix sun's energy for us. And what we are utilizing is that sun's energy. And then uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, that we are utilizing sun's energy in an indirect way. And even if we eat meat, it's that the, the animals don't do any kind of photosynthesis. They again eat plants. And so the energy, whether you are eating meats or other, whether you are eating plants, it's actually all coming from the sun. Now, what's the problem with the sun's energy being converted to into like a gluco, glucose or proteins or amino acids or oils, which the plants produce? So what we are doing is we are taking a photonic energy from sun and converting into a chemical energy, putting that into chemicals. And what we do is we take that chemical energy and then convert them back to a biological energy that we need and then restore the balance back. So every time when we convert energy, there are free radicals produced. So carbon dioxide from air is broken. Bonds between carbon and oxygen are broken. And these broken bonds, although they have a very short half-life, they're extremely reactive. They bind to anything which is in the close vicinity and react with them. And this could lead to a variety of different complications. If they bind to some proteins, they modulate their functions. If they bind to membranes, they could either induce a form of cell death called apoptosis or also necrosis, where the cellular contents are released and then they attract the immune cells at that area to form local inflammation. So it's very critical that to understand where our food and the converting food energy into a different form of energy is actually responsible for this inflammation. And every time when we are utilizing energy, like my talking to you, I'm utilizing energy, I am breaking those bonds I'm converting them back to carbon dioxide that ATP has been used, but I'm also generating free radicals, and these free radicals need to be quenched. And where do these free radicals come from? Plants, most of them. We do make some, like glutathione and so on, but what we need, what we need is again vitamin C or some other components which are plant-based to produce free radicals within our body too. But majority of the free radicals, especially some of the antioxidants, vitamin-based antioxidants, they all come from plants. And that's where we have to eat plants in order to decrease inflammation in our bodies. And that's a very critical component to understand that without plants, we will be highly inflamed and we, very, we need this for just the simple thing is for the energy that we create in our bodies. Since plants are very auto, uh, autonomous, they have their own photosynthesis, they have their own respiration, so they create this whole system of antioxidants within them. And if you look at thyme, one of the herbs that was uh, analyzed for its uh, level of antioxidants, and they found 32 known antioxidants in thyme, and probably hundreds of others which we don't know yet. So, but then, 
do we get these antioxidants in foods that are processed? No, because we cook them, literally kill them, and what we need is a good amount of raw food. And when I talk to people, uh, especially uh, uh, some uh, cancer patients and others, I just say, get close to around 60% of your food raw and make sure that it doesn't have any chemicals or pesticides that are sprayed on them. So plants generate their own antioxidants and we are dependent on external sources, even if for certain antioxidants we may not be, but then the cofactors needed to generate those, we are dependent on them. And do we have time? Two more minutes? Okay, I'll just... Maybe five minutes? Is that okay? So I just wanted to talk to you about how food affects and how does food influence uh, certain types of cancers. And this is about esophageal cancers. I worked with it uh, looking at HER2 overregulation in esophageal cancer and Herceptin and series of different uh, signaling pathways including the NF-kappa B, the MAP kinase pathway in esophageal cancers. But what I wanted to show you is a very basic form that there has been a 500% increase in esophageal cancer. It's not only in the United States, but in a variety of different countries. Series of different papers talk about it. There were papers from Iran, papers from northern India, which talk about esophageal cancer, a significant increase in last 30 to 40 years. And if you look at food, last 30 to 40 years, we have started increasing actually a variety of different processed food in our diet. And then the lifestyle diseases are exploding. China had 19, two minutes. China had uh, less than 0.5% of its population diabetic in 1985, and currently it runs at 11.6%. India is currently around 10.8% of its population diabetic. So lifestyle diseases have exploded, and so also have uh, certain kinds of cancers in different uh, cultures. Now to understand why, I'm sorry, just ran a little fast. Maybe I may be overrun by a minute or so. So what I wanted to bring to you is how our food is digested. And if you understand how our food is digested, then you would understand why certain foods do lead to uh, uh, increase in esophageal cancers. Now, one thing I want you to ponder about, and this is a point that our digestive system is one of the smartest system that we have. 40% of our body's neurons are along our digestive tract constantly monitoring what's happening along this pathway. Our brain is heavily wired to it, and because it's, this is I think the most intimate act we do, we take something from an external world and we are internalizing it. And for that, the brain is constantly monitoring it. Now this is a key thing to remember in this, and when we eat food, actually much before we eat food, the moment we look at it, our brain actually triggers a series of different signaling, Salivary glands are food with saliva ready to be uh, uh, ejected out in the mouth. And you would see that you salivate the moment you look at the food. You haven't really eaten it. And that's because of all the intricate uh, uh, different kinds of signaling that are happening. Our digestion of food begins in the mouth. What we digest in the mouth are the carbohydrates. And the enzymes responsible for those are amylases. <coughs> digestion of food begins in the stomach. Sorry, digestion of proteins begin in the stomach and digestion of fats begin in the small intestine. Now imagine if you were to eat food, that is deep fried. So process of deep frying is you take a food, put it in oil at a high temperature. What you're doing is you're opening every pore that is possible on that food. Every part of that food that is possible to coat with oil, you're coating with it. Okay. Now you chew that food. What's happening in your mouth is the mouth secretes the amylases but then it has to penetrate the layer of fat. Whatever enzymes that are in your mouth are all water soluble. They cannot penetrate that fat. So there's no digestion that's occurring in mouth. Same thing happening in stomach. Stomach are all water soluble enzymes with high acidic levels. So proteins now cannot be digested simply because all coated with fat. Until the fat is digested, the proteins cannot be digested. And the food goes to small intestine and that's where the digestion of food begins because first the fat is digested and now the carbohydrates and the proteins are exposed and you're digesting those. 
So eating this way, eating a lot of fried foods and actually that's become very common. There has been like a, some studies talked about 800% increase in fried food consumption. What we are doing is we are making two of our very important organs redundant. The mouth becomes useless in this food and the stomach becomes useless. But the problem is not there. The problem is actually with respect to a very intricate signaling between our digestive tract and the brain. When the food goes into the stomach, it stays there and the stomach does not see the digestive end products. It sends a signal to the brain saying that I have food I cannot digest. And the brain sends a signal back to the stomach, secrete more acid and secrete more enzyme because that's what the brain understands. When you have a higher amount of food, then it, the enzymes are not in enough quantity that it cannot digest. Now this kind of a signaling you would have seen, how many of you have eaten a fairly good amount of fried food and felt that you are getting an acid reflux? And when that happens, when this acid reflux happens, you do it for a couple years or many, I'm sorry, I'm an Indian. India couple means some, some years. <laughs> so you do it for like few years and then you see, lo, it leads to a Barrett's esophagus where your epithelial cells become columnar cells and then if you continue to do that uh, habit, then if it eventually it turns to an uh, adenocarcinoma. Now, last slide and then I'll... Uh, so what's interesting here is to note that the adenocarcinoma is a cancer that's happening actually right at the intersection of the stomach and the esophagus. So right at this junction and this adeno... Oops. So this kind of esophageal cancer which is called as an adenocarcinoma, there has been a 500% increase but the squamous cell carcinoma which is right at the middle of the pipe that has not seen that dramatic in case it has essentially remained flat so basically what this suggests is the acids from the stomach are irritating this area and what we need to do is just control this acid and then I'll this is our food I'll probably do it another time if we get a chance and a minute here and I wanted to uh, tell Brian Clements in here that at my restaurant now we are starting a project which we call it as a Hutke's new permaculture project and permaculture is a form of agriculture which does not use traditional farm is actually much more nutrient dense when we have a complementation or companion growing and I would suggest actually if you grow things here probably you should look into uh, permaculture agriculture and the nutrient density of uh, the healing properties of these food would be much higher than the traditional agriculture. Thank you very much for your attention. And Patricia Kane uh, has a fairly um, interesting amount of data and it's basically a video, a very short video. I will show that, you know, with respect to her and maybe in the next conference she said she would be very interested to come because they use electron microscopy to look at things and you can see amazing things. Uh, you will witness this in a minute. Could you show that please? This is Patricia Kane of the neurolipids area and her big thing is the use of phospholipids. Uh, phospholipids are phosphatated lipid fatty uh, surfaces and that basically coats every, it's basically every membrane in your body. All fat has to become a phospholipid before it's used. Yes, in that, in that instance where you have boundaries and structures. I remember Franny Moore, my chief of surgery, said once to me, he said, you know, some of the most productive things I've seen is when we gathered about 10 people, surgical giants, took them to Montana where there was nobody else around except fish, and we just sat there for the whole weekend eating food and talking, and that was the birth of hyperalimentation. My, one of my great, um, okay, you about ready?
it doesn't do justice, but I just want to show you uh, how some, some of these diseases are so severe that it's beyond what we can do. But what's interesting that I didn't know about, again, I, I can't see it because I can't see it without electron microscopy. And we're just going to show you something that she uh, has been talking about. And this is what these uh, low power electron microscopy shows. Um, these are cell borders and they look funny. You can tell that, right? When they give these phospholipids, both IV and orally, and you know, we have them available, uh, they return to a normal configuration that looks better than the other one. Now, I don't understand all of it, I don't profess to, but clinically, she, has, she was also a disciple of John Freeman. So John Freeman affected a lot of people. And uh, we had a mutual guru, so we talked a lot. And um, this is another look. You see the um, high mag arachidonic acid with other fats muddled. And when they take the phospholipids, you see how the structures have a little more organization? I can't explain all of it, but you know, in the future, we will see more of this effect affecting function. Because after all, people don't realize it, but cholesterol is a very, very important part of the cellular membrane and the organelles. In fact, cholesterol is a neurotransmitter, well published. Again, this is the cytoskeleton, which, you know, I don't see this very often. This is an expensive study. And before and when they give them these phospholipids, which, you know, basically is basically what oftentimes we don't eat. And it becomes like this. And I, I leave you with this so that you would have food to think about as we talk about sugars and fats. And we have some other things that we can't quite see with our naked eye. But once you have the electron microscopy, you could see just like the mitochondria. Okay? So let's go on to the next one. And, you know, I'm trying to finish up in light of what the time allowed. But I said to you once before that we alone are islands. We can do all the research you want, but we need firing power. And we have to appeal to the broader public, an audience bigger than us, to make this happen. The other and thing, I, George, you can't forget that those who brought your sticks with you, if for some reason it's not on the presentation we have, please give those to us so that we can accrue them so all of us will have this perpetually. Everything that's happened today for 10 hours will be in your hands if we have everyone stick. Please do it because, you know, it's so hard to get everybody here. And I know many of you could have gone to the Washington, D.C. meeting to get more grant money. <laughs> And, and what I'm saying to you is that we need the private sector to get involved. We need the average Joe, average Jane to say, I believe in this and I'm, I'm going to give $100. That's not a lot, but half a million of those people, that's a lot of money. Or well, five million of them is a lot of money. The Popkin family, as I said, represents industry. And we need their help. We need the music industry. We need the movie industry, we need the fashion industry, we need the clean cosmetic industry to help us. I say no reason why cosmetics and health should be separated. Okay? So when you go out to California, I want you to recruit those people as well as we want to recruit the CVI people that Lloyd represents. And these are the people who have firing power because they have the financial and the political power to make things happen. You can publish it. A lot of them come here, so they're certainly yeah. interested. 
So we want to collaborate. We've got to appeal to them. You can't just talk to each other. Go ahead and show it. The reason they're involved is because they have, go back, oh, wait a minute, you went too fast. Next slide, next slide. Okay, stop. So what they said to me was they said, okay, we think you make some sense. We have helped the AIDS foundations. So I said, why not help us? We're bigger than that. So they said, okay, so they had a little meeting, their board met a little bit, and they said, okay, let's see how good they really are. They don't just give you money. They want to test you out, and rightfully so, and I thank Ido and Jennifer for their generosity. They said, well, we'll just give somebody the whole weekend of this whole chateau if they donate 10000 And not only that, if they donate $40,000, they will give you the whole week. You'll never get to see one of these places ever without their generosity. Don't you have to give the bike? <laughs> and if it's successful, we'll do more for you. And I thank both of you for this generosity, but it's this kind of thing that we need. And you know, I talked to Beth and we got the California group together and boy, they are good at this. They said, well, you guys don't know anything. We're in the movie industry, and we know a lot more than you do about how, how to make things count. Mm -hmm. We have here, will you stand up, the Josephs family? They represent, please sit down. They represent what I call one of the most organized groups I've ever seen, the church. Yeah. <laughs> the Catholic Church especially, because I've done a lot of missionary work, and I'll tell you, there's nothing more efficient than working with them and the Jesuits. You can get a lot done. And I, I said to them, and I said to Paul, I said, Paul, you know, you guys fast anyway, don't you? And he told me, if you want to say something about fasting, it's a practice that they already do. And the Ramadan also does it. So we need to say, wait a minute, we know why you're doing it, but listen to us because we have something to offer, and how about helping us? Why don't you explain to us about what you told me about fasting? Come on up. Stand up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Yeah, the concept of fasting in the Catholic Church initially was really to be able to suppress the fleshly awareness and cognizance and to enhance the spiritual focus of your spirituality. So that was really a, the, a lot of it was in that respect. And then over the years historically, and I'm not a Catholic theologian nor historian, but but what I understood in some readings I've done is at some point they shifted from everybody on Fridays to stop meat and then start eating fish. And we all know that if you're going to have to have something like that, it's a lot better to have fish than meat. So at any rate, with regards to the fasting concept, we know from a spiritual standpoint, and, and I'm getting into a little bit of religion, but Jesus, after he was baptized for those who are Christian, went off into the desert and fasted for 40 days. He obviously came out of that alive. So, obviously, Jesus, in terms of the Christian concept, is fully God and fully man. Uh, but nonetheless, that is something he chose to do his awareness and, and basically prepare for his mission. So we as Catholics, there's, there's some that are very good at fasting and are very consistent, and there are others that are inconsistent. But the most important thing about fasting is that it, it helps us create an awareness. And it's like George and I were talking about. I, I really, after going through this and listening to this, I, I've coined the term when we've when we fast or we change things, we what we call, or what I'm calling, a pause to refresh. And we're refreshing our bodies 
uh, in the spiritual moment we're refreshing our spirituality so that's pretty much all that I would like to share about it I'm not you know anybody uh, that knows a lot about all these things but what I do know is that this is an important thing what I learned today and uh, our daughter as George had mentioned in the beginning suffers with MS and chronic pain and I'm going to walk away with something to bring to her attention and consider uh, more of a, a holistic type of approach. So I want to thank everybody here, especially George, for uh, inviting me to be here. And I hope to be a, a catalyst to this process in the future. And thank you for all the speakers and your wisdom. Thank you. So it's a spectrum. Fasting, caloric restriction, eating cleanly, full digestion, emptying the bottom out, is all part of health, and it so happens that we're talking a lot about cancers. It applies to a lot more. Brian and I talk about this all the time. Rheumatoid arthritis is easy, man. That's an easy one. Would you agree, Anna Marie? Yes, absolutely. And yet, so few people practice it. And if anything, one of, I, I remember one of the persons that I work with, he said, forget the cancer, just worry about rheumatoid arthritis. We'll go after it. But we reach out because it has brought a lot of attention, and we need to focus on this to make this movement stronger and more permanent. And as Malcolm Gladwell says, make it stick. That's right. Okay. I think we have a time to for the break now, right? That's right. I believe so. If we have time uh, before dinner, I was wondering if we could, uh, Deanna, would you like to speak right now so that you can, what do you think? That's, that's good. Then, then we won't have to come back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Why don't we do This is on, this is working? Uh, but I wonder, I don't see a light on. You put it on the other side. Good, you did a good job. I want to tell you, Deanna Wong is a very accomplished young lady. She doesn't look like a military type. <laughs> but I saw her in a military regalia and, uh, at uh, Arlington and uh, Which one was a laser? She's a physicist and laser. she's involved with a lot of national okay. security. Okay. But that she has a great interest okay, okay. especially in caloric restriction. And I will. And we should introduce her with her right title. She's Colonel. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to share with you uh, my story of um, why it's called one to two months, and you'll find out very soon. Um, just very briefly, my background, um, 26 years in the Air Force, and um, my experience has been mainly in physics, uh, different areas, electro-optics, laser radar, uh, chemical, biological defense, um, launching satellites, NATO operations, um, missile defense, so it's kind of a broad range, but I've always been interested in health, so um, ever since probably my early 20s, I decided to get certified and I taught fitness in the gym for uh, eight years. But, uh, and so I thought I was healthy. So everything was clicking along and all of a sudden um, in 2001, I had an accident and I slipped on ice as I was going to a yoga class. And um, they wanted to make sure I didn't fracture my tailbone. and so. Um, interestingly enough, when they did the uh, scan, um, they saw that, you know, incident to that, there was a cyst on my left ovary. And so I went and I followed up with my doctor and I asked her about that and she asked me, well, do you have any pain? And I said, no. And she says, well, don't worry about it then because it's pretty common in women of childbearing age. And so I didn't worry about it anymore. Um, until um, October 2011. 
I was uh, just had taken command of a new unit and um, was noticing that I was experiencing more and more pressure on uh, the left side of my pelvis and it radiated all the way up to my right shoulder um, every time I took a breath. And it got so bad that I couldn't even sit down because that would put too much pressure on my abdomen. And so um, I had to get hospitalized immediately. And I had 10 out of 10 pain. I mean, it literally felt like someone was jabbing my liver with uh, a knife. Um, and so they put me on morphine. But um, what shocked me was that that did not take away my pain. Um, instead, it brought on a whole host of other side effects. So I started feeling really nauseous. And then so then they put me on anti-nausea medication. And then it caused constipation, and it just went on and on. And then they gave me stool softeners, but that causes diarrhea. So then, then they said I had C. diff, which is like a bacteria um, issue. And so then they put me on quarantine. So anyone coming into my you know, hospital room would have to gown up and you know, put the mask on and everything. But what I felt like on the inside was, you know, I didn't come into the hospital with all these issues. Um, a lot of these side effects came about from the medication. And so when that dawned on me, I said, you know, um, can you please stop the morphine? <laughs> um, and they said, well, you know, how are you going to deal with the pain? I said, I'll, I'll deal with it. And so it was there in the hospital, but I, it, it was excruciating pain. But I, I, I learned how to breathe, you know, and I just breathe into the pain. Um, you know, I, I was starting to take some meditation classes, so I tried to put that into practice, and I found that it worked. You know, I, I found that if I, you know, the, the part of your body that hurts the most, if you breathe into it and just send it love and compassion, it, it sort of calms it down, you know, as opposed to, you know, just the tendency, I think, in extreme pain is to hyperventilate, and then that just, you know, just kind of makes you kind of numb all over. But anyway, I had a complex mass by that time, 6.7 centimeters, and my CA125, which is the tumor marker that they look at for ovarian cancer, uh, was elevated. It was at 27. Uh, the normal reference range is, is below 20. And so my oncologist recommended that I start chemotherapy immediately um, with surgery. Well, you know, Three years prior to this, I had stumbled upon a book. Um, it was called The Hallelujah Diet, um, and it, I found it in a funny place. It was at the Pentagon bookstore. <laughs> 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 and I wasn't even, I wasn't looking for um, anything on diet. I thought I was healthy, but um, it was interesting because as soon as I walked into the store, the sales clerk says, oh, you have got to get this book. It's the best book, you know? And, mm -hmm because of her enthusiasm, and I was intrigued by the title, The Hallelujah Diet, so I picked it up. And I started reading about it, and it talked about this uh, Reverend George Malcolmus who had uh, colon cancer, and he had a large baseball-sized tumor, and he began a raw vegan diet, started juicing, and within a year, this tumor just disappeared, and he had no trace of um, cancer in his body. And so, so this is three years later now. I'm laying in a hospital, and I'm thinking about this. And it was really almost like a no-brainer for me because I just decided, yes, I'm going to, you know, at this point, I'd already um, gotten rid of the beef, chicken, and, um, yeah, mainly that. But I did not get rid of uh, fish and uh, cheese until I was laying in a hospital bed. Then it became very simple. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I began just a you know, caloric restriction and um, you know, with high nutrient density, so you're not really starving. And I, I, I started buying all organic, uh, raw vegetables, and uh, learned how to you know, make juice. And um, by January, um, so this is three months later, I was really kind of surprised because um, by doing this, my uh, cancer marker, the CA125, actually dropped back down to normal level, so it went down, back down to six. And um, in May of this year is when um, I started to go consult with uh, Dr. George Yu. And um, at that point, he said, well, you know, I really recommend you go to Hippocrates. And, uh, and that's how I ended up coming here uh, June and July of uh, 2012. 
But uh, he wanted me to do a PET scan before and a PET scan afterward. And um, it's really interesting, but um, before shows that the tumor, although I was still doing um, you know, a raw vegan diet um, based on a hallelujah diet, um, it still showed an elevated glucose uptake. So it was 2.3 standard uptake value. Um, and uh, then I came down here in the summer and when I returned back in August, I did another PET scan and amazingly, um, it actually indicated that it was a normal bile distribution um, in the tumor. So it was comparable to normal tissue. Um, not only that, but I lost all my visceral fat, which he uh, referred to that earlier, how that's really a good um, you know, indicator for uh, a good prognosis. And um, so I naively thought everything was under control and um, I went back to working my crazy long hours um, and I traveled to uh, Asia for my job and you know, participated in pandemic exercise. And needless to say, um, the night that I came back uh, from Korea, when I landed, I actually hemorrhaged. And, and that started a trend of almost every two weeks I was hemorrhaging. But I wanted to show you this. It's, it's a, a graph that I just really quickly put together which um, kind of shows you that, um, so th this one is basically uh, tumor volume. So this is early on in, in, in July, you know, we did MRIs and um, this is after I began to switch my diet. You could see it decreasing. Not only that, but the C8125 came back down. But what happened is when I traveled overseas and I could not maintain the diet, you see that the tumor just, you know, just the, the CA125, which is a measure of the proteins that are, you know, um, created when you have ovarian cancer, it just kind of skyrocketed. And I, unfortunately, I basically, I think I, back then what I was thinking is I passed a point of no return. This is uh, just the, what I mentioned to you earlier, uh, where I just mentioned just the, you know, this is the before PET scan that shows you know, the elevated um, glucose uptake, and then uh, the after, which shows a, a normal bile distribution of the radio tracer. And um, so I mentioned, yeah, then my CA125 uh, elevated, and then by February of last year, uh, that's when uh, things got really bad. Um, my, my right lung collapsed and filled with fluid. And um, it, my doctors at that point uh, really kind of lost hope for me. And so in May, I was actually admitted to hospice. I, I had to use an oxygen machine to breathe. And um, it, it was just uh, not that great for me, just emotionally and, and mentally, because um, you know, I, I would have chaplains coming to me, and the nurses would come, and you know, they would try to, they constantly try to give me morphine. And, I had to constantly kind of say, no, I don't really want morphine, but it, it was just um, kind of a constant battle. But um, in, in June, uh, what happened is then I um, all of a sudden had a really rapid um, decrease, extreme drop in my blood pressure, and then all the muscles in my body started to contract, and it was just 10 out of 10 pain. And so I, um, at that point, I had my aunt and cousin taking care of me. And um, I, um, you know, said, well, can you get me to a hospital? Um, you know, for the longest time, I, I really tried to hang on to the belief, uh, which I, I still firmly believe that, you know, food is really foundational. Um, and so I really believed um, in my heart that I could heal totally, you know, with just the food. But, you know, as George mentioned earlier, uh, it, it's got to be a multi-pronged approach because cancer is a very complex um, disease and condition. And so I realized because by June, I was not able to eat anything solid for over 30 days. So it was kind of a forced uh, juice fast <laughs> that I went on for 30 days over 30 days, and then after 30 days, I, would, I wasn't even able to hardly drink juice. It would take me 
one hour to drink just one cup of juice because it created so much pain. By this time, the tumor had um, really grown aggressively. It tripled in size essentially in, in just three months. Um, so um, what, what, what happened is it shifted my stomach towards the left and it also shifted my left lung further to the left. And um, that's the condition in which I entered the hospital. Um, I also had um, severe edema in my legs, and um, I have some pictures um, to also show you. So um, some of them are a little bit graphic, but I hope you just bear with me. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, so this is just the CT scan that showed the large right pleural effusion, and it also showed that it had metastasized with peritoneal carcinoma. And um, when I got to the hospital, the first hospital, well, the, let me back up. The first hospital I went to was Johns Hopkins. And I, had, I felt so much pressure in my abdomen that I just knew that something catastrophic was going to happen if they did not help me drain the fluid out of it. Um, but because I was struggling with breathing and I was gasping for air, they thought I had a pulmonary embolism, and I kept trying to tell them, no, I don't think it's a pulmonary embolism. I, I believe it's a cancer. But they went through the whole diagnostic process, um, did all these chest x-rays, abdominal x-rays, and finally they came back after nine hours and said, uh, you don't have a pulmonary embolism, um, but, you know, we're going to discharge you. And I, I said, well, can't you please um, help me? I'm, I'm, I'm having 10 out of 10 pain, and, and, I mean, I can't bear this. And they said, no. Uh, make an appointment and two, you know, come back in two weeks. So that's, I went back home, had no choice, but that night is um, when an ambulance had to come get me because it really was an emergency. And um, I got admitted to a second hospital and um, I asked them if they would drain the fluid and I got the same answer. Um, it's not an ER room procedure. And um, I, I, they said, you're going to have to wait till tomorrow. And I said, I, I can't wait. I, I just knew it. I just felt like life was, was, was literally slipping away. And so um, the doctor, the ER doc, um, had a lot of compassion. He looked at me and he said, you know, I don't normally do this procedure, but I will do this to help you. Now, you know, I, I didn't care at this point anymore, even if he never had any experience doing this, but <laughs> I just... <laughs> yeah, I know. It took a while for this whole procedure to occur. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm, I'm going to get to that story. <laughs> Thanks. And so, so they drained the fluid out, and then they admitted me. Well, the next day, the oncologist uh, comes to me and he says, um, you've got to start chemo immediately. Um, your condition is just really poor and um, I need you to start immediately. You know, I, I give you at most, I'm not God, but I'll give you at most one to two months. Um, and so, and he says, I'm going to give you one day <laughs> to make that decision. And, and that was a really hard time. I, I have to say that um, at that point, that was a, a real low point in my life. And, um, you know, because I thought, well, this is in June. So I thought, wow, I could, by July, I may not be here anymore, or by August, the latest. Um, but what I did was I prayed. And I asked God, I said, you know, God, if you want me to do the chemo, I will. Um, but I need to hear this directly from you because I know, you know, what chemo does to your healthy cells. Um, and so what came back to me was, well, you know, you got that um, fluid pulled out of your abdomen just yesterday. Why don't you ask for the cytology report before you make your decision? And so I said, okay. <laughs> and so the next day the doctor comes back and I mm -hmm. ask him that. And he says, no, it, it's going to be malignant. You know, it was just, um, it's all bloody, um, and we don't have any time to waste. If you don't do the chemo, I will place you right back into hospice care where you are most certainly going to die. Well, okay, when that happened, I just thought, oh, I, you know. <laughs> and I called Brian at that point, and um, I told him what was going on, and um, 
it was, it was a Saturday night. I still remember this so clearly when I called. And he called me back immediately on Sunday morning at 7.30. He was in Amsterdam. And um, he, he pulled off the side of the road um, just to talk to me. And I am just so grateful for that because you reminded me, Brian, that you know, even though chemo will you know, give you short-term gain of shrinking the tumor, in the long run, it's going to decrease your lifespan. And, um, and that was all I needed. You know, I, I needed to hear that. I needed to have someone who was kind of in my court, you know, just so I know I wasn't crazy. And um, so I told the doctor that I really uh, would like to see this report. Um, and he, he kept saying, we don't have any time. But I said, I, finally, I said, look, can you just humor me as a scientist? I just want to put eyes on a report, and then I'll make my decision. And um, at that point, he says, OK. He finally agreed. And uh, he came back two days later with this report, and he said, you know, um, your intuition to wait for this report was a good one because it came back negative. So they couldn't detect cancer cells in that fluid, which was a shock to all the doctors there. I was shocked, too. <laughs> but, um, but at that point, he said, now this opens up the opportunity for you to have surgery. And I immediately consented to that. Um, but they couldn't do it at that hospital, and so they had to transfer me to another hospital in Baltimore. So I had it done at Sinai, but after I got transferred, well, it would take me another two days in which, which time I, my blood count uh, dropped so low, I had to have bl two blood transfusions. And then once they transferred me uh, two days later to Sinai Hospital, my blood count dropped again, and I had to have another three blood transfusions. And um, when the surgeon, the first surgeon uh, came in and he looked at me and he says, you know, we're going to have to do um, a, a full, you know, hysterectomy. And um, we, we, you know, based on how you look, you don't even look strong enough. You're very emaciated. We don't even know if you can go through the surgery. So we're going to have to check out all your organ functions. And so that took another two days. Uh, where I had to get a colonoscopy. Um, they checked my heart function. They were most concerned about my lung because by this time it became a bilateral uh, pleural effusion. So my left lung was also uh, filling up with fluid. And um, it, it was at this point that I actually wanted to <laughs> die. I mean, it, in all honesty, um, my, my, my legs, my hands, everything was so swollen. I had become severely edemic. Um, even like up to the day before surgery, I gained 10 pounds of fluid in just one day. And it was painful. I mean, skin is just not designed to stretch that much. And I, I couldn't even bend to put on my socks. Uh, you know, I was fully dependent on the nurse um, for everything. And um, so basically, they, they brought me in and uh, did the surgery. Uh, they also, they prepped me beforehand. They said, you know, you're going to lose a lot of uh, blood during the surgery, so we're going to have to do more blood transfusions. And when you come out, um, you're going to be in the ICU. And don't be alarmed. You're going to have a tube stuck down your throat. So I said, OK. And um, it was really terrifying. Um, and I, I went through, and I basically, um, what came to me was back in um, October 2011, when I first went to this Hallelujah Acres Lifestyle Center and learned a raw vegan diet, a friend of mine called me, and she said that God had told her something to pass on to me. And that message was, let go, let go, let go. Back in 2011, I did not understand what, what that meant. But after being in hospice care and when I was laying there in a the hospital room, it finally dawned on me. Um, the first let go was to let go of my job because that's something that when I went in to consult with George Yu, he told me, you know, you know, you got to retire. You, you can't keep, you, you can't fight a war on two fronts and expect to win. And um, <laughs> and that was hard for me. You know, I was just 
I just kind of grew up, I guess, just wanting to just keep working and, you know, achieving. And it, it didn't seem to register to me how sick I really was. Um, and, and that's what kind of got me in a predicament after I had detoxed here at Hippocrates. And then I turned right around and went over seas where I couldn't keep up with the diet. That was the worst possible thing I could have done. Um, and anyway, so that was the first let go. Um, the second let go that I learned was to let go of my way of thinking because I really thought that I could conquer this cancer with just nutrition alone. You know, I, I just, that's what I believe. Well, I had to give up that thought. I had to learn not to trust my own thinking and instead to trust God. Um, so I, I, I prayed and I, I asked him for direction and eventually it, it kind of broke through to me that if I don't get medical intervention, I'm not going to be here much longer. And so what was miraculous about all this is that um, after the surgery, I didn't wake up in the ICU. I woke up in my own hospital room, and I didn't have a tube down my throat, and they didn't even have to give me any more blood transfusions. Um, and when I woke up out of that surgery, I felt tremendous pain because I have an incision that just goes up and down like this. But I also felt tremendous joy, really deep joy, because I knew that God had brought me through this. You know, you kind of get to a point, at least I did, where I knew that I, I did everything I could do, I, I, you know, and there was nothing more I could do. Um, my doctors, you know, during hospice at least, you know, they, they kind of gave up on me. And so I just thought, well, God, it's, it's in your hands now. And um, so basically it came back. Um, I, I asked them to... Uh, if there was any healthy organs there, to not do a full up hysterectomy, but to leave healthy organs in place. I didn't want to have a, a surgical induced, um, um, what do you call it, when you're, menopause. Yes, thank you. And so um, they basically removed my left ovary in the tube, and the tumor was huge. It was 24 centimeters, and they diagnosed it as a granulosa cell tumor, which is a very rare form, um, only about three to five percent of all the ovarian cancer cases uh, are of this type. And so these are some pictures kind of show you, this is back in just May of last year, um, and that's my cousin, she was there taking care of me. We were making some uh, raw um, buckwheat milk, actually. <laughs> and um, you could tell just not very long, much longer that, um, you know, my abdomen was starting to, you know, swell up and you can see my arms are getting really kind of thin. And then this is um, in June, just uh, about another week later. Um, nurses actually thought I was eight months pregnant. That's before she worked hard. It's what? Before she worked hard. Yeah. Protein Right, right. Yeah, I, I think my albumin was low too. And so this is just a. Um, just a couple of scans here from CT scans. This is just more towards the upper abdomen and this is towards the lower. But what you see is this black, big black thing was the tumor. So it literally was, was just crushing all my organs. And one of my doctors told me that it was amazing that my um, liver and, and kidney function were still <laughs> working with this. Um, this is uh, an ultrasound of my lung. On this side, see, it would normally look like this, you know, just your lung tissue. But because I had so much fluid, you just get just blackness here. And what they drew out of my lungs was this uh, fluid, about 1,500 milliliters of, of um, bloody fluid um, from a thoracentesis, which they couldn't even pull all the fluid out. They actually had to stop the procedure because I started having dyspnea where I was having really trouble breathing and I was coughing to the point where I felt like I was gonna throw up. Um, and this is how big my legs got. Um, they were very swollen. Yeah, I know, you can just see. And, and it was very painful around the feet because that, that skin doesn't stretch as much as your legs. And then after uh, my surgery, yeah. I, I could barely walk. I had to have help. 
I, I couldn't even barely move in bed um, or, or to rotate. It, everything was painful. And uh, after my surgery, then I stayed in for another five days in a hospital, and then they sent me to a rehab center. Within a week of being there, I was really amazed, but um, all the fluid drained. It reabsorbed, um, and it just kind of came out. I, it, I was basically um, having to use a bathroom every two hours during the night because all this fluid was coming out. <laughs> That's right. Um, and here's just a picture of the tumor. So it's really huge. The, the surgeon told me that it, the camera couldn't even capture the edges of the tumor because it was so large. And, um, and you can see here they're just um, scooping it out of my body. But um, So in conclusion, I just want to say... Um, what I learned from this is um, sometimes you do need an me integrated medical treatment approach. Um, you know, I, I thought I could do this with nutrition, and then when I was almost on the brink of death, that's when I said, hey, I really need medical intervention. Um, caloric restriction, it really works. It, it decreases inflammation. It, it helped me reduce and my... It decreases the chances of cancer. That's right. That's the key. Because I told you, I said, you don't want to be the one that has metastasis in your mind. You didn't. And I've seen this before. That's why the Where stubborn people like her would wait and wait and say, well, that's got to be mess. If you didn't have it, I was shocked myself. So something must have worked. And it also helped reduce tumor volume. And then just the importance of maintaining that, um, doing daily exercise. Um, when I was under hospice, I also had a medical missionary staying with me. I think you, you remember meeting her, Sister Mary. And uh, she, she made sure I got out every day. So even with this distended, hugely distended stomach, she got me out there to walk, and I might be really slow, and maybe I couldn't go very far, but, but you know, I'm just grateful to her. She made all my juices, my wheatgrass juice. She prepared all my salads. And i got to share this story with you of how I met her because this is another miracle. So about three months before I started you know, to go down this path, I started feeling a, a real severe decrease in my energy. And it got to the point where I felt like I, I couldn't even do the things I needed to do, um, you know, the juicing and everything. And so I started praying to God, asking him to send somebody to help me. I even called down here to see if, you know, um, you know Brian knew of any, um, you know, health educator that, he, that was in my area. Well, what happened then is in February, I went to another place called Living Foods Institute in Atlanta, Georgia, and this is last February, um, I happened to sit next to this lady, and uh, when I asked her what she did, she said, well, I'm a medical missionary. And I said, oh, what does a medical missionary do? Uh, and she says, well, when people are sick, I go to their homes, I stay with them, and I juice for them. And I said, you know how to juice? And she even knew the exact juicer I had, um, and she was totally on board. With, she was a Seventh-day Adventist, mm -hmm. and so she believed in eating as much raw as possible, and uh, getting out there, getting your sunshine to get vitamin D, exercise. She got me on track with sleep. You know, she was like, you got to get to bed at 9 in order for your immune system to function. So she did that. She, she gave me fever baths to induce a fever because cancer cells don't like that. And um, the importance of reducing stress. Even when she was here, I was still trying to do my classes. You know, I'm studying nutrition. I was trying to go to a conference, and she told me, you can't do this. <laughs> you just can't. And so she says, you've got to reduce stress. You, you can't worry about this anymore. And so, so I, I learned through her um, you know, just to let go of, like I said, let go of the job, let go of my thinking. The last let go was what I learned when I was laying there the night before my surgery, and that is to let go of life itself um, and to trust that you know, I, I had to have my bed, the hospital bed, kind of 
at an angle like this because I couldn't lay flat because if I did, I couldn't breathe. And when, I, when it was in that position, I had this imagery that I was in the cradle of, of God's hands, and, and that's how I let go of life. So thank you. That pretty much uh, concludes my talk. Before we go, we'll say a few words because we're going to convene now. This is, I'll first turn it to George. Hold it in your hands and I'll stand next to you so we don't have to hook you up. All right. Grab this one. All right. This is an unusual meeting. This is not a typical conference, as I've told Beth. I'm very happy that we can form the union of nutrition and science and the new discoveries. And it's up to us to join forces to build the belief that this has not only interventional effect, but has a major preventive effect. Because after all, that's what we're really after. And unless you put the two components together, you, you don't have the complete picture. So I urge you to go away explaining and asking yourself and exchanging with each other. You must have some doubts and you must have some things that you learned. And I hope that you know, our efforts, our team effort, shows you that he and I don't agree on everything, but we still like each other, yes. and we know we can get things done. That's right. Getting things done is a punchline. Thank you. Well, thanks to all the attendees for coming here into our home and sharing this time with us, and of course, we'll spend some social time to, tonight together, hopefully, and a lot of you tomorrow. We're going to bring in a band tomorrow, Calypso band for you. You can relax, take advantage of the facilities. And for those of you listening around the world, thanks for joining us. This has been a special time for us. We hope you felt a little bit of what we're feeling in the room. God bless all of you and be well.